Good morning and welcome to this hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Ben Kalos, Chair of the Committee at Ben Kalos. I encourage anyone watching who cares about the city spending, uh, $84 billion to tweet me questions for the agencies and I will do my best to ask them. That's for general members of the press, uh, for, of the public as well as the press or just any other council members too. For the next six or so hours, we'll be hearing from 10 mayoral agencies and offices as we discuss the fiscal 2018 preliminary budget and preliminary mayor's management report. City government functions in the background and foreground of the lives of all New Yorkers 24 hours a day. The agencies we'll be hearing from today are responsible for dozens and dozens of functions including assisting the city in its goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, settling outstanding cases of discrimination, ensuring that each of the 325,000 municipal employees are paid on time and holding our elections. It is for those reasons and more that we're here today to talk about talk with agencies that perform various citywide services about their financial plans, budget proposals, performance measures, and other operational issues. The agency that will testify today are the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, the Law Department, Board of Elections, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, OATH, the Financial Information Services Agency, FISA, the Office of Payroll Administration, OPA, the Office of Administrative Trials and Administrative Tax Appeals, Tax Commission, the Department of Records and Information Services, DORIS, the Board of Standards and Appeals, BSA, and representatives from some of our city's 59 community boards. Following these agencies and offices, the general public will have an opportunity to weigh in. In particular, the community is focused on operational efficiencies and generating cost savings. We'll be discussing the relationship between agency budgets and performances documented in the PMMR and evaluating current and proposed initiatives and what we can expect in terms of return on our investments. Coming from my background in finance, I believe any time we're investing additional funds in anything, we should see improvements. Ultimately, much like when city agencies expect their contractors to deliver services, the goal of this hearing is to ensure that New Yorkers get a return on the investment government makes on their behalf. For all their hard work in putting today's hearing, I'd like to thank Unit Head John Russell and Finance Analyst Sheila Johnson from the Finance Division, as well as Committee Counsel Brad Reed. Uh, anyone interested in being a uh, uh, policy analyst on governmental operations, uh, please let this serve as a public notice. Please forward your applications immediately because we need support. Uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Brad for doing double duty as a policy analyst as well as my legislative director. Paul Westrick. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been uh, joined by Council Member Antonio Reynoso and Carlos Menchaco, our members of the committee, as well as newly elected uh, Council Member Bill Perkins. Welcome. Council members will have five minutes to ask questions and receive answers on the first round and three minutes on second round. We are asking administration to limit their testimony to no more than 15 minutes, though longer written testimony may be submitted for the record. Members of the public should fill out an appearance card and return after 4 p.m. With that, I'd like to call the Department of Citywide Administrative Services from managing the city's fleet of vehicles to administrating civil service exam. DCAS has enormous responsibilities, not only in many citywide functions, but also in ensuring city agencies have the critical research and support needed to provide the best possible services to the public. In fiscal year 2018, preliminary budget funding for DCAS totals $1.13 billion with the majority allocated towards paying the heat, light and power bills for all city agencies which is budgeted at $707 million. During today's hearing, we'll examine many aspects of DCAS's operations and how they impact the city's budget. Specifically, we'll be discussing the city's energy and environmental policy, professional employees, provisional employees and the PMMR. Lastly, we would like to hear details about where DCAS found $1.7 million in the budget savings as part of the citywide savings plan, the energy efficiency measures which led to lower heat, light and power expenditures and other new needs identified in the fiscal 2018 preliminary budget. I would like to welcome Commissioner Lisette Camillo and ask her and any members of her team who will be testifying to please raise your right hand and I will uh, pass it over to my committee counsel to uh, swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Please begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Kalos and committee members. I am Lisette Camilo, Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. I am joined by members of my executive team to discuss the planned expenditures and revenues for fiscal year 18, as well as highlights of DCAS's capital plan. I'd like to start by taking this opportunity to thank the DCAS staff for the hard work and dedication they show each and every day. 
On January 25th, I celebrated my one-year anniversary, anniversary as commissioner of DCAS. And over this past year, we've made great strides to improve our customer service to agencies, partners, vendors, and elected officials. Our team has worked to create a culture of continuous improvement that allows us to be innovative and good stewards of the city's resources. Through our own initiatives, such as the administration of civil service tests, diversity and inclusion training, MWBE utilization, New York City clean fleet, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and our support of other DCAS mission critical initiatives, we have furthered the administration's vision for a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable city. I'm proud of the work that we do, and I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some, some of our successes. In human capital, to expeditiously provide opportunities for employment and promotion through the use of civil service lists, DCAS has made significant strides in the area of automation. Our experience with administering fully automated exams has shown to improve the customer's experience and significantly decrease the cycle time from exam administration to list establishment. Our plan is being implemented in three phases. Phase one, recently passed state legislation granting the city a two-year extension to reduce provisional employees, also authorizes DCAS to administer a qualifying incumbent examination, a QIE, to provisional employees who have at least two years of provisional services, one of the 193 titles specified in the legislation. Phase one, which cons consisted of full automation of the QIE system, was completed in September 2016. We administered the first series of QIEs on January 18, 2017. Phase two, this work will allow for end-to-end -end automation of our education and experience exams, the creation of an, uh, an application portal for candidates, and an exams dashboard. These efforts will contribute to shorten cycle time for exams and civil service lists. The work began in September 2016 and is expected to be completed by the end of summer 2017. Phase three, this work will allow us to make multiple choice test content portable and provide us with the flexibility to offer exams out of any location equipped with computers. Our third phase is scheduled to begin this October and end in June of next year. Citywide diversity and EEO office. CDEEO continues to lead the way in providing training on matters pertaining to diversity and inclusion and equal employment opportunity rights to city government employees. For FY17 year to date, CDEEO has provided classroom and computer-based training to over 14,000 employees and is on track to surpass our FY17 training goal of approximately 20,000 employees. In addition, this fiscal, in, this fiscal year, CDEEO held a nationwide colloquium with nearly 150 practitioners aimed at establishing a national network of public sector leaders sharing best and next practices for current and future workforces. Office of Citywide Procurement, OCP. DCAS is working to maximize MWBE vendor participation by conducting outreach and, insurin, and ensuring that MWBEs are included as a normal part of the agency's purchasing culture. We recently awarded a contract totaling $12 million to an MWBE vendor for engineering and architectural services related to accessibility compliance for people with disabilities. To date, in FY17, we have awarded contracts to MWBE firms with a total estimated value of $19.5 million. I'm happy to report that we have already exceeded the total amount that was awarded for all of fiscal year 2016. New York City Fleet. Our fleet team is leading the implementation of the NYC Clean Fleet Initiative to add 2,000 electric vehicles to the city's fleet by 2025 and to, reduce, and to reduce transportation greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. In the first year of the initiative, the city increased its electric on-road fleet by 75% from 323 units to 563 units. We are currently ordering an additional 450 electric vehicles in FY17. Our plan is to have over 1,000 electric cars in operation by the end of the calendar year. Asset management. In FY17, DCAS launched an upgraded version of its computerized maintenance management system, CMMS. We are implementing a phased approach to full operational status. The first phase includes work order routing, inventory management, and preventative maintenance of building systems and equipment. Before the end of FY17, DCAS expects to implement two additional modules contract management and emergency preparedness. These efforts will allow us to have in place a more efficient system to manage the day-to-day -day maintenance and operations of DCAS's 55 buildings. Energy management. 
and are charged to lead the city's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, with a near-term goal to reduce GHG emissions from government buildings 35% by 2025, we have focused on build public buildings as a way to lead by example. I am pleased to announce that we are developing more opportunities to reduce a facility's consumption during times of constraint on the electrical grid. Over the past year, we have doubled the number of facilities enrolled in our demand response program and shed an additional 20% of megawatts from the grid. We have provided more than 200 facilities with new meters to allow building operators to see their energy usage in real time. This will provide the foundation to optimize a building's energy consumption, not just during times of grid constraint, but every day. Expense budget and funding additions. DCAS's expense budget reflects funding of $1.1 billion and a budgeted headcount of 2,346 in FY18. The majority of DCAS's planned FY18 expenditure, $707 million, is allocated for citywide heat, light, and power expenses. The FY18 energy budget is a collabor collaborative effort between DCAS and ONB in forecasting agency energy usage, as well as commodity rates in the upcoming fiscal year. DCAS continues to work closely with agencies citywide to enhance the energy performance of their facilities through a range of programs, which includes retrofitting equipment, improving operations, and maintenance. Additional expense funds re received in FY17 and 18 budget include compliance with provisional reduction. DCAS received an additional $2.6 million in FY18 to increase our agency's capacity to develop and administer more civil service tests. Life and safety. DCAS security received $500,000 in FY18 to hire nine DCAS special officers. These officers will be providing security staffing for weekend civil service examinations that will be administered at the Queen's computerized testing and application centers, as well as other locations. Space renovation at 1 Center Street. In order to continue to meet the service demands of city agencies, we received $1.6 million in the current fiscal year that will be used to create 60 additional employee workstation within 100 Center Street. Agency efficiency initiatives. As requested by OMB, we have identified savings in areas that will not adversely affect the agency's ability to provide critical services to both the public and our sister city agencies. Energy efficiency at DCAS managed buildings. DCAS is projecting a reduction of $700,000 to the agency's energy expenditures starting in FY18 with the completion of energy efficiency projects such as the installation of steam traps and light fixtures with more energy efficient LED lighting. NYSERDA incentive payments. DCAS expects to receive $500,000 annually and in incentive payments from the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, NYSERDA, starting FY17 through FY19. These incentive payments are associated with the installation of solar photovoltaic power project projects at 24 schools throughout the city that were completed in FY16. Auto auction proceeds. DCAS will earn an additional $1.8 million above the current baseline from the sale of surplus vehicles relinquished by city agencies in FY17. Revenues. The FY18 total DCAS revenue budget is $60.2 million, primarily due to commercial rents of city-owned property projected at $42.1 million. Another significant revenue source is the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment, totaling $6.9 million. And lastly, we will receive revenue about $3.5 million from applicant filing fees for civil service examinations. DCAS capital. The DCAS capital plan for FY18 totals $915 million. The majority of the capital budget is dedicated to facility upgrades and energy conservation initiatives. DCAS managed facilities. DCAS's capital construction program for city-owned office and court buildings in FY18 totals $500 million. Examples of some projects include $147 million for fire protection and suppression systems, including the Brooklyn Supreme Court, Bronx Supreme Court, and 80 Center Street. $120 million for interior renovations, including the relocation of housing and civil court parts from lease space at 141 Livingston Street to 2 Tenderalaman Street. And $95.5 million is allocated for electrical upgrades, including Queens Criminal Court, the 2 Tenderalaman Street, and the Manhattan Surrogates Court. Leased space construction projects. This action relates to DCAS's capital program for the construction of space as well as the purchase of furniture and related equipment and leased facilities for FY18 totals $126 million. 
projects include $15.2 million to relocate sanitation and NYPD from their current site at 137 Center Street, $2.8 million for renovations associated with the renewal of warehouse space for DYCD in Brooklyn, energy conservation and clean energy projects. In FY18, $260 million in capital funding is allocated for citywide energy conservation and clean energy projects to support the mayor's One City Built to Last program. Examples include $13.6 million for energy efficiency retrofits at 60 CAS buildings, $26 million for the solar power additions, lighting fixtures, and energy efficiency retrofits at DOE schools, and $25 million for lighting upgrades and energy efficiency retrofits to eight Department of Corrections facilities at Rikers Island. In an effort to increase transparency on the progress of DCAS's initiatives, we have made revisions to the mayor's management report, including the provision of annual and cumulative indicators with targets for greenhouse gas emissions in indicators that now report on all of DCAS's projects under the Manage Energy Use by City Agency Service. In the past calendar year, DCAS also added a host of new indicators to track and report out on collisions, injuries, and fatalities involving city vehicles. DCAS continues to work internally and with key stakeholders to improve upon and advance government transparency at our agency, and I thank the Council for its partnership in these efforts. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the DCAS's planned expenditures and revenues for FY18, as well as our capital plan. I look forward to a continued working relationship with the Council over the next year, and I welcome any questions at this time. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll start off with the uh, topic that just won't go away, deed restrictions. So has the city generated any revenue from changing the terms of any deed restrictions since the Rivington sale? There have not been any uh, new deed modifications uh, since Rivington. Are there any deed restrictions currently being reviewed by DCAS? We have received seven uh, requests for deed modifications, uh, but we are still evaluating whether the information provided is complete. Uh, once that's done, the process, the new process under the, the new local law will begin. Uh, where are they located? What are the terms? And is there local community support? We have, we can certainly share this document with you as a preliminary measure, but we have uh, seven requests in varying neighborhoods, Longwood, Bed Bed-Stuy, East Flatbush, Harlem, Crown Heights, Bushwick, East New York. Uh, like I said, we have not yet begun the formal process. We're still evaluating all that they, that they have filed completed applications, so we have not yet begun outreach to determine whether or not there's community support. Great, uh, so I'll instruct a sergeant in arms to, if you'll give them the formal, make copies for folks in the committee. Thank you. Uh, so I guess just under the uh, new process, when does each deed restriction become public information? Once we've determined that applicants have completed the application with the updated re re request for information, uh, once we deemed a package complete, then we will notify both the applicant and borough presidents, council members, and community boards. Of the, of the full package and submit and share that information with all of the parties. And how is that information going to be noticed to the general public? I believe it is uh, posted, or certainly it's emailed uh, to all of the, um, uh, the requested parties and I believe it's also required to be posted online. And will the posting online be by borrow block and lot number or will it be by known address or other terms that are used to identify the location? by address if, if it has an address, yes. Uh, and so, thank you. And of these seven requests, how many of them, uh, what happened at, at a previous hearing you had identified that were, there were 13 or 14 uh, pending deed restrictions. Uh, what happened to those? Are these seven reflective of those or are we talking about 21? No, the, the ones that were pending at the time of the review uh, we've communicated that if they wanted to resubmit, they needed to resubmit under the new, under the new law. 
Uh, there is overlap, but there are uh, one or two new ones that were not under the previous uh, categories that were on hold. I'd like to acknowledge you've been joined by Councilmember Joe Borelli. And what are you ex do you expect to see a budget impact for these seven requests in fiscal year 18? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. Uh, the process itself, uh, I'm sorry, what was it, 18 or 18? For FY18, will there be a budget, budget impact of these seven current pending requests? It's unclear. Uh, depending on how long the process uh, under will, will take it is when we expect to see any budget impact. Many of these require ULERP, which, as you know, take, takes a significant uh, amount of time. Now, on Friday, February 24th, hours after the federal prosecutors and FBI agents finished questioning Mayor de Blasio, why was Deputy Commissioner of Asset Management Ricardo Morales fired? That is a very sensitive personnel issue, as you can imagine. Um, so I won't be getting into specifics or details today. Uh, what I can say is that uh, such a personnel issue had absolutely nothing to do with Rivington. It was a part of a number of changes that we had undertaken to really focus on improving um, operations overall in the agency. It was one of many changes that we rolled out on around the same time. And, and who made the decision uh, with regards to Ricardo Morales? As with any personnel decision, I make the decision for and, personnel. And did you communicate about your decision with anyone else in the administration? As with any large decision, I'm in constant communication with uh, my, my bosses, uh, my, my boss, Tony Shores, and the folks at City Hall. Uh, with, as with any large change that I have. And, and so you communicated about your decision to First Deputy Mayor Tony Shores as well as uh, folks at City Hall, and, and you also communicated the date that it would occur? I've, the, we were in discussions for uh, a while before uh, the, the decision was taken place. So we were in, con yes, we, we communicated before. And so, as you've just testified, and as Kathy Hansen, your spokesperson, said in the Wall Street Journal, these changes have been in the works for some time and have nothing to do with Mayor City Hall cooperation with the U.S. Attorney. So who is the new Deputy Commissioner for Asset Management? So, as I mentioned, we rolled out a number of changes within the agency, uh, including some restructuring within the Asset Management line of service. Uh, we have broken it up uh, to a facilities management uh, unit and a real estate services. Uh, currently, we have interim appointments while we do undertake a search to fill those, uh, to fill those slots permanently. So who, who is currently filling the, the role previously filled by the Deputy Commissioner of Asset Management? Currently we have two uh, folks that are internal to the city, one, who, one who's uh, been with the uh, Asset Management line of service for a, a number of years. Uh, Jerry Torres is acting Deputy Commissioner for the facilities management side. Uh, and for the real estate services side, uh, we have Interim Commissioner uh, Laura Ringelheim. And, and so you mentioned you were looking for a replacement. So this happened two weeks ago. I, I went on NYC.gov, the jobs portal, and uh, I checked everything you've got listed at DCAS. You've got 30 jobs, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Asset Management, nor anything related to asset management is not one of them. Uh, do you intend to publicly post for the position? Those is should be up. Those went up last week. We can share those postings with you. Sure. I was not able to find it through the uh, jobs portal, so if you can make sure to share with Absolutely. folks how to find it. Yes. And in terms of it, so you're looking for a public fill, or is this going to be staff within your agency? I'm sorry? What type of candidate? Is this going to be internal promotion, or is it going to be a, a public? This is a public search. Okay. And uh, in terms of the, the Deputy Commissioner for Asset Management, does that title, did that position previously report to only you as commissioner, or did that position have other reports? That position reported to me directly. And did they report to anybody else? Did they have other contacts with the administration other than the commissioner? Internal to the agency, uh, just myself. Okay. So the, the, the deputy commissioner was not reporting to Tony Shores or anyone from no. City Hall, and it would not be appropriate no. for them to be communicating directly with that person? No. And I guess just, I, I have to ask, so was Ricardo Morales fired because of Rivington? As I stated very clearly, 
that personnel decision had nothing to do with Rivington. But it was, it, was it part of a pattern of poor performance? As I mentioned, as this is a personnel issue, a very sensitive discussion, it's not uh, uh, a topic that I, I can get into at a budget hearing publicly. And, and just, was this termination related to dealings with Rhonda Singh and Water's Edge lease? As I mentioned, it's a personnel issue uh, that I, uh, personnel issues are very sensitive. I'm not right. at liberty to discuss that right now. And, and I might elicit the same response, but the, I think everyone's just thinking it. So has any information come to your attention that might indicate uh, that Ricardo Morales might be cooperating with authorities? As I mentioned, the changes that we've instituted uh, overall at the agency were focused on improving efficiencies and operations within the agency. DCAS is subject to current ongoing investigations. Do you believe that Deputy Commissioner of Asset Management Ricardo Morales might have information that might be useful to the authorities in their ongoing investigations? As I mentioned, all of the changes have to do with focusing on the operations and efficiency of the agency. And because I know that folks will ask me what this has to do with budget, I guess I'll just wrap up with, so uh, in the press coverage in the Times and the Wall Street Journal, there's quotes from an attorney, Guy Oxhandler, who has uh, been featured with regards to the termination. Has a notice of claim or other communication be received of pending claim or lawsuit relating to Mr. Morales' termination? Or in layman's language, are we getting sued for firing him? To date, to my knowledge, I have not received any notification to that matter. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, for answering the parts of the questions that you couldn't when the uh, information comes to light that you were able to share uh, regarding this sensitive issue. Please do uh, pass that along. Uh, with regards to provisionals, uh, and if we can. Uh, if you could please state your name and uh, we will swear you in. Don Pinnock, Deputy Commissioner, Human Capital, DCAS. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. According to uh, this committee, jointly with the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, has held two hearings on provisionals since 2014. According to DCAS's provisional reduction plan released in October of 2014, we had 22,939 provisional employees. The goal, as stated in the plan, was to reduce that number by 8,666 by the end of 2016. Despite early progress, this did not happen, and as of November 30th, 2016, we are now at 23,894 provisional employees, 995 more than when we started. Uh, in fact, the state had to pass legislation allowing DCAS additional time to meet its legal requirements to reduce provisional employees and bring civil service hires. Uh, what, what's, what's going on? We made some progress, now we're losing ground. I'll kick it off and I'll turn it over to Don. Um, Unfortunately, the, those numbers don't reflect the level of effort and work that the team has been doing to really tackle this area. Um, and also, unfortunately, when we put together the, the plan submitted by the state, including the goal of reduction, it did not take into account uh, that hiring would occur for titles that were not on our uh, schedule or planned to administer exams for. So um, uh, while we did actually uh, obtain and, and, meet, and make a lot of progress in reducing the number of provisionals that were in existence at the time that the plan started, um, and if you look at those, we actually uh, reduced the numbers, uh, not, not including, not counting new hires, uh, we, we reduced the, the number of provisionals by over 10,000. Unfortunately, due to backfills and, and new programs that were created and hiring and titles that didn't have a list, uh, we did not make as much progress as we, as we wanted to uh, in the overall number. 
um, which is why we're very excited about the, the resources that we've been able to obtain in order to really address the, the, the shortfall. So we have an automation project uh, to um, address and reduce the cycle times to develop and administer tests and to create uh, civil service lists. Um, we were able to get an increased headcount to supplement the, 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 the team to really increase the number of exams that, uh, th that we are working to prepare to, to increase both the titles that have lists available to them and the number of appointments. Um, and I can turn it over to Don to continue. Uh, so let me just jump in. So at the last hearing we asked if this could be added to the MMR. It wasn't. Uh, it, can you explain why that didn't happen and whether or not you will add it to the MMR going forward? Additionally, at the previous hearing, you indicated you'd be uh, filling 5,000 of the provisional slots, and as far as we can tell, that also did not happen. So I'll take the, the last one first. Um, we actually did appoint and, and resolve, and I think there's a difference. We appointed and resolved over 5,000 of those appointments from the lists that we anticipated uh, certifying and publishing. Uh, unfortunately, for titles that where we did not have lists, hiring in those areas kept happening. So while we reduced the number of provisionals for certain titles, which is the list that we were able to produce. Uh, unfortunately, hiring happened at, at about the same pace in areas where we didn't have uh, exams uh, scheduled for. So it's one of those um, situations where, unfortunately, we, we take care of one large title and hiring and others uh, happen. Um, but with the automation and the increased resources, we, uh, we will see, we anticipate seeing uh, a controlled, uh, controlled for that, for as many uh, titles as, as possible being um, tested for and lists being uh, administered. In your testimony, you announced that the qualifying incumbent examination was being automated, that it was fully online uh, as of September 2016, and that you were administering the first test as of January, uh, and that was for anyone who has two years of provisional service. Uh, that's actually 10,616 provisionals uh, so who, who have been serving more than 24 months. Uh, so will all of those receive a QIE? Will all of them receive a qualifying incumbent examination uh, prior to the end of this fiscal year and before you're back here again? So the legislation was actually very tailored to specific, 193 specific titles that we actually worked with our partners in labor and other city agencies in order to, to make, to, to put together. So not all provisionals that are serving for two years or more will be, um, will be uh, captured under, that, um, under the law. Uh, but we do anticipate, be, because of the automation of the QIE exam, we anticipate providing exams for all of the listed titles uh, in the QIE format. How many, how many of the 10,616 provisionals uh, will be captured by your QIE and the 193 titles? It's approximately one half of that number, 5,000. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, um, the reason why we needed legal authority to administer this exam is because it was not an exam that would be open to everyone serving provisionally in every title. Um, as part of our commitment um, and, and working in hand-in-hand -in -hand with labor, we decided to focus on titles for which, frankly, DCAS has not had the resources to test for in many years and also to not offer exams um, in titles for which lists currently existed because um, municipal employees had already gone through the process of taking and passing those exams. So we're working on multiple tiers. Um, just to offer some of the success that we've had already with the QIEs, so since um, between January and March, we've administered 29 exams. Um, and for our nine exams that we administered specifically in January, we will have those lists ready in the next three weeks. So um, I think that that's a clear indication of how automation from end to end really supports us in not only testing quickly and efficiently, but also generating um, qualified lists. So the 5,000 about that you've identified, how long will it take you to provide a uh, qualifying incumbent examination for all 5,000? 
Well, we've already um, fully loaded all the testing information into our system, um, but we are rolling out um, a monthly schedule. So we alert every agency and every individual who is qualified to take the exam. We've hosted information sessions because we do recognize that a fully automated end-to-end -end system is not something that most of our test takers are used to. And so we actually walk them through the process. We explain why they're eligible. We talk to them about the automated appeals process, which as you know, that's not been an automated process for us. Um, and so every month we send out the calendar. But the full calendar is also available online to anyone who's interested in reviewing it. Based on the calendar you're setting, how many months before the 5,000 provisionals are all able to take the exam? Well, the last set of QIEs will be administered um, um, in March of 2018. And so um, our timeline in terms of um, generating lists would be, so it's April, May, June. So our last folks would be appointed in June. That's when you would see um, the last um, list for the QIE eligibles. Is it possible to administer these exams before March, before 2018? Is it possible to get it done within this current administration? While it's possible because of technology, it's not recommended from our perspective because we actually went through a very comprehensive and thoughtful analysis to ensure that the greatest number of individuals serving in these titles would be eligible. Um, so if you look at our schedule, you will see that for this fiscal year, we've tackled approximately 69 QIE titles. The remainder of those titles are covered in fiscal year 18 because we wanted to ensure that folks who've been waiting for so long to be tested had that opportunity. We didn't want folks to miss a month or two months of eligibility. And so that's the reason why our last wave is happening in March of 2018, but all appointments will be done well in advance of the conclusion of this plan, which ends on December 31st of 2018. You mentioned that certain, that, that some of your uh, provisionals may not be familiar with the fully automated process. Uh, what is DCAS doing to make sure that because of issues like digital divide or the fact that some of these folks may have been working with the city for years and years and may not be as familiar with uh, computers versus filling things out on paper, uh, that this does not have a, uh, uh, an impact on people based on their ethnicity or race? Um, that's the reason why I believe that the information sessions are critical to the process. We walk folks through the technology, we explain to them how this test is a bit different, but also with our computerized testing centers, whenever someone comes in, if they are unclear about how to sign up for the exam, we walk them through the process. We have kiosks that are there um, where we um, provide that direct service. And also our Office of Citywide Recruitment, when they host information sessions across the city about civil service, they talk about our various testing formats as well. I guess just, if, if it would be possible to just share internally and also with the council just what we're seeing as folks are taking the automated and electronic process and uh, if you can share results by uh, race and ethnicity or, or uh, even pay levels of what have you just so that we can see whether or not there is an impact or whether or not this is a, a fair test because that is important. I will also add that we're working with uh, our partners in labor to um, inform them and have them uh, be partners in getting the information out on how to navigate uh, this new system as well. Now, you, you touched on it, which is just how long does it take to get the list? So in 2014, I objected to the, quote, median time from examination administration to list establishment, end of quote, of 439 days and a goal of 500 days for fiscal year 2015. In 2016, you changed the measure to, quote, median time from exam administration to exam results completion, end of quote. So you divorced off the list establishment, and you achieved 209 days in fiscal year 15. Now, for the first four months of fiscal year 2017, you are back up to 426 days on a new measure, and you haven't set a goal. Uh, should someone have to wait more than a year to find out how they did on a civil service exam? And we've been joined by Council Member David Greenfield. I, I will say that neither of us here were very happy with those numbers. Uh, and it was useful uh, to see them printed in, in black and white to really, you know, uh, take some action. Uh, Don has done a great job at uh, making sure that uh, she's looking at all of these indicators. Um, 
because we didn't like those numbers, there are a number of things that we're doing to address it. I mean, I, I spoke uh, in depth about the automation work that uh, is that we're working on, which should certainly help in the reduction of cycle time, both in the de exam development um, and list uh, establishment. Um, we unfortunately had some issues with attrition in that area, and as you can imagine, with the, with administering a higher number of exams with fewer folks, um, that will cause uh, a delay uh, that's apparent in these numbers, uh, which we are addressing by uh, by increasing the, the the folks that are that are working on it, as well as the increase in headcount that we received specifically within the exams unit. Uh, to be able to really work on the cycle times on that. I don't know if you want to add to anything. In addition to the loss of staff, so, um, and the loss of staff, we had approximately seven people who separated from service, which represented about 23% of our staffing in that area. Um, in addition, um, we tried a new testing format that while we had some upfront gains, um, since our processes are still manual on the back end, um, testing 16,700 people and having to hand rate papers, um, frankly, that adds quite a bit of time to the process. Um, and lastly, during that time period, we offered more multi-part exams, meaning that in some cases we needed time and access to a space that was not necessarily under the auspices of um, DCAS. And so that added some time to the schedule as well. But as the commissioner mentioned, it's certainly not where we want to be. And you know, definitely with the additional resources and the investment in automation, um, we're certain that these numbers will improve. Yeah, it begs the question. So. Uh, I, I understand there's restructuring. How many positions have you lost in the past fiscal year to attrition? How many have been lost because uh, they don't have a role in the new structure? And how many are, are pending? Do you want me to? Okay. Well, um, the seven positions um, that I refer to um, where we lost staff, um, we've been able to backfill those roles. But in addition to that, we've received um, approximately 15 lines specifically for exams development. Um, what we're doing as part of our reorganization, we're changing the role of our test and measurement specialists. So those are the folks who are in charge of every aspect of the exam. And in some cases, you know, they're pulled aside to handwrite papers, to work on appeals. Um, and so we are redesigning the job where they will solely focus on exam development and item banking, meaning that we will have more test questions. The staff who will work alongside them will perform some of those other manual tasks until such time we're fully automated. And, and for, for agency-wide? Uh have we, how much attrition have we had in the past fiscal year? How many folks have been removed for restructuring and how many are pending? Why or mm -hmm. see why we have about attrition numbers would be ten percent. If you can turn on your microphone and state your name for the record. Yes, uh, Richard Badillo. Um, Deputy Commissioner, Chief Financial Officer, VCAS. Um, currently, we have 191 vacancies at VCAS agency-wide. And, and how many were from attrition and how many were from restructuring? Well, attrition uh, is about 10% of the agency's headcount. Um, that's what we project and that's what's been occurring on an actual basis. Um, so we estimate about 200 attrits this fiscal year. And how many are going to be removed from restructuring, or is those who are being restructured? Just they're all being opted? replaced. If they're being restructured, they're just moving from one unit to the other. They're not being uh, they're not being let go of in terms of uh, being removed from the agency. So restructuring is just within the human capital area. They're being moved around from one area to another. So why was Morales? let go versus restructured and move to, to another position within the agency? As I mentioned, that's a personnel issue. Um, overall, the changes had to do with uh, operationalizing, uh, improvements to the overall operations. So, so has, has anyone else been terminated, been fired other than Morales since you've been in? There have been, agency-wide, I'm sure there have been some terminations, yes. That you were personally involved in? that I was personally involved with, uh, not to my knowledge. And, and in terms of for the termination, is it standard practice to have DCAS security escort the person out or uh, not? It is standard practice to have 
to have to escort folks out, yes. So anyone who's terminated from DCAS will be escorted out by security no matter what? Yes. Okay. I'd like to open it up to questions from my colleagues. Again, it's five minutes, and it is Menchaca Borelli followed by Greenfield. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I was kind of following the back and forth, and I just want to thank the Chair's leadership in just really digging down to the impact of what is a personnel issue, no doubt, and really trying to understand how, how that impacts the budget, but also the kind of um, the, the, the next step vision and the phases of the next step vision for DCAS. I also want to welcome you and, and, and congratulate you on your leadership. Uh, we, we, need more, uh, we need more women leading the, the way, and so I, I just am very thankful that you're here to represent in every, in every capacity um, and, um, and welcoming that and our, our relationship that we're going to develop over the next few, um, for the next chapter of our, of our work. But back on, on to the question about Ricardo Morales, I think what's interesting is, and, and this is where I think it got to this question, and I'm, I have one question, and I'm going to go into some policy items, but I, I think I read somewhere that, that he was the one that kind of rejected the contract with Waters Edge or Waters, the, 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 the kind of contract is, that is under investigation right now. Just wanted to confirm if that is true. I, sort of, I don't know if that was something that I read or... It would be great to, to kind of get clarity on that, on that piece. Did you want to take this? I'm not oh, and if you can identify yourself, and, and I don't know if we're going to do... Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The question at, at, at its core is, uh, was, was it Ricardo Morales who, who I think rejected the contract with Waters Edge, I think that's the company's name, um, that is under investigation right now? Uh, my name is Suzanne Lynn. I'm general counsel of DCAS. Can we just uh, swear you in and we'll yeah. credit you for the time? Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, th that is a matter um, on which we cannot comment at this point. Okay, so you can't comment. So it, so it wasn't public, it wasn't, there wasn't any kind of public notice about this or public information? Okay. We're going to move on because I only have a little bit of time, but we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you so much, General Counsel. So I, I want to talk a little bit about buildings and the, the assets that, that is managed by DCAS. So you have a real good kind of focus on equipment. Is there something that kind of gives a, a, a current and public transparent view of all the city-owned property? And is that something that is, that is focused on, on that? And I'll, I'll do a couple punches. Uh, so one, a, a kind of big conversation about public lists of public property to the energy plan here and how it kind of connects to that list. And then also the kind of third category, a kind of new bottom line that I want to talk about, which is those buildings that have a lot of um, kind of connection to community. So some of them are kind of open to the public and some of them are not. And so I wanted to kind of see a sense of, of collaboration between the, the, the buildings that are going to have a lot more public touch. Uh, some of them are in my district, but really kind of citywide approach to making sure that if there is a, an intention to bring more kind of solar, um, solar work with public buildings, DCAS owns and operates, and have touch with the community to increase awareness. And so I wanted to see if there was a real plan. I don't see that here, but if there is, it'd be great to hear about that. Sure. I'll kick it off in terms of just generally, and then I'll... Um, throw it to Anthony. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All of our, all of the city-owned properties are actually uh, online on the open data portal. Uh, so anything uh, under DCAS's jurisdiction will be included there. Um, in terms of community access generally, there are uh, we have a number of uh, our buildings that are leased out to community uh, nonprofits uh, that, that are able to, pro, to, to uh, engage in their mission. Um, with respect to the solar and the, and the energy, I'm going to uh, turn it over to... And, and just to clarify on the, on the portal, is yes. there a, a kind of delineation between those that are open to the public with a lease from the nonprofit or, like, say, Borough Hall, that's a lease to a, a, an elected official? And, and is that information kind of clear or... Are or um, revealed. I believe it is, but let me okay. get back to you on that. Thank you. Mm 
uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, Anthony Fiore, Deputy Commissioner for Energy Management. Um, so thank you. Good to see you as well. Uh, so, you know, the city has a 100 megawatt goal for installing solar on government buildings. Um, we've to date installed about 10 megawatts. We have about uh, 17 megawatts in the queue for this coming year. Um, as we've testified previously on this topic, um, we are working with stakeholders on um, how we do that. We've, we've been meeting with um, environmental groups, environmental justice groups, um, and labor groups uh, on our solar program. Those discussions continue. Um, the latest, uh, the last discussion we had was only a week ago, and, uh, and that will continue. Um, there are two components to solar deployment in the city. It's what we can do on our public buildings, and you know, that is um, limited by where those public buildings are to begin with, and then um, secondly, uh, what shape they are in, in to receive solar on the roofs. Um, but we're also working in close coordination with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability on a broader citywide deployment of, of solar. Um, and there's been a, sol a pilot solarized program in the city. Um, that, that program will expand this year. Um, and we are looking at how we can start uh, developing uh, community shared solar. So if you live in a building that um, is not, cannot accept solar because the roof is too small or it's shaded, what have you, that doesn't limit your access to solar um, if it can be placed on another building and then you can subscribe to that solar gener generation. Got it. I don't know how much more time you're going to give me, Chair, for those swearing-ins, but if I have one more question, I can come in the second round, if that's okay. We'll one last question. Um, I want to come back and dig a little bit more on the uh, sec Carlos second. Carlos will add you to second round. Everyone's been really patient. One last question, yeah. On, on second round. Uh, the, the next is going to be Borelli followed by Greenfield, and you, you can even take your second round before me. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, we're going from properties that everyone seems to want to properties nobody wants. Um, in my district and in a, a bunch of different parts of Staten Island, there's um, sliver lots that are vacant properties that you guys own and maintain. Has there been any progress in divesting the agency of these properties and selling them to adjacent owners? Yes, we have a, a program called Sail Away. Uh, where we have, we identify uh, sliver lots that abut uh, other property owners and we would approach um, those property owners to see if they would like to purchase them from the city. Okay, is, is there, do you guys keep statistics on how many you were yes. able to do or? So last, uh, this fiscal year we've only sold one lot, uh, but overall since the beginning of the program we've sold 32 sliver lots. Okay, great. Um, other vacant properties are, are not, by definition, sliver lots because they're buildable, um, but they're vacant and they're still, I presume, costly to maintain. I, I know you guys every once in a while get a complaint from my office or somewhere else that needs to be cleaned up. Have you guys identified lots that you, you see no future use for? that you'd be willing to divest and give to another agency? So typically any, any lot, any unused lot that is developable, uh, the first thing we do is confer with our uh, other agencies to determine whether or not they have a use for it. So while there might be the perception from the public that we have a number of unused lots sitting there not being looked at, many of them are in fact on hold for future development either by EDC or HPD. It takes a while to develop a program and, and develop an RFP but we have a, a number of them on hold for future projects. So if, if I were to ask you, not now because I don't expect you to have the information on every lot you own, um, but if I was to ask a, a question of what agency has sort of placed a hold on a particular lot, you would be able to sort of provide that? If, if, it, if there's a hold on it, yes. Okay. Um, and if there's no hold on it, is there a process by which vacant lots can be transferred to uh, Parks Department for preservation? So if there is no, if there's not a, a, a current hold on it, then we will do another round surveying the agencies to determine whether or not they're, they're 
they have a, a future use for it. It's, it's helpful to do it more than once because you know priorities change and or new funding comes online, etc. Uh, so we will be doing that uh, once again. Okay, thank you very much. Greenfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Thanks for coming out here today. Appreciate it. Uh, wanted to follow up on uh, a few issues uh, specifically. First, I want to start off with some legislation that we passed last year providing uh, non-public schools with security guards. How many non-public schools are currently participating in that program? We received 180 proposals, uh, but we have selected and approved 163 of them. Okay, great. And uh, specifically on the reimbursement uh, portion, how's that going? How many of them have been reimbursed already? So we have not have we've not had a reimbursement yet. Uh, we have we're working through a number. We're reviewing a number of uh, submissions currently, and we're close to issuing payments. Okay, great. Why why haven't you had a reimbursement yet? So as with any process, it takes a while. We had to re register MOUs, uh, which some are, some are still not uh, at the controller's office for registration. I think that there's a back and forth between the schools and, and the agency. Uh, but for, the, for those that have been registered, um, we're processing invoices through Accelerator uh, and you know, reviewing all of the invoices with the backup documents does take a while, and I think that the functionality of Accelerator, unfortunately, doesn't allow for partial payments. So, if, even I, though, I, yeah, I understand. No, I'm, I'm only asking because some of the schools told me they've been reluctant to apply because they're worried about getting the reimbursements. I just wanted to make sure that's coming along well. Which leads me to my next question: What's your anticipation for next year? Right, this is a smaller program. This year, we've seen a lot. Unfortunately, 97 percent increase in. Uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes alone in the first two months of the year. A lot more schools have reached out to us about being interested. Do you have a projection for next year and how much money you think it is that you're going to be spending on this program? We do, I think. Do we have projections for next year? No, right now, it's, uh, right now we don't have any money in the budget at FY20. We're going back to OMB during, the, uh, during right now the executive budget process to request at the minimum, the $19.8 million that was funded this fiscal uh, Please turn on your mic. What was yeah. that? Your no. mic. Oh, I'm I wasn't sorry. sure if it was the mic or if it was the Okay, I'll repeat that. Um, there is no funding in FY18 as of yet for the program. The program was only funded in FY17. We are in discussions with OMB about having that value for FY18 funded in the executive budget. At this point, we are submitting a value of $19.8 million for FY18. So I apologize, I'm a little bit confused. The law requires that it be funded at a minimum level of $19.8 million. You're saying it's not funded at the level right now? Right now in FY18, there was no funding in the budget. It was just a one-year funding uh, arrangement from a fiscal standpoint. Um, OMB realizes the obligation will repeat itself in FY18. That would not be an issue. Okay. I'd love to follow up with you on this issue offline because I'm running out of time and also just have a little bit of a better understanding of this because the, the law as it was written, I wrote the law, so I'm familiar mm -hmm. with how it was written, was mm -hmm. that the first year would be $19.8 million and the future years would be based on need. And so if there's a more significant need, which is what I'm uh, <clears throat> raising over here today, then we might actually need more than that. So if you don't mind, I'll follow up with you offline on that. We don't have to uh, <clears throat> take up the chair's valuable time over here. I'm going to move on to my next question. Uh, the ability to track different city vehicles. My specific interest, of course, has to do with uh, garbage trucks. Uh, as you may know, we're doing them during the snowstorms. We're going to be all very excited, at least my children are, tomorrow with the big blizzard of uh, 2017 that's going to be coming down the pike. We, we do track them during blizzards. Many people get stuck behind garbage trucks as sort of a routine part of daily life and other city uh, vehicles as well. Do you have the ability to make that information public? Is there currently tracking devices in every single city car? Can we publicize that information based on an agency by agency review? Can you talk to us a little bit more about what that technology looks like and how easy or difficult that might be to achieve? I'll kick it off and I'll turn it over. We do currently have Cansievers installed in uh, the bulk of our fleet. They do not provide real-time tracking data. 
Uh, it's a passive system. Uh, we are piloting uh, something up for 300 vehicles um, to do some more real-time tracking. Um, and I'll just try to toss it over there. Hi, Keith Kerman, Deputy Commissioner of Fleet. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, as the commissioner mentioned, we, the current system that we have is a passive um, tracking system. I mean, basically, the difference between passive and real time is it's an analytical tool. We update information every month. Um, what and you know we get a lot of information. Some of it's in very vehicle specific terms, so G force information, maintenance codes. Not uh, it's not completely easy to access. Um, the big difference between passive and real time, and the only difference, is cellular costs. So you know to do the whole fleet, and I know this issue has come up with sanitation. It, we estimate it'd be about four million dollars in annual OTPS costs. So when we first were asked to develop this, we developed an option that would get us a lot of analytical tools, um, but um, one that wouldn't impact those costs. So, so that's where we are now. We have a lot of interest in, in live AVL and, and, and getting into a live system, and we are piloting um, with Verizon Network Fleet through a state contract, um, 300 vehicles now, and, and to kind of show the, the benefit of doing that. Thank you. Well, so you've got three minutes yeah. for Thank now you. in round two, and then I'll follow up with questions. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, so if I can go back to the kind of energy conversation, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of dig straight into a, um, a kind of deeper analysis about the, so I understand, I understand that there is a focus, and that's clear in the testimony for solar. There's the PLA, the work that's coming in that's going to build this stuff. What I'm wondering is whether or not there's a real strategy to focus the buildings that are connected to community in some way. So there's some buildings that will never touch community and they're not coming in, they're not coming out. This is a, a kind of a facility for workers and uh, I guess what, some, of, some of these buildings will have bigger impact for deeper awareness about the solar plan that the city has. And so I'm wondering if there's a strategy around focus on that. Second different question, but I'm going to throw the both out, I only have three minutes. Is, um, is actually a, a hearing that we had way back last calendar year, I believe, with the Department of Transportation on driverless cars. So when, when I heard that, I thought, why are we having a conversation about driverless cars? I learned a lot throughout the entire hearing. And DOT and TLC came in and, and testified. The fleet that you're, that you're, you're kind of reporting today is massive. Uh, in the thousands. And so, one, I wanted to know if DCAS was kind of thinking that way and how you are invited into this conversation about driverless cars um, and this kind of larger technology question about preparing the agency uh, because this analysis is, is, is further than we think nationally from the federal government. We have a different federal government now that I think they're all gone now in a lot of ways. But I kind of wanted to hear if DCAS was thinking about that both on the budget question anticipating the, the impact of the budget. So those are two different questions, and it'd be great to have, have answers to both of those. So I'll answer the solar question first. So we do have a strategy, and the strategy is working with the different stakeholders to understand what their priorities are. And so we have formed a working group um, to do that, where we um, develop a screening tool um, that has a number of different variables that would then prior lead to a prioritization matrix um, in order for us to, to deploy the solar. Does that include a community conversation? So for example, if there's, like a, if there's a community organization or community process or building that's transitioning, AKA the court building in Sunset Park on, on Fourth Avenue, um, that's gonna now be part of a library uh, uh, swing space, that has more impact so I guess what I'm saying is, 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 does that strategy include in the matrix a kind of community component, a, a kind of community conversation, a, a, is the community asking for it, and is that part of it? Or are we just kind of thinking about this as a, well, actually, I, I'll let you answer the question. I'm trying to answer it for you. <laughs> so I think there's, there's two components to this again. One is what we can do with, with the city buildings, and I think you're right in, in, with respect to how much a public building may or may not touch a community. Um, and so in, in working with the various stakeholders that 
uh, are representing communities, um, we are developing that type of screening tool. I think part of any process um, where a public building is going uh, under a transformation, th there, are, there are presentations to community boards and so forth that allow for that um, interjection of, of community desires. Um, so, but the, the broader perspective, again, I, I think is, is important to keep on the table, and that's um, how we can engage the community from a city-wide level um, in solarized campaigns. That's really getting into the communities and saying what's, what's important to you and how can the city help aggregate um, participation to lower soft costs um, in order to make it more affordable uh, for communities. Thank you. There's a, another. Sure. On the on the vehicle design side, so we are very engaged in in safety and vehicle design um, as part of Vision Zero. Um, we've been partnering with the US DOT, the Volpe Center, um, which is kind of their engineering and think tank there on what we're calling a safe fleet transition plan, which should be done this year. Basically, that will be a comprehensive plan to ensure that we specify the highest feasible, feasible um, aspects of safety in all the city fleet when we buy vehicles. And the city buys about 156 different types of vehicles, which cover most of what the market is. Um, I will tell you that, you know, Self-driving cars is, is an interesting concept. In the more immediate sense, we're much more excited about things like automatic braking. So this um, spring, we'll get our first 450 vehicles in with automatic braking. Um, we know, based on some of the crash tracking that we do, that over 50% of all the collisions we have which cause injury involve rear-ending. So automatic braking is a very specific um, tool in place now that goes to the heart of a lot of the injury and cost we have. So certainly those kind of uh, technologies that are readily available and implementable are what we're focusing on and, and we will you know, keep our eye on self-driving cars as that develops. Thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Uh, thank you. So just to wrap up on the provisionals and civil service exams, Don, uh, I would like, DCAS, would you consider setting a goal of 180 days from exam to results so that someone who's unemployed can sit for an exam and get their results before their unemployment runs out? And can we please have a specific number on the reduction that we should expect before the end of this calendar year? We're, we're certainly open to uh, getting a numerical target, and in fact, we're in the process of analyzing to see how best to, to determine that. Um, that analysis includes uh, information and data that's dependent on finalizing the budget with headcount and, and, and really working with agencies to determine uh, what their upcoming hiring needs. So we are currently undertaking that analysis, uh, and we're, we're certainly open to, to generating a, a numerical target. As far as uh, establishing a target for exam completion, uh, I think that we're, we're open to that as well, given all of the, the resources and automation and, 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 and lines that we're getting. Um, we, we, we would want to make sure that we are uh, working um, in that vein, so we're, we're open to that. Thank you. I'd like to move on to Fleet. In your testimony, you indicate that the plan is to have over 1,000 electric cars in operation by the end of this calendar year. According to the MMR, we currently have 966 as of the four-month fiscal 17 uh, actual. If you're adding 450, uh, are we looking at 1,416 electric vehicles by the end of this calendar year? Hi, so in the MMR, the electric vehicle number there also includes off-road, um, electric carts, electric forklifts, other kind of off-road units. So by the end of this year, and we could distinguish them, but it's all good. It's can, all can we distinguish between the golf sure. carts and... It's, uh, it's all positive, though. So by the end of this year, we'll probably have about 1,100, based on current orders, on-road, fully operational on-road 
um, electric vehicles. And then when you add in the off-road, it'll be about 16 to 1,700, so, um, but making a real big advance on both sides. Will you commit to breaking out between electric golf carts, scooters, and forklifts, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, with regards to fleet, uh, I had advocated for uh, side guards on uh, trucks, which protect people from being pulled under the tires if there is a collision and thereby saving lives. Uh, we passed legislation on point. There's funding on point. Uh, that was not mentioned in the testimony, but where are we on installing side guard rails? I'm not sure if you heard, they want to drive 300 garbage trucks through my district every day, and I'd like to make sure that when they hit people in the district, because I don't think you can drive garbage trucks through a residential district like mine, the densest in the country without hitting folks, that there will be side guard rails. I live in your district, Councilman. Um, so it's, we have 710 um, trucks now that have retrofit side guards. Um, and also we have 650, and I think this is the very positive momentum, 650 vehicles, including mostly the sanitation trucks, the new order of sanitation trucks, all of which will come with side guards um, designed up front as OEM equipment. So by the end of this year, we'll have at least 1,500 um, trucks with side guards. Um, we're on pace to fulfill the commitment in the law, and I think, which is 2024, I think we'll fulfill it early. What needs to happen in order to make sure that every garbage truck driving through uh, my council district or Antonio Reynos' council district but any, or any council district where there are a high number of children and possible collisions will have a side guard rail before the trucks drive through that neighborhood? Well, we're doing that now. I mean, there are two different ways we can get side, tr side guards on trucks. Um, and New York City does operate the largest side guard program right now in the, in the country. One is through retrofitting, which we're doing and you mentioned and we're funded for. Um, and the other, which we've done a lot of work on the last year, is through new trucks. So you can't retrofit. As a practical matter, not every truck we have in the city fleet can be retrofitted. Uh, a lot of them were just not designed for this type of technology. So in those cases, we, we do wait to get the replacements in place. Um, but we have 30 different orders with replacement um, of what, what's called OEM side guards. So I think we're, we're making a lot of progress. With regards to Vision Zero, uh, the number of collisions for city vehicles citywide in the PMMR for fiscal year 16 is up. It's actually trending and we're up to 6,344. And in the four month actual for fiscal year 17, uh, we are up by 119. So we are, we are seeing more vehicles getting in collisions that are citywide. And at the same time, we see the number of trained city employees, trained in defensive driving citywide, uh, taking a, a nosedive from 15,266 in fiscal year 15 to 7,929 fiscal year 16, and uh, the four-month actuals are actually lower than they were in 16. Okay, so I'll take both of those. First on the training side, so our commitment is to train all authorized drivers every three years, which is the term of the state defensive driving program. In fact, we're doing that. The issue, and if you look in the MMR, is that it just isn't being done in a straight line way. Um, two years ago, we did a massive training in one year of sanitation workers. So in fiscal year 15, there were 15,000 people trained. That's because we basically did the whole sanitation um, worker group in one spring and summer. Um, we are going to do that again, by the way, this spring. So this year, you'll see another huge um, spike up in training, but in truth, in the third year, it spikes down, not because we're not training, just because we're doing the sanitation workers in kind of one jump. So, so we are fulfilling our commitment, and this year, you'll see a, a big spike up. On the collision side, um, so if you look at the fatalities and injuries, the major collisions that are the focus of Vision Zero, and the primary drivers of claims, those are going substantially down. And we think that that is a positive result of the efforts that we're making. You're absolutely right, the total collision number is up, but we do not believe it reflects a 
substantive safety issue. We think it reflects the fact that one of our Vision Zero projects was to implement a crash citywide tracking system for all collisions for the first time, and the thing that never used to get tracked were minor body collisions. So by state law, as you know, if you're in an injury or fatality or major collision, you must report it by state law. So we know that we get those reports. What we never used to get, which we want as part of this new reporting, are these minor body collisions. So when you see that total number up, it really reflects that we are asking all city agencies to report every time a vehicle hits anything, even if it's a mirror hit, a minor dent. And so we think that's better for purposes of transparency. We don't want employees to choose when they report a collision, but the increase in collisions you're seeing is really better tracking, and the injuries and fatalities which are subject to state law are going down, and, and that's what we're trying to make sure happens. Would, based on your response, would you add an indicator that tracks the, the percent of city employees who operate vehicles on behalf of the city that have been trained within the last five years? Uh, so that I, I think that's what you're going for, uh, and we can update that measure. My last question on uh, fleet is uh, you've identified additional revenue of $1.6 in fiscal 17 from vehicle auctions as part of the city-wide savings program. Uh, how much did we pay for those vehicles? What types of vehicles were sold? And are these all end of life? Yeah, so the way we do um, vehicle replacement, and the city has been making a real you know, substantial investment in new equipment for city employees. Um, we invested in fiscal year 16, $320 million that was committed through DCAS procurement and fleet. It's the largest buying plan for new equipment for city employees that we've ever done. Um, on the other side of that, of course, is replacing the older equipment. Um, the basic standard for city equipment is nine to 10 years. Um, and 90 to 100,000 miles. Um, but there's a process. Every single unit that we look to auction, we review, we go through the agencies, we look at the condition, the age, the mileage. Um, and there's a, there is variability. You know, police cars are replaced on a very aggressive schedule. There are a lot of dump trucks and work trucks where they can last 12 to 15 years um, with no impact. So, so you know, we have a process by which we review everything that's auctioned with agencies. Is, is there currently an open data tracking, or is there a way for us to track which sorts of vehicles are being sold, how long they've been in service, whether they're uh, clean or salvage or rebuilt or... Uh, what exactly is happening? I just would hate for us to be buying. Are, are we buying any cars that haven't been used and are then sold because we didn't actually need them? Has that happened even once? Well, it's, it's a big fleet. So we are constantly assessing with agencies and pushing back mm -hmm. often um, where, agent, where we think an agency could get more additional useful life from vehicles. So that's, that's a regular part of what my office does. I will... And we also have a, a great point that the commissioner meant. We also have a program where we do interagency transfers and we track and report that within agencies. So, for example, if the sanitation department is going to auction a container truck that has been used for, say, eight years, but the parks department or the correction department could use that in a less rigorous capacity for another few years, not maybe as a daily unit, but as a support unit, we, we coordinate those, and we have done over three to 400 transfers. Um, on the online issue, one thing, all of our auctions are done online um, through a contract with a company called PropertyRoom.com, but all of our auctions are fully done online to the general public, so every single vehicle and its condition and history is auctioned online and available to everyone to look at. Thank you. That concludes my questions for Fleet. I'd like to... Uh wrap up with energy, but not before asking a quick question for asset management. Uh, this one comes from Samar at Gotham Gazette. Uh, does uh, DCAS have the status of the 1,100 vacant lots identified by the Comptroller last year, and how many of them are currently being uh, cited or used or developed for affordable housing? Yes, uh, we do have those that information for all of the vacant lots that we have. As uh, I may have mentioned before, the vast majority of those are uh, what we what we determine are limited markets, like sliver lots, interior lots, access ways, 
uh, open, uh, common open spaces, et cetera. And for the ones that uh, are developable, as I mentioned before, we have those identified. And uh, though they might, to the public, uh, seem that they're vacant and unused, many of them have holds by other city agencies for future projects. Uh, and before we jump into uh, energy, uh, for the past couple of years, DCAS has always reported on uh, office citywide procurement and uh, contracts awarded to MWBE <laughs> firms. Uh, however, that's not tracked in the uh, PMR. Uh, so I guess the question is, uh, for me, MWBEs and, and making sure that they have a, a proportionate share of contract revenue and that we meet our goals is a uh, important value. Is it important enough to DCAS to include in the MMR and PMMR? Given my background, it is I share that uh, the, the 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 regard for the program. It's it's very important to me personally. Um, MWBE is a citywide program uh, that the mayor's office and the Department of Small Business Services routinely uh, report on. There are quarterly reports uh, and yearly reports on the status of how the how the city is doing overall, with indicators. Uh, um, uh, related to to agencies, so if there is a discussion on including them in the PMMR and the MMR, uh, we should have those discussions with the Mayor's Office of Operations, MOX, and SBS. I'm happy to say that our uh, uh, our our performance in the MWBE world this fiscal year is is trending upwards. We have currently to date ha exceeded what we did all of last year, uh, and we look forward for that number to keep going up. You oversee a, a very large agency. We have folks here from human capital, civil service, citywide fleet, energy management, asset management, real estate asset management, facilities, information technology, citywide procurement, citywide diversity, and the EEO. And when folks, and the mayor has recently given a directive for folks not to listen to the media, but to go to the budget. But if you go to the online budget, which I was proud to work with the city to make happen, I get two budget lines for DCAS. I get personal service, which is your employees, and other than personal service, which is everything else. Uh, will you agree to break out your unit of, units of appropriation by division, by program area, by key initiatives in the PMMR appendix, which is required under the charter? And if Mayor's Office of Operations does not agree to provide such a report without me having to draft such a law. I, we're happy to, and I'm open to, you know, providing information in, in any way that's helpful. Um, you know, the, the PMMR and the, M, and the MMR uh, is, it, are conversations that we'd have to have with uh, our, the mayor's office to determine what can be changed. Just, uh, just as a follow-up to the commissioner's statement, in the executive budget, the, the agencies, all agencies, have a lot more detail in the supporting documents. That is, there is a breakdown of the PS and OTPS budget by unit of appropriations, which are the LOSs that you were mentioning, at least the large LOSs. And then it's further break, broken down from unit appropriation into um, budget code levels to reflect the different types of programs within that line of service slash unit of appropriation. And that's published in, by OMB in their financial reports in the executive budget. Thank you. Uh, and I guess what I'm referring to is the appendix that is attached to the PMMR, which is a management document that's supposed to be available for the council and the general public for those who may not be digging into the budget. Uh, now on to energy. So I want to thank you. I, I know that in previous years uh, we've asked that uh, you list the cumulative estimated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and we see that that's now a uh, indicator. Uh, and so we're able to now track the estimated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from all energy projects as they go online, and then we're also able to track that cumulative impact. Uh, and you've also added tracking of cumulative uh, estimated uh, energy costs for energy projects. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Denise Miller, who I'm sure will have some questions. So I will uh, actually, so just on the energy issue, uh, are you willing to engage in performance budgeting that would tie the capital expenditure for energy retrofits to the resulting uh, 
greenhouse gas reductions as well as cost savings and include that in the MMR as is required by the charter or provide it as an addendum uh, to the council without me having to draft the law on point. I, I think we're open to having that discussion on how best to provide that information to the council. Okay. Sure. With regards to uh, energy savings, the, the preliminary plan includes energy savings for over one million for each of the next two years. Can you provide details on how the savings will be achieved and uh, generally about the alternative energy sources generating the most cost savings? Okay. That was a little fast, so I didn't catch the last part of your question, but in-, in Alternative energy. Okay. So we have a number of programs um, that we fund for agency energy efficiency initiatives. Uh, we have a capital program, the ACE program. Uh, we have expense funded programs. And then we work with specific capital um, construction agencies, including DDC and SCA, on, on funding energy efficiency projects, as well as uh, alternative energy distributed generation, primarily solar. Um, and so through all those programs, that's how we're looking to achieve those savings. So Con Ed sends me a bill once a month. I'm, I and my wife are the decision makers in our households, and we can see a comparison of energy use from our same period of time and the previous year. And in so doing, we're able to try to save energy. Uh, how, how do folks in decision-making positions get that? Does, uh, Lisa, do you get a, a Con Ed style bill that shows you the use of DCAS so that you can make your energy, uh, make your agency, just your agency itself, save money and energy? DCAS actually measures uh, and communicates to every agency their energy usage and budget um, to, to all of the agencies for which we pay the heat, light, and power budget for. I'm going to turn. Yeah, and so DCAS plays an oversight role for, for the other agencies that, that we pay the energy bills for. We fund um, uh, personnel to sit in those agencies whose job is to focus on energy, uh, energy costs, energy efficiency, um, alternative energy. We provide data analytics and reports based on billings to, the, to those agencies so that they have the tools to um, make those decisions. We have deviation reports that go out on a monthly basis so that it looks at a, a building specific energy usage and if it's um, above or below its uh, last year's uh, same time period usage, um, the agencies have to investigate and report back to us on what that might be, uh, the reason for it, um, so that we there's a constant um, control um, and awareness uh, that's provided, provided to the agencies. Would you be comfortable sharing that information with the city council and if the city council also the general public? I think that might be valuable for folks to be able to see it. I'd love to see one of those reports and the, the whole process. Happy to have further discussions with you on how best to do that, yes. I, I, I was hoping for, for, for a just simple yes there, if it's. I'd like, I'd like to show you the reports first and then work with you to determine what might be best. Okay, I appreciate it because I, I think that's helpful. And so I guess the, the question that's not quite clear to me is so you've got an employee there, but I, I know as the, the boss of my little office with, with seven uh, employees, as it were, that uh, unless the, the, the head that comes from the top is saying, no, no, we're turning off all of our computers every night and that's going to save us $200 a year, sorry, 200, yeah, 200 a year or so, it actually might be higher, uh, that we're uh, not going to end up doing it. So who, who are you interfacing with at each agency? Is the person that you're placed, where, do they, where are they on the organizational charts for each agency? And 
is this really a person who can walk up to a commissioner and say you need to turn off your computer or I'm going to turn it off for you because you need to save energy? Yeah, so um, currently personnel that are um, in each of the agencies are in, in different uh, places within the organization. Um, we are working on a more fo formal process um, uh, and standardize how those personnel um, are put into the agencies and at, at what level. We're also working with the commissioner and the first deputy mayor's office uh, on additional mechanisms to make sure that um, the head of each agency is aware of their energy usage and the associated greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we are working from both a bottom-up and top-down approach uh, and, and believe it's important to, to do both um, because if you only work from the top down, uh, you're not working with the people that are closest to the, to the problem and who best know how to solve that problem. And I think as you point out, if you're only working from the bottom up, then um, you don't have the heads of the agencies uh, having full transparency in, into their energy usage and, and emissions. I'd like to go to Council Member uh, Miller for uh, five minutes of questions, unless you have something you wanted to add. Okay. Council Member Miller. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. It's still morning. morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, obviously, um, my questions are from my civil service and labor hat, so um, I suspect Ms. Pienaar will be this in a cell. So have, have we seen an increase in the city's workforce over the past year? Yes, we have. Um, currently, the city's workforce, when we include the Department of Ed, it stands at 325,000. An increase of over last year? Over the last year, it's approximately, um, I believe, about a 10,000, 10 to 12,000 um, increase. And what agencies specifically uh, did, did we see the largest increase? Um, it, it's primarily across the board, and it, I've seen that it's been tied more to special initiatives. Um, agencies have received um, additional funding for special officers. As you know, that there's a need um, across the board in our homeless shelters. Um, I know class sizes for our uniformed agencies have also increased. So we've seen really a, an increase across the board. Are, are these in permanent civil service positions? Yes, these are all civil service positions. These are all competitive exams as well. Oh, great. So, so we... So that means we haven't seen an increase in the provisional positions. Um, we've certainly seen an increase in provisionals, but provisional numbers have increased in titles for which we've not been able to administer exams. Is there, is there I, I don't want to get away from my first point, but are there uh, plans for those exams to be um, given in the next? Are there plans for, for those titles to have exams in the near future? Yes, there are plans for that. So far, we've released um, our fiscal year 17 schedule. We are finalizing um, our fiscal year 18 schedule. But for those titles that we are unable to accommodate in the two schedules, given our addition of the qualified incumbent exam, um, we will be pushing some out to fiscal year 19 as well. Are, are these new titles or are these titles that we previously discussed here at the council? Um, the titles that we previously referred to in your first question, these are not new titles to the city's structure. These are all existing um, civil service titles. Are these some of the titles that we've discussed? Uh, are these promotional exams for um, the most part? Um, the original titles that I referenced, no, they're not. Those are entry-level um, titles. Um, so for police officer, correction officer, these are entry-level titles. Th and those wouldn't be provisional exams? Though. Those would not be provisional exams, provisional but those jobs, are still exams yeah. that we're administering. So with the provisional exam, I'm sorry, the provisional uh, positions that occurred over the past year, what are they? What, what agencies dominate those? Oh, you said they're new? These would be new entrants into the city, and so oh, okay. they and would serve. Oh, okay, into the city, not new titles. Right, these are not new titles. 
Mm -mm. We've, and, and I think that we've um, discussed this in previous hearings. Mm -hmm. um, definitely at DCAS, we have pretty much um, stopped the process of creating new titles because, as you know, we have over 800 to manage. Right. Um, we have had um, some requests, of course, but we've tried as best as we could to direct um, agencies to titles that are in use. Um, so in terms of So let, let me jump off of that for a minute because I, I, I do have limited time here. Um, we've had conversation here around that this is Women's History Month and we've had a lot of conversation about pay equity, particularly in the managerial areas. And I know that you've often stated that that was outside the purview of DCAS. You just kind of set this range and it's up to each agency to kind of figure out where they fit within that range. Has there been additional conversation and we intend to hold a hearing in the near future around pay equity? Um, our target date is April 4th, National Pay Equity, and we hope that um, we could address that further. And so if, you want, if you have anything that you want to add. Uh, there's an executive order that uh, the mayor signed that um, directed DCAS to develop training for city agencies on the topic of pay equity. Uh, and we are you know, developing that training and toolbox to, or toolkit to provide agencies with information on how to address pay equities within their agencies. Okay, and when are we going to see that? So there are a few things. So when the EO was first issued, um, and this is certainly a partnership between Human Capital and um, our partners in Citywide Diversity and EEO, mm -hmm. when the EO was issued, we were asked first to canvas every agency and have them remove any information relating to salary. So that's already been done. Um, in addition to that, we asked them to remove um, any information regarding um, set percentages that somebody could potentially receive through an insider promotion. That was done. Um, we we actually were scheduled to have a symposium tomorrow to talk about the matter of pay equity, but given um, the weather, that will um, certainly be rescheduled. But on a parallel track, our team has been working to um, develop training. We're looking to launch that training end of April, and it will focus specifically on job valuation, um, salary setting, and looking at your budgetary structure, because as you know, every title has a salary range. We want to ensure that our HR professionals and our EEO professionals are well aware of how to use that range appropriately given their budget and given where um, positions um, report in an agency. Do, 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 does, have you evaluated the data uh, around pay equity and, 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 and light titles? And uh, what kind of reporting have, have you done? Um, in, in that area? Well, some of this reporting has really um, been to support agencies in making the best decisions around setting salaries. So in some cases, agencies have come to us and have asked um, for salary information, specifically um, current rate of pay for individuals serving in the same title. In some cases, agencies have believed that they are losing um, some of their um, employees to other agencies, okay. and so the analysis that we provided them um, helps them to look at their salary structure and Are you, are you also working with the bargaining units to, to discuss if, in fact, because I understand that this is uh, a lot sometimes mid-level management and they may not be represented, but if in, in those cases that they are, are you um, collaborating with those bargaining units around Conversations uh, regarding collective bargaining agreements with the bargaining units that goes through around, uh, around pay equity. Right. Regarding pay equity, that would still involve our partners at OLR. Okay. Um, so this will be forthcoming, and, and so we'll reach out, and hopefully we can have a fruitful um, hearing around that. Um, upcoming exams. Um, I know we have fire department exam coming up. Um, that is big for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of assistance do you give the agencies, uh, if any, um, around um, promotional of, of exams, research, and um, if you could speak to the, the uh, demographics of those 10,000 in terms of gender, race, um, geography? 
Um, certainly, we could provide you the demographics information um, as a follow-up to this meeting, but in terms of the support that we offer agencies, um, our Office of Citywide Recruitment, as you know, um, they've really traveled throughout the city offering not only Civil Service 101 sessions, but specific information sessions um, relating to hard-to-recruit titles. Um, in terms of our partnership with um, the fire department, they have their own recruitment team. We have certainly offered our assistance in um, publicizing and marketing their positions broadly and we've responded to any inquiries or challenges that they've had with respect to recruitment. Is there any oversight that you have of, over any of these agencies, not just the fire department, but in, in terms of... Uh, well, we have oversight, as you know, as it relates to civil service, but in terms of um, the recruitment plan that they develop, certainly they've called on us to review that information, but we don't necessarily serve as an oversight with respect to how that's structured. So outside of that, have, have, have there been any... Uh, have you reviewed um, exams, uh, recruitment, um, some things that may be, may or may not be misconstrued as prejudice, not just that particular exam. Certainly there's oversight on that, but where there's been lawsuits and, and what kind of input has DCAS had in helping to facilitate that? Um, any matters relating to litigation, our um, Office of the General Counsel is directly involved in that. But as you know, you know, part of our charge, one of our primary um, charges, is to create that, um, valid exams. And we also look at issues of adverse impact, and we address that accordingly. So we are like very heritage much involved and in things process. of that nature. There, that right. then, like heritage, you know, points that that, that may continue to exist. Um, that give unfair uh, advantages to, to one recruit over the other in any department. And finally, the online portal, I understand that there's an RFP. Is that the case? Where are we with that? Well, as part of our um, automation projects, there are two things. Um, Towards the end of 2016, we did um, post all of our list information, which um, speaks to any active civil service lists and our civil service list certifications. That's all on the open data portal. So that is readily available um, to any current and prospective city employee today. Um, also, we are in phase two of an automation project. Um, it kicked off September 2016. It ends in um, summer of this year, and specifically, it helps to um, provide the applicant with their application history, their exam history, the status of their exam, and their status on a list. So um, that certainly aligns with um, the. And, and that is, and and we expect that to see that when. Summer of 2017. Okay, We're actively good. working with our IT group now to offer that functionality to our clients. Thank you so much, and Thank we'll you. follow up with further questions. I just had one more follow-up. Thank you very much for helping us secure the site for the next citywide job fair. Oh, um, my we're pleasure. very excited about that. Very important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Civil Service and Labor Chair Miller. It is a pleasure to work with you on this issue, and uh, we will eventually make some headway together. Uh, two, two last questions. We'll be asking all the agencies that come before us what their uh, uh, about the fact that the mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? If so, can we get a preview? Um, yes, uh, we, are, we have already submitted to OMB for their review savings programs as it relates to um, incorporation for the, uh, into the executive budget. Obviously, they're under review by OMB um, at this point. Uh, you know, we prefer not to share what was what we've submitted until OMB vets it and, and approves those items that we've submitted. I also, th so the last question is I just want to uh, thank you, Commissioner Camillo, for being so transparent and sharing the list of uh, submissions that are not necessarily complete where the process hasn't started. Uh, right off the bat, the first one on the list, 900 Intervale Avenue in uh, Longwood, uh, seems awfully familiar. It's a nursing and rehabilitation center at St. Vincent de Paul, and it has two deed restrictions, a not-for-profit use and a skilled nursing uh, use, and both are being sought to be uh, lifted. Feels a lot like another Rivington. How many more Rivingtons do we have coming? How many more nursing homes are folks going to try to convert into luxury development? That is the full roster of the pending applications, and once we determine 
that those packages are complete, you will be receiving all of the backup information to be able to, to review. Is it possible to reject these uh, initially because we just did mandatory inclusionary housing zoning for quality and affordability to increase the number of nursing homes we have in the city? And I would posit we don't want to lose any nursing coverage. Otherwise, what was the point of passing MIHCQA? So we will uh, follow the process laid forth by the legislation, which requires that we evaluate the, every request. Um, uh, it lays out all of the standards that we have to measure against. And if in the end there's a recommendation not to move forward, that will be the recommendation. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, will follow up with additional questions as they may come up, and we hope to have those answers before the executive budget hearing. We'd like to thank you for your testimony and that of everyone from DCAST. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're hereby excused. Uh, we are now going to uh, call up immediately the uh, law department who are here for their 11 a.m. Uh, we're also joined by Board of Elections who are on time for their noon appointment. Uh, let the public be on notice that we are officially running at least one hour behind. Uh, I, I would suggest to Board of Elections that you please come back at 1230 uh, and as well as the other administrative agencies that are further on the clock, please make sure that folks are uh, instructed to come at least an hour and a half late. I'd like to now welcome Corporation Counsel Zachary Carter, head of the Law Department. The New York City Law Department is responsible for all of the legal affairs of the city. It represents the city, the mayor, other elected officials, and the city's main many agencies in all affirmative and defensive civil litigation, as well as juvenile delinquency prosecutions brought in family court and administrative code enforcement proceedings brought in the criminal court. The Law Department's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 totals $206 million, including $149 million, to support 1,697 budgeted positions. During today's hearing, the committee will discuss many aspects of the Department's budget, its operational performance, and how the Law Department is handling various judgments and claims against the city. Specifically, we would like also to discuss the Department's initiative to reduce reliance on contracting, the Department's PMMR metrics, and budget savings in the preliminary plan. We'd also like to examine whether investigation, investments the city has made in the department in recent years have led to improved operational efficiency and, in turn, budget savings. Council members will have five minutes to ask questions and receive answers on first round and three minutes on second round. We're asking the administration to limit their testimony to no more than 15 minutes, though longer written testimony may be submitted for the record. Members of the public should fill out an appearance card and return after 4 p.m. I will now direct our committee council to uh, swear in our corporation council. Please raise, your, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. I'd like to note we've been joined by council member Mark Levine, and uh, you are now free to begin your testimony. Committee. Uh, it is a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss uh, the Law Department's fiscal year 2018 preliminary uh, budget. Uh, as Corporation Counsel, I have the privilege uh, to lead an office of approximately 852 attorneys and 705 uh, professional support staff who represent the city and its constituent agencies and employees in a dizzying array of legal matters, ranging from the defense of thousands of lawsuits pending against the city to the handling of complex business and real estate transactions, to acting as presentment agency in juvenile delinquency proceedings in family court. These matters have enormous liability, policy, and operational implications for the city and its constituent agencies. In all of these endeavors, I have never failed to be impressed by the professionalism, hard work, depth of knowledge, expertise, and dedication of our lawyers and the extraordinary staff that supports them. Uh, I now offer a few highlights of the work of the Law Department over the past fiscal year. Uh, with respect to the tort division, uh, the sheer volume of litigation matters pending against the city presents a substantial challenge. Our tort division alone defends nearly 22,000 cases currently pending against the city, its agencies, and employees. Approximately 7,500 new tort cases are filed against the city each year. 
Approximately 6,000 cases are resolved each year by trial, motion practice, and settlement. Until recently, the sheer volume of cases handled by the tort division has required the assignment of litigation tasks, such as depositions, document production, and motions uh, to our attorneys, rather than the assignment of individual cases for handling from inception to final resolution. That is not ideal. The assignment of each new case to an individual attorney, or at least to a unified team of attorneys, for handling from beginning to end permits critical decisions concerning discovery to be made earlier and allows for better development of case theories and strategies leading to more successful outcomes, whether by trial, motion practice, or settlement. With the Council's assistance by way of increased resources, this fiscal year, the Law Department has begun to shift toward a vertical assignment system for certain cases that are handled in the Brooklyn and Bronx uh, offices of our tort division. The Law Department created a unit within the tort division uh, to handle cases in defense of claims against law enforcement agencies in this manner. We believe that uh, this change in approach has contributed to a marked decrease in new filings in that category over uh, the past two years, at least 20 percent decrease year over year. With respect to our, spe our special federal litigation uh, uh, division, uh, our special litigation division, which already assigns cases vertically, is something of a model for uh, our vision of a vertical case assignment system. Uh, because of increases in staffing beginning in 2012 and continuing through the present, caseloads, while demanding, are sufficiently manageable to permit more proactive case development, resulting in more cases being taken to trial. Over time, the number of new federal case filings has decreased. The number of trials has tripled, and our win rate in these cases uh, now approaches 90%. Our Family Court Division balances the dual goals of serving the needs and best interests of uh, children uh, brought before the court and ensuring community safety. Last year, the Division's Juvenile Delinquency Prosecution Unit handled approximately 3,600 new juvenile delinquency referrals and 4,300 new interstate child support petitions. Preparation of cases and enhancement of services are essential to the Division's mission. Last year, the Law Department received additional staffing for a new witness location and engagement unit and a new juvenile rehabilitation and community uh, safety uh, unit. With respect to affirmative litigation, as a result of an aggressive law department program uh, developed over the last 18 years uh, to ensure insurance coverage under policies issued to defend and indemnify the city against lawsuits arising out of work performed by private contractors and, uh, and those who hold city permits, this year we surpassed the $1 billion mark in the savings to taxpayers. That is an average annual savings of nearly $56 million. Before this program was instituted, steps were not taken routinely to demand and ensure coverage under insurance policies. So that includes my preliminary remarks, and I stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you for uh, leading our Corporation Council on protecting our city. At the last budget hearing, I asked uh, your staff how much the mayor's defense would cost. Uh, their testimony indicated that it could be covered within the law department's existing budget, but that didn't happen. Uh, can you please explain the $11 million that has been spent and how much staff time is being devoted to uh, defending the city and the mayor uh, in ongoing investigations. Certainly. Uh, the ongoing investigations are um, criminal in nature, and I know from my 40 years of experience in law enforcement that that is a specialized area of practice uh, that requires experience uh, because of the delicacy of the judgments to be made. Uh, great care uh, because of issues of privilege and conflict, uh, and also requires, as a practical matter, attorneys who have established credibility with those people uh, or persons or institutions who are conducting investigations. Uh, that is not, of, of all the extraordinary expertise that we have in the law department, that is not an area of specialized practice for the law department, which 
uh, in terms of litigation practice uh, specializes in uh, civil defense and affirmative uh, prosecution of civil matters. And so consequently, it was uh, uh, essential uh, in order to protect the best interests of the city uh, to retain outside counsel. Uh, because uh, in criminal practice, and particularly during the course of investigations, and particularly where there are multiple subject areas of investigations, uh, because that is an area of practice that's particularly sensitive to conflicts of interest, uh, those who have uh, the city under investigation have often insisted in, in, the, in individual circumstances uh, that uh, separate counsel be engaged uh, by uh, witnesses who are to be uh, were to be interviewed in the course of that um, investigation. And so that's, that accounts for the reason why there are a multiplicity of, of law firms that had to be uh, retained. In addition, uh, an investigation of this type uh, requires production of literally uh, uh, documents that are in the magnitude of a million or more uh, that have to be painstakingly searched for uh, using initially search terms to winnow down the number of documents that may be responsive to a particular investigative request, uh, but uh, thereafter there's no substitute for uh, individual attorneys actually reading individual documents to make sure uh, that the search that was narrowed by a computer uh, has actually captured all the relevant uh, documents uh, so that uh, we can promptly uh, respond to those requests. Uh, again, since I, I have specialized in this area, uh, both in uh, prosecuting uh, cases in, uh, in the white collar area and also in defending those cases, I can tell you that that is a labor intensive and expensive enterprise under the best of, of, of circumstances. And so that in sum um, is uh, the reason why uh, we had to retain a number of law firms uh, to represent the city as a whole, its constituent agencies, and, uh, and employees who were called upon uh, to provide information to the authorities uh, as witnesses in the course of the investigation. How much is budgeted for outside counsel for fiscal year 17 and how much has been spent? How much for fiscal year 18? I believe we're up to 10.5, uh, 10.5 million dollars. For fiscal year 17, so that will that run us through June 30th and then how much are we planning to spend on July 1st? Uh, we, can, we can only uh, estimate um, that there, it may uh, be, uh, there will be additional expenditures. Uh, I don't believe that it, it will be a large magnitude of expenditures because we, uh, based on my understanding, uh, are seeing a winding down uh, and concluding of the investigation. So we believe that uh, there will be a few million dollars more uh, expended, uh, but uh, I can't give you an exact, uh, an exact figure. Uh, does the termination of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District have an impact on your estimate? I don't, in, but based on my experience, I don't believe uh, that will be the case. Uh, the um, chief assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District was fully engaged uh, in the supervision of these investigations, so I doubt that, uh, uh, that we'll lose any time in terms of a final evaluation of the case and decision making. And, and so as the budget works for folks who may be watching at home, we, we have to set aside a specific number, and that comes from our revenue budget, so if you're making let's just say instead of billions of thousands, so we make $82,000 a year, we need to set aside, in this case we've already set aside about $11 for uh, the legal defense, so, and that's coming from the school fund, from the food fund, from different resources. How much do we need to set aside out of our 82 or 82, sorry, $84 billion budget? How many million do we need to set aside? How much have we budgeted for FY18? Okay, we have not uh, um, f uh, developed a final budget for 18 because we uh, wanted to, to see, to, ha to have a final assessment of how much additional work needs to be done. My information is that the amount of wrap-up work to be done is extremely uh, limited. And based on the, on the pace of the bills uh, we've received, I, I, again, uh, it, there may be uh, an additional 
uh, seven-figure expenditure, but I do not believe that it will be significant. Uh, we, we will hold you to that. How many law firms have we retained in this matter? I can tell you. Well, 11. And how many city officials and employees are we currently defending in these investigations? Well, I can't give you a uh, figure on the number of employees who have uh, either been interviewed or uh, who uh, we have informed might um, have information of interest to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office who ultimately were not interviewed. Uh, but there were um, dozens of, uh, of persons who um, um, were uh, um, potential witnesses uh, for, uh, for whom uh, legal counsel were required. Hey, would you share that number more specifically with the committee after this hearing? Yes. Uh, in terms of document production, is that being done by uh, corporate counsel or is that being done by outside counsel? It's being supervised by corporation counsel, um, but the, the actual production, well, and we're coordinating with outside counsel. Uh, outside counsel is taking the laboring or in um, gathering the documents uh, that's being facilitated since we are the, uh, the agency that actually represents, we are, uh, uh, in effect, the uh, uh, um, general counsel for the city, uh, and, the, and uh, we have the uh, lines of communications with our client agencies that permit us to be a conduit for uh, documents being produced f to the outside counsel for review. Uh, and they, in addition, uh, there for the, on the technology side, we've uh, retained uh, a vendor uh, to. Uh, uh, manage the technology necessary to gather the documents, do uh, word searches and the like. How many attorneys from the law department's internal staff have been allocated to the document production and what cost? Document production and also just your internal oversight of the outside counsel. In terms of the, uh, the document production uh, over time, uh, there may have been uh, a dozen attorneys who have from time to time uh, been, a, uh, been uh, spent some time away from their normal responsibilities uh, depending on the subject matter area of the, uh, of the documents. In private firms, when I worked as a full-time attorney, I kept track of my time in six-minute increments. Uh, do your employees track the time that they spend on different matters? No. Okay. Uh, I, I would, I would be, if, if there was any tracking whatsoever, I'd be interested to, to, to learn that. Uh, with regard to the dozens of employees who have availed themselves of outside counsel, and that, and that, and that is a, and that is an estimate. Okay, right. uh, but with regards to, to them, uh, how does one get the law department to provide for outside attorneys in a criminal defense? Is this available to all 325,000 city employees? No, first of all, I mean, obviously it's a very, it's a much narrower uh, group of persons who uh, are considered by uh, the, uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney to have relevant information in, connect, in connection with the matters they have under investigation. And so the number and the identity of uh, the employees uh, is driven entirely by the interest of the U.S. Attorney in particular uh, uh, transactions. So if the U.S. Attorney expresses interest in a specific city employee, that person is automatically entitled and will receive outside counsel, paid for by tax dollars. That is, if under, if under circumstances where, um, where counsel is required at all, uh, that person is entitled to be represented by the city. And, cons and consequently, under these circumstances, uh, more often than not, they were provided uh, outside counsel. That as, is correct. As, as my corporate counsel, would you advise me or any of my employees or any of your employees to sit for a deposition with the U.S. Attorney or Federal Bureau of Investigations with that appropriate representation? Of course not. Okay. So just want but, to. Yeah. But there are, there are situations in which um, we may get correspondence or, a, or communication from the U.S. Attorney 
uh, about a particular employee in which the employee uh, may be a matter of preliminary interest to the U.S. Attorney's Office, but never, it never reaches a point where that person is actually going to be called in for an interview. So, Those so, are the circumstances so, in which so an, an attorney may not need to be assigned. Okay, so what distinguishes it is whether or not they're actually being interviewed or having a intera- direct right. interaction. And along the same lines, are whistleblowers being offered the same protections? So if an, a city employee has information that is relevant or they believe it, uh, who can they go to for whistleblower protection? Well, if you're talking about whistleblowers, that's not something that I would be, um, in, uh, under most circumstances, in a position to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give you an account of uh, if, by, by the very nature of being a whistleblower, that's someone who would have communicated with authorities without consulting with the law department. Uh, I'm, I'm going to follow that line of questions in, in a moment, but so at this point, the, uh, it's been reported and the mayor has stated at public press conferences that he's beginning exploring a legal defense fund. Uh, wh- why does the mayor need to have a legal defense fund if the city is willing to pay for uh, his defense and has already paid for his defense? Well, first of all, uh, there's a difference between the defense of the mayor in his personal capacity and the defense of um, employees uh, of city government uh, who may uh, need counsel in order to facilitate their cooperation uh, with, uh, with the uh, 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 U.S. Attorney's investigation. Uh, that, and particularly with respect to any inquiries that relate to political activities, separate and apart from, uh, uh, such as fundraising and the like, uh, separate and apart from anyone's functioning, including the mayor, as an official of the city, that will require separate counsel not paid for uh, by the city. Okay, so, so just to distinguish the, the allegation, so, so we've got the two allegations. One is that uh, there were uh, public actions taken, so those public actions are protected by law department and tax dollars, and then the fundraising activity would be protected by the, the, a separate council. That, right, that would be council that, that would have to be separately retained by, uh, by uh, any of the persons in, who were engaged in activities not part of their official duties. Now for this legal defense fund, should there be further investigations into the legal defense fund, would that be uh, something that the law department and outside council would defend or the legal defense fund, if there was allegations or questions that arise around that, would that also be uh, the mayor in his individual capacity as a person versus in his role? That would be the mayor in his individual capacity. And I I guess one question, uh, and I'm not sure if you heard from the previous hearing with regard to uh, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, uh, following the mayor's interview with uh, the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation several hours later, uh, a Deputy Commissioner of DCAS, Ricardo Morales, was uh, terminated and reported to have been escorted out of the building. Uh, were you consulted in that termination? Well, first of all, that would be a privileged communication, and so if I were consulted, I couldn't uh, uh, testify about that, as, as you know. Okay. Uh, I, I guess if, if a person, and I think it was reported that uh, a, a at least in the, uh, in the reporting that this individual might have had knowledge about what was happening. Is it a best practice to actually work with employees who have knowledge of uh, investigations versus termination? Or at what point do you terminate an employee who has knowledge that could help an investigation versus keeping them on and protecting them as whistleblowers? Okay. At this uh, public hearing, I am not going to okay. testify about uh, the uh, details or the particulars of any uh, ongoing uh, investigation. Ha- has the city received any notice of claim or uh, letter or other type of information of basically just in layman's language? Are, are we going to get sued over firing Ricardo Morales? I, have, I, I am not in a position to answer that question. I, I have no knowledge that uh, that, that would, uh, okay. uh, that would uh, occur. With regards to uh, units of appropriation, your budget has been divided only into only two units of appropriation, one for personal services, which is your employees, and OTPS, which is other than personal services, which is everything else. 
Uh, in the past, Council has recommended that your department structure its budget to more transparently represent its program areas. Are you willing to break up your units of appropriation for, uh, for us individually and just present it? Have that included as an appendix to the uh, PMMR and MMR, which is required by the Charter? Uh, and also work with the Office of Management budget to include it in the online budget that the mayor has now directed folks to go to instead of the media. I think that the uh, current units of appropriation for the law department are appropriate given the size of the operation and its uh, unique mandate. Uh, it is a, an office uh, of 852 attorneys and 16 separate legal operating divisions uh, that uh, has to uh, handle a, a myriad of uh, disparate legal matters. Um, and what matters require emphasis from uh, year to year um, changes dramatically, sometimes within a particular year. And in my view, and I think the view of uh, uh, my predecessors who have um, uh, handled this uh, position. Uh, it requires maximum flex flexibility in, uh, in terms of being able to uh, shift resources from one mission, uh, one of our uh, charter mandated uh, missions, uh, to another. And so I think the current um, uh, uh, units of, of uh, appropriation uh, provide us that maximum flexibility, and it would be my position that that, uh, that remain. With regards to judgment and claims, which is an issue we've talked about at length for the past couple of years, the preliminary budget includes $720 million for judgment and claims payments for fiscal year 2018, increasing to $740 million by fiscal year 2021. In fiscal 2016, payments for judgment and claims totaled $720 million. Uh, the other name for the law department, and so I just want to thank you for reducing the, the out year uh, budgeted spending. Uh, but so the other name for the law department is the Corporation Council and for the proper corporation and for a proper corporation council, the you'd all spend get advice on how to limit corporations liabilities. Mm -hmm. So and this is something we've touched on before. When somebody files a claim against the city, is there a specific person or persons who have a responsibility to go find out about the underlying conditions to fix the underlying conditions so we do not get sued for the same problem over and over again? Yes, uh, we have um, uh, in our office a risk management uh, unit uh, that does precisely uh, that, and that is that it evaluates um, claims to determine whether or not there are patterns uh, so that we can be a real-time feedback loop for our constituent agencies and advise them uh, when we're starting to see a recurring theme uh, in um, the kinds of cases that are brought um, in, uh, uh, against uh, employees or against the agency itself in connection with uh, certain of its operations. And so you have this risk management unit. How does that risk management unit communicate the recommended, recommended changes uh, so that the underlying condition can be fixed? They generally uh, uh, communicated directly uh, to the agencies. So somebody somebody hits a pothole, they break an axle, they sue the city. Uh, it's been. Do you know how many times those folks have had that reported before, and how how does that person do they who is their contact at DOT to get that pothole fixed so that the next person doesn't get to sue us for breaking an axle that day? You could state your name for the record and we'll administer the oath. Uh, I've asked uh, uh, Nancy Savasta, who is the chief of our uh, risk management unit, uh, who's in a position to answer that question. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Chair Kalos, can I ask you to repeat the question? just trying to get an understanding of when we get sued for something over and over again, 
how we avoid that. So we're not getting sued on the same claim. So it's the same pothole on the block that's just never been filled. Uh, when I was a small claims arbitrator, I got a lot of cases against the city that we didn't settle because a tree branch fell on somebody's car. And when the tree branch falls, that's going to be several thousand dollars in body work and detail work. So we communicate um, information from the law department back to the agencies in, in a variety of different ways. We have standard monthly scheduled meetings where we meet with the agencies and we discuss information from litigation, advice about uh, specific issues that have arisen in litigation or in claims that we think may lead to further litigation. We also look at individual matters and make recommendations. Um, potholes are relatively streamlined, though a good uh, a good uh, example of uh, communication. And we do speak regularly with the Department of Transportation about issues that have arisen, be they uh, problem areas that we see coming up more than once. Uh, the agencies also have a regular uh, working relationship with the Comptroller's Office, so they get information back from them at the claim stage, as does the Law Department. Um, so we confer with them on a regular basis. I speak to the various agencies almost daily, as does the risk management staff. Um, about issues that have arisen and ways to prevent the same uh, claim, defect, or problem from creating further liability or risk to the city in the future. And how, what is your feedback loop? How, how do you ensure that that pothole gets fixed, that tree gets trimmed, uh, that that new policy gets adopted uh, in order to make sure that we don't get sued again? We continue discussions with the agencies until we consider the issue resolved. So if it's a recommendation of something that has come up, we, we may ask an agency to, if it's a policy, we may ask them to examine the policy. They may examine the policy and ultimately determine that from an operational standpoint, the manner in which they're conducting business is appropriate, maybe the subject of a study. If it's a simple fix, this is broken and must be repaired. We ask them to repair it and to advise us when it has been repaired, and we follow up until they advise us that that has been done. I don't get individual reports back on every pothole, but I can assure you there's way too many in the Northeast, but we do follow up on conditions and ask that they report back uh, to advise us when they are addressed. Do you generate reports that could be shared with the public or this committee or both just so that we can get a sense of how this works and the, which agencies you're working with and the types of problems that you're catching? We do not generally generate reports of that nature. We do provide advice back to them in connection with the ongoing litigation, so many of the communications that we share with the agencies are privileged. On, uh, going back to my days in, in law school, though I never did criminal, mm -hmm. uh, as far and, and I didn't do that kind of uh, civil litigation, but as far as I can remember, uh, things that fix underlying conditions are exempt under the rules of evidence, so I assume there's no risk to uh, our liability. That's correct. Okay, uh, and so we've got this $720 million planned payout. How much can you and your unit reduce from our planned payout moving forward? Uh I don't believe that uh, we can give a firm estimate uh, on uh, on reduction or the or the um, uh, or the pace uh, of uh, reduction. Uh, I think that it is uh, fair to say that anytime we provide uh, feedback uh, to uh, agencies um, uh, in, in connection with these uh, conditions, uh, that it reduces the likelihood that the, re the conditions uh, will recur. Uh, but I, we're not in a position to quantify that with certainty. With regards to the judgments and claims, is it possible for us to break out the judgments and claims so that we have the, the large cases like the, this Central Park case uh, distinguished from the smaller cases and then within the smaller cases break it out by agencies that are being targeted? So the DOT claims for all those potholes, being able to see that budget line, and in so doing, be able to, I mean, $700 million is larger than the budgets of many agencies in our city. And uh, if we're able to connect how much we're paying out to each agency and thereby focus a little bit further down. Yes, uh, certainly. I mean, it, it's, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad you, you raised that because uh, the, there are 
a handful of large settlements in longstanding matters uh, that from year to year can distort uh, the judgment and claims total. So for instance, if you look at settlements in uh, uh, fiscal year uh, 16, there were five settlements um, that uh, totaled 55, 65, 75, uh, close to $90 million uh, for just five settlements in uh, fiscal year 17. Uh, and if, or if, I'm sorry, fiscal year 16 and 50 year, fiscal year 17, uh, similarly, uh, close to the same figure, uh, a little more, um, were uh, the result of uh, the settlement in that year of uh, four cases. Um, and I, what I would point out in terms of um, payouts of greater than 10 million, um, if you subtract all of those out, you would see, and we can provide you that, uh, this information subsequently, uh, subsequent to this, uh, this proceeding, uh, that the judgment and claims are actually pretty level uh, from year to year when you subtract the anomalies. Just by subtracting uh, the uh, judgments and claims over $10 million, uh, you get a leveling uh, of the of the uh, year to year judgment and claims uh, totals. Thank you. If you could share that, that would be helpful. And I guess uh, anything we can do to try to figure out what we're getting sued for and improve it would be uh, I would be grateful for. A along those same lines, I kind of try to look at this as when I ran a company. So if somebody asked for additional funding, we wanted to see a return on investment. Uh, we've made incredible investments in programs like vertical case handling, allowing your attorneys to handle case from start to finish. Uh, the charter requires performance budgeting and an appendix. Uh, would you be willing to tie certain key programs or initiatives and new funding to desired results or goals so that we can measure a return on the taxpayer's investment? No, I, I agree with you that, uh, that we uh, should use performance measures, and we're certainly willing to provide uh, information with res uh, statistical information uh, that actually uh, uh, presents a an accurate uh, picture of of um, of um, uh, what the, the progress is being made to reduce judgment uh, and claims. Uh, we we want to make sure, however, that those. Um, statistics accurately reflect what we're accomplishing and neither overstate or understate uh, those accomplishments. Uh, this is a, a question I've been asking every year. I uh, was against stop and frisk. Uh, one of the concerns uh, with Local Law 71 of 2013 is that it would open up the city to a uh, an influx of millions and millions of dollars in liabilities under the Community Safety Act. Uh, how many lawsuits have been filed against the city for racial profiling under Local Law 71, and uh, how many? Wh wh what is their status? Well, I think we can finally stick a fork in that particular concern. Uh, I, I believe we had two. We had, we had uh, six cases. Two have been settled. There are two pending in federal court and two pending in state court. Right. So it's two pending. Four pending. Four pending. Sorry. Two in federal and two in state. Great. Uh, so that, that, is, that is very good news, especially with the end to stop and frisk. It seems like the, the two come hand in hand. Uh, with regards to uh, diversion rates, uh, in fiscal year 14, they were 85%. And so diversion is, uh, and it's juvenile successfully referred to a diversion program with no new delinquency within one year. So in FY, in 2014, in that fiscal year, it was 85%. In 15, it was 84%. In 16, it's down to 81%. And uh, for the fiscal, the last, the four months of fiscal year 17, we're, we're, we're trending towards 70 percent, uh, and the target is actually well below the previous year's performance. Uh, what can the law department do to send fewer children into juvenile justice and the pipeline to a, a, a 
the, the prison system and get folks diverted without a new uh, delinquency. Okay. Uh, with all respect, I think it's, um, it probably isn't helpful to focus exclusively on diversion to determine whether or not we are reducing the pipeline to family court. As a matter of fact, this, the statistics that you cite with respect to diversion this year are actually a reflection of just the opposite of what you might suppose. There are far fewer juveniles being arrested in uh, many of these, uh, in many of the crime categories that would create the base of kids who are, uh, who would be subject to diversion in the first place. So in felony cases, um, we're talking about a 38% reduction in arrest. Uh, misdemeanor cases, a 76% reduction in arrest. Uh, we're down 64% overall. And so you have fewer cases coming into the system. And the best way, obviously, to avoid juveniles getting into the pipeline is not to arrest them in the first place. And so, uh, and so discretion is being, uh, uh, is being exercised uh, differently at the very front end. Then we have the, uh, the probation department uh, that, um, uh, using its own criteria, um, uh, uh, diverts cases during a period called the adjustment period. And cases that survive adjustment and are referred to our office are further uh, evaluated, and there are cases that are, fur that are, that are, uh, are diverted from uh, the system at that stage as well. So I think that the appropriate number of cases, given the changing landscape in terms of intake of cases into the system, is, is quite appropriate and what I, would, what I would, would, uh, would expect, given the kinds of cases that are being referred ultimately to the Law Department for present, uh, presentment. I, I would agree with you, and I uh, would love if the Law Department would uh, join me and many council members in uh, arguing for universal uh, summer youth jobs as well as uh, year-round year youth jobs to uh, make sure our kids don't end up in. I, 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 having been an administra administrator at the Central Brooklyn Model City Summer Academy program for, for a number of years, uh, which uh, I can tell is dating me <laughs> from your expression, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That, that's, and would you agree to change the measures to more accurately reflect? Uh, because right now it's just a percentage measure, and you're right, it's, it's a bad measure, uh, but it's what I'm stuck with. Would you agree to change the measure to account of the number of juveniles referred based on type of crime and uh, the uh, number that are diverted? Yes. Great. And if it, isn't if it doesn't make its way into the MMR after an a conversation with Mayor's Office of Operation, would you be willing to provide that uh, information directly to the committee? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, as you know, uh, sorry, along those lines, uh, the governor is now pushing for a raise the age uh, from 16 to 18, which is something that I support. What would be the budget impact on law department if that happened? I don't think I have the exact numbers uh, here, um, uh, except that it would be uh, substantial when you take into account uh, what it would mean to bring um, a whole new age co cohort of 16 and 17 year olds uh, into the family court system, uh, requiring an increase in the number of judges. Obviously, increasing the number of judges means you have to increase proportionately the number of court staff. It means additional resources for uh, the probation uh, department. Um, if and also, uh, you have to consider that uh, 16 and 17 year olds, as, uh, as, as uh, all of us who've raised children know, are different from 13, 14, and 15 year olds. And consequently, the, the kinds of programs that will be age appropriate for, for uh, them, if we're really going to uh, uh, do this right and provide uh, the kinds of resources that family court has traditionally provided to a slightly older age cohort, are programs that may not even be in existence yet. Uh, so uh, the, so they're, they're going to be substantial cost uh, that I think are gonna be worthwhile investing in this program. I think, frankly, uh, are gonna be absolutely essential to invest uh, if, if this is going to be uh, uh, done right.
This is a uh, question that's been highlighted to me by my uh, great staff. I want to thank our uh, finance analyst, uh, Sheila. Uh, last year, the city paid out $230 million in settlement costs for cases involving NYPD. Can you discuss with the committee if any of the $229.6 million spent for NYPD and $16.4 million are associated with broken windows policing or civil asset forfeiture matters? And does the law department anticipate increased costs for payouts on cases related to broken windows or civil asset forfeiture matters? I'm not aware of any uh, uh, correlation, uh, uh, much less a cause-effect relationship between um, claims associated, uh, uh, claims or settlements that have been, uh, uh, um, that have occurred uh, that are directly related to either to, to broken windows uh, and so-called broken windows enforcement or to uh, forfeiture actions. I mean, for one, for one thing, uh, there is, has been a dramatic reduction um, in uh, summons activity uh, in broad categories of low-level offenses, and that, that, those statistics are, are rather stark. Uh, we will follow up in a letter on that specific question, as well as many others. Uh, there's a question I ask you every year, and I think it's public knowledge at this point, so I uh, had a, a single mom, and we received child support. When we received child support, we ended up needing the uh, uh, family court to receive the payments and then pass them on. But uh, the, the number for families entitled to support orders that get a support order uh, remains, uh, in, in my opinion, low. I, I think the answer should be 100%. Your goal for fiscal year 18 is 65%. In fiscal year 17, your four-month actual is 67%, which means one-third of the kids who need these orders aren't getting them. I, I could be one of these kids. I was one of these kids. What can we do here? Well, first of all, We are, all of our cases um, are, are cases um, that, in which the custodial parent um, is in a, another jurisdiction, uh, which is a uh, complicating factor. Um, in order to um, um, obtain jurisdiction over the, um, the parent who, is not, who owes child support, they have to be served. Uh, and there are challenges with locating and serving uh, these parents. In addition, it is um, not always the case that we receive um, from the, the distant custodial parent the cooperation that is necessary to provide uh, information to the court necessary to support uh, an order of support. Um, so if, if we were talking about a case that was entirely domestic in terms of jurisdiction, there would be challenges that would make it difficult to, uh, 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 to have a success rate at 100%. But when you have a complicating factor of the custodial parents being um, outside of New York State, uh, that, that is a, that's a un unique set of challenges. Uh, isn't there support under UFSA? There, there's a lot of federal law on this that supports child support payments and uh, I, I would just, I would welcome any specific strategies that you have, including if we need to draft at a city level or state level additional long arm statutes for you, but credit card companies can track folks down, not sure why we can't. Well, I, I, it, would, it would surprise me if there's any credit card company that has a 100% success rate. I think you would agree with me on that. Uh, so you're already in the courts. The credit card companies have to bring it to judgment. For, right. for us, it's just a matter of finding the person. Listen, and we, 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 uh, uh, this is the business that we are, that we are in. We certainly uh, uh, share uh, your concern, and this uh, uh, that we have the highest uh, rec uh, uh, percentage of recovery uh, that's possible. I've, I've just simply shared with you uh, the practical challenges of attaining that. We're always trying to. Uh, to work to improve the system. I don't know that additional legislation is necessary. Mm -hmm. We need compliance with all the parties involved in the process with existing laws. So I, I think just if, if you're able to get the best and brightest at law department or advocates together to figure out what 
would help get this number up. Uh, whether there's changes to the indicator that we can help, that would be, I'd be grateful for that. Yeah. On to a, a lighter note and something that's also of personal interest. Uh, in my first year in office, we were able to pass legislation that I uh, was a co-prime sponsor of with Councilmember uh, Brad Lander to put the law online. Uh, the law is now online without a license. Shortly after the law was passed, the, the copyright by license was taken down from the existing vendor. We have a new vendor. But one of the requirements that has still not been complied with is offering the, the city's law through an open API, which would allow anyone to actually just pull sections of the law without having to go through our website. Uh, where are we in getting our law available through uh, an open API? I think that, uh, as I understand it, there are discussions underway uh, to, uh, to make that possible. And we will uh, uh, be in a position to report to you uh, after those discussions are concluded. A question that we'll be asking all the agencies that come before us is that the mayor has asked the agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? And if so, uh, how much? We are in discussions with OMB regarding any reductions. Yes. Okay. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony and for dealing with a number of very complicated issues. We look forward to working with you on an ongoing basis. We will hopefully see you at the executive budget hearing again. And uh, we thank you. I'm going to- And we thank you for your interest. You got it. We will take a, a five minute uh, recess as point of personal privilege and I will be, we will reconvene at uh, 12.50.
Should I, should I uh, speak very quickly then? <laughs> Because the, the, well, the answer is I I, I uh, left a message for Lourdes. Oh, what, what? We're reconvening after this five-minute recess. Uh, we'd like to welcome from the Board of Elections in the City of New York, we will now hear from Executive Director Mike Ryan. The Board is responsible for conducting all elections in the City of New York, except for participatory budgeting. Uh, please make sure to start voting on March 25th on $1 million in your district. Not administered by the Board of Elections, it's administered by uh, local council members, of which over 26 are participating. So if you're watching, Check if you can spend $1 million in your district. Back to the regular scheduled programming. Uh, it's fiscal year 2018 is 900, sorry, $98.6 million. Uh, Mike almost thought he was getting good news, uh, including $39.2 million in personal services for its employees. This figure is lower than the $110 million average BOE budget from the past five years. Following a calendar year with four elections, we have much to discuss. We'll examine the board's budgetary needs for our upcoming fiscal year and discuss reforms that can improve the board's operations and potentially lead to cost savings. I'd like to hear details on the management of your poll workers and full-time employees, how the board is preparing for upcoming municipal elections, and what is being done to improve election day operations. Uh, council members who will soon arrive will have five minutes to ask questions and receive answers on first round and three minutes on second round. We'll ask the administration to limit their testimony to no more than 15 minutes, though longer written testimony may be submitted for the record. Members of the public should fill out an appearance card and return at four o'clock. I now ask my committee council to swear you in. Hi, can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today and to, honor, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Please begin your testimony. Is your mic on? Sorry. There we go. I am Michael Ryan. Uh, the Executive Director of the Board of Elections in the City of New York. Uh, joining me here at the table is our Finance Director, uh, Gerald Sullivan, and we have additional members of staff seated in the audience. Uh, 
Before I begin discussing the Mayor's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2018, I would like to thank the City Council and the Mayor for providing the necessary support to the Board in fiscal year 17 to meet its constitutional and statutory mandates as well as the needs of the voters of the City of New York. Over the last several years, the Mayor's administration, the City Council and the Board have truly forged an effective uh, budget process partnership. Uh, to ensure that the needs of the voters of the City of New York are being adequately met and that the resources of the taxpayers are being utilized responsibly. This is an example of the manner in which government is supposed to work and should be a source of pride for all involved. I would like to take a few moments to highlight some of the accomplishments of the Board in fiscal year 2017 that this funding made possible. We have uh, continued our enhancements to the election night returns project. Uh, the board acquired an additional 1,100 tablets to supplement the 3,000 uh, that were purchased in 2016 to enhance the board's ability to service the voters, expedite both election day problem resolution uh, and providing unofficial election night results upon the closing of the polls. In fiscal year 2016, the board acquired an additional 6,000 square feet of space at the general office to serve uh, the critical functions as a dedicated technology center for storing programming and processing transmitted data from the new tablets. The transmitted data contains election night results for the immediate upload uh, and update to the board's website uh, throughout the evening on a five minute refresh. In addition, uh, the board has used tablets to check in poll workers on election day, which gives the board real time information on poll worker attendance. This has allowed the board to more efficiently dispatch poll workers as needed. The use of the tablets has also increased the speed in which the public has access to election night results. On election night, uh, poll site coordinators use tablets to transmit the unofficial election results from all active poll sites. The unofficial results on the portable memory devices were read into the tablets. The tablets transmitted those unofficial results to the secure transfer, secure file transfer protocol SFTP servers at the general office. Election reporting manager servers at the general office read the unofficial results uh, at periodic intervals uh, throughout the night. The unofficial results were electronically transferred to the board's website, uh, the State Board of Elections and the board's internal SLX system. In addition, the PMDs were transferred uh, to the police precincts, uh, bipartisan teams of board personnel as a backup read the PMDs into the election night results uh, tablets at the precincts. Uh, and just to give you a brief overview, uh, in terms of history, uh, and we have more detailed information in, in the testimony, but in 2012, 75% of the PMDs were read into the system by 1220. In 2014, when we were using a pilot consisting of 200 poll sites, we had 75% of the PMDs tabulated into the system by 11 p.m. Um, and in this past general election, where we were doing it citywide, we had 2.5 million votes cast on the DS200, uh, DS200 scanners on election night and 75% of the PMDs were tabulated by 9.40 p.m., 80% by 10 p.m., and 92% by 11 p.m. At 10.30 on election night, the only results in the New York State system were results that were received by the New York City Board of Elections. That prompted other jurisdictions to come down and observe our elections uh, it, that were just held in the last special election for city council, uh, and we expect to be sharing this technology with other jurisdictions throughout the state uh, to assist our fellow boards of elections in, uh, in processing the results as quickly as New York City does. With respect to cyber security, after a careful review of reports prepared by uh, Grizzly Step and FireEye Mandiant uh, in advance of the presidential election, uh, as well as the Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity Study, it has been determined that the, court, the board is currently meeting most of the recommended, recommended cybersecurity measures. However, there are areas where fortification of cybersecurity protections is required. 
The board is requesting additional positions in the electronic voting systems and MIS departments to further enhance our cybersecurity efforts. Additional positions are required in each borough office to ensure the board maintains uh, the physical security of its hardware and software uh, at each location. Uh, to build on current security and further fortify the electronic voting system and management information systems against potential cybersecurity threats, the board is requesting a total of 16 new positions. Six of these positions will be embedded within the EVS department, um, EVS and MIS departments at our general office uh, as senior security analysts slash engineers and network implementation engineers. The responsibility of these positions will be coordinating with the board's senior management and the agency's EVS slash MIS departments to identify, support, and resolve any and all cybersecurity issues moving forward, provide assessment, support, and engineering solutions to ensure the agency's sound network and design, review, analyze, and document security requirements of applications, systems, networks across their life cycle. Research, evaluate, design, test, recommend, and plan the implementation of new or updated information security hardware or software and analyze its impact on the existing environment. Provide technical expertise for the administration of the needed security tools to protect the agency's internal and external operations uh, and performance in service to its mandate of conducting fair and honest election events. The remaining 10 positions will be spread out uh, throughout the five borough offices uh, to work closely uh, with the central office team, uh, and we are requesting funding in the amount of $1.3 million. Uh, in addition, uh, we are requesting $615,400 uh, to enhance our list, enhance and create a list maintenance unit uh, that will consist of positions in the borough offices as well as a list maintenance coordinator in the uh, general office. And this will be to enhance our ongoing responsibility of maintaining accurate voter registration rolls as well as serve as a double check slash overlay of the voter registration unit. Um, in fiscal year 17, the board conducted an eight-week poll worker recruitment drive leveraging the New York City Department of Health contract and a DCAS requirements contract. The cost of this effort was $450,000, $365,000 uh, for the advertising locations and $85,000 in printing. The advertisements were displayed citywide on subways, buses, and on the Staten Island Transit. The campaign resulted in approximately 20,000 inquiries to the dedicated recruitment portal. There were 5,700 completed poll worker applications, over 5,700, and over 1,400 individuals attended training, passed the exam, and worked during the most recent election cycle, which represented roughly about 5% of the poll worker workforce. To build on this successful effort, the board is seeking to expand to a 24-week program, and the board is requesting an additional $1.1 million uh, in cost to cover this outreach campaign. Uh, the board is presently acting under a federal court order with respect to voter accessibility and compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we presently deploy a temporary ramp equipment to 178 poll sites to remediate barriers to voting program access. The equipment is installed utilizing vendors, school custodial staff, building superintendents, and BOE staff. All poll sites are required to be surveyed by Evan Terry Associates pursuant to the court order. The process is ongoing, and the board anticipates upon completion approximately 400 sites requiring vendor installation and an additional 200 sites requiring other barrier removal equipment for a total of 600 sites or approximately 50% of all poll sites. It is estimated that a total linear footage, of including ramps, platforms, and level landing systems at 12,600 feet, which is an additional 10,000 over the 2,600 that are presently deployed, uh, 
To date, the fiscal, in fiscal year 2017, the BOE has expended $600,000 to meet those needs. Uh, an additional purchase of approximately 10,000 linear feet of ADA equipment, uh, which includes ramps, platforms, and level landing systems, uh, as well as the associated uh, replacement parts uh, at a cost estimated to be uh, approximately $2 million, uh, and installation for each election is, an, is estimated at $1 million per election. So that will float depending on the number of elections that we do in a particular cycle. Uh, in addition, one of the board's ADA compliance uh, coordinators, we have two, uh, requires sign language assistance uh, as a reasonable accommodation. The board currently uses an outside service uh, at the cost of $83 an hour for, for each sign language interpreter, and we're seeking uh, two sign language interpreters uh, to work for the board uh, for the purposes of assisting uh, and providing for this reasonable accommodation. Uh, with respect to poll workers, Election Center, an independent election administrating consultant firm, was retained uh, several uh, years ago to revise the poll worker training program. The poll worker training process was streamlined, improving utilizing video and other technology related methods. The board will continue to work with Election Center to improve the voter experience, uh, which will include sensitivity training, including information regarding ADA compliance. Uh, the F fiscal year 2018 overview, the board anticipates conducting four citywide election events during FY 2018, local primary in September, uh, potential runoff in, 20, uh, in October of 2017 or late September, depending, uh, local uh, general election, and a federal primary in 2018, uh, and hopefully none, but we may also have some special elections thrown in there. Uh, our projections for 2018 uh, have already been into, read into the record, so we can uh, move on past that uh, initial summary. However, we're looking at, um, based on the four anticipated election events, the board requires uh, 37.9 uh, million for poll workers uh, compared to the 9.9 .9 that's in the uh, FY18 departmental estimate. Our OTPS budget, um, we're asking for 78.5 million, um, and the details are set forth in the written testimony, as when we can bolster that as well. Um, the board remains sensitive to the fiscal challenges faced by the city and mindful of its obligations to serve the voters of the city of New York. The board remains committed to this partnership that has been forged with the administration and this council. Uh, and the board also remains committed to utilizing all of the resources that are provided to us uh, in a responsible way. And w that having been said, we'll certainly be prepared to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, I've asked every other agency, so we'll get this one out of the way. The mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you have a plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget uh, versus a uh, the cost increase you're, you're proposing uh, was actually more than 10 percent of the existing savings that the mayor is asking for? Um, unlike some other agencies, the board is an independent board, um, and while we are certainly sensitive uh, to requests um, from wherever they may come from in our government partners, uh, we do operate a little bit differently uh, than some of the other agencies. That having been said, um, we don't, we're in a perhaps a little bit of a unique position where we don't always get to control uh, the entirety of our budget. Uh, for example, we have conducted a special election in February, and that special election has led to another special election. Uh, we believe what we have put forward uh, for this budget process uh, is as responsible as it can be and is as lean as, as it can be in order to accomplish uh, our uh, core mission. But something else came up in this past election, and I think we would be wrong not to clarify it and also to just gloss over it. 
the way that the narrative has been played out with respect to the cybersecurity issues and the hacking of the election, they're talking about it like the election results were at risk. And all of the information that we received leading up to uh, election day indicated, at least here in New York, that election results were not at risk. But what was at risk was other election systems. For example, we communicate on Facebook and Twitter, and we also have a website, and the concerns were that perhaps those things could be cloned and push out information that was not accurate. And so when we're looking at beefing up our cybersecurity, uh, those are the kinds of areas that we're looking to make sure that we, we do what we need to do, and that requires money. We'll, we'll get back to the initial budget questions, but with regards to uh, cybersecurity, um, I'm, I'm a software developer. There's such thing as something called a, a man in the middle, but for, for my purposes I'll say a person in the middle attack where your devices could send a message saying that 100 people voted for a, a Abraham Lincoln and uh, zero voted for George Washington. A uh, intercept could then flip that and then report to the Board of Elections that the results were different. Uh, now, New York City has a paper-based optical scan, uh, but if, this, if the tablets get hacked, as it were, uh, how would that be any different? And uh, in terms of any audit requirements, was an audit conducted and did our paper ballot audit match the, uh, what was reported by your tablets? So a couple of things. There, the information that gets transported on election night is encrypted. Uh, and it's encrypted and decrypted twice before it gets into our system. So it comes in and then there's a further encryption on our end of it. And that's as much as I can uh, discuss with that. And we can certainly have a side meeting with our tech folks and they can explain to you in more detail. What I can tell you is New York State has maybe one, if not the most, certainly one of the most um, expansive post-election uh, re-canvas procedures in the country, which includes a mandatory random 3% audit of all of the, uh, of all the results citywide. And it's done on a draw, kind of like a lottery, and the different uh, locations get picked. But if there's any discrepancy between the results in those areas, then it's a graduated audit until the discrepancy, you know, uh, levels out. So in other words, if it keeps showing more and more discrepancies as you go along, then you could result in a 100% audit. Um, my understanding is, and um, it happened uh, before I got here, that going beyond the 3% audit has only happened once uh, since we've been using the DS-200s, and that happened in the Bronx, and it didn't go beyond the 5%. So there's an audit process built into the system. So were any voting machines or computers compromised in the last election? No. And 3% uh, of the paper ballots were counted? Yes, were audited. And uh, how many dead people voted? To my knowledge, none. And uh, how, how many uh, illegal immigrants? Uh, the, the, the president has alleged uh, that uh, illegal people voted. Uh, is, is, are, is that the case? Are you covering it up? Uh, has anyone illegal voted? We certainly don't cover these things up. In the, in the rare instance... And sorry, just to clarify, this, this sure. is the, the president's language. Yes. I, I no, I, I understand. No, no person <laughs> is illegal. Uh, however, the, uh, to, to quote Spicer, I'm using, the, the I'm, using, I'm using his words. The New York City Board of Elections, as we sit here today, has no information that any individual in any one of the suspect categories uh, cast the vote. If someone has such information, they want to bring it to us and let us know, we will pass it along, as we have done in other instances, to the appropriate law enforcement authorities uh, for investigation. What one of your own commissioners has alleged uh, voter fraud? Has there been any substanti substantiation to those claims? Anyone can tweet that there is fraud. Has anyone provided you with a specific instance of fraud? 
I, either the president or that commissioner have, has has president has the president provided you with in specific instances of fraud or uh, the uh, Democratic commissioner from Manhattan? Laying off to the side any representations made by specific individuals. As we sit here, I am not aware of any instances of any category of voter fraud that has not been uh, taken care of since I've been here. And I can tell you there was one instance where, and it was a poll worker in a particular borough, who received a phone call on election day to vote on behalf of her brother. She cast a vote for her brother. Uh, she was caught. We made an, a, an appropriate referral to the local district attorney, and the woman was prosecuted and took a conditional plea where she pled guilty to misdemeanor voter fraud and um, a disorderly conduct and had to perform uh, community service in order for an, in exchange for a dismissal of the, of the criminal charges. Uh, so when those things happen, in the rare instance that they are brought to our attention, we pass them along to appropriate law enforcement authorities and, and appropriate action is taken. So uh, just to get back a little bit to budget type questions. Uh, with regards to online voter registration, which is something that the Attorney General has made an opinion on and has also called for as part of a statewide package, this committee has previously heard a bill that would require the city to create its own online voter registration portal. If such a portal were to be created by the city's Mayor's Office of Operations or Voter Assistance Commission, uh, do you believe the Board of Elections could recognize any cost savings from having incoming voter registration forms uh, mailed to you that were more legible and, and computer generated as well as if those were coupled with uh, the, the data so that your folks could actually just confirm that the forms were received versus having to data enter them? So we're already doing this to some extent with respect to the local law uh, 29 agencies. Um, the hang-up, uh, Chair, as you, as you know, is the direct electronic importing of the signature. That having been said, if voters utilize the tools that are presently available on our website, either through uh, the city portal or, or just printing up the form that we uh, make available, yes, absolutely. The less that we have to decipher handwriting and the more that we could rely on uh, the data as it's entered uh, by the individual voter, particularly under circumstances uh, for some of the more ethnically uh, diverse names, uh, when you're not having to decipher handwriting, at crunch time, keeping in mind that when we're pushing up against the voter registration deadline like we were in the, in the presidential election, we hired an outside firm as well as our own employees uh, to be able to do all of that round-the-clock data entry. Uh, so yes, the more that people could enter the data on their own and provide us the information, uh, which would then marry up with uh, the file that's already there, set up in a queue, so when we get that piece of paper back, we marry it right up, absolute savings. And in addition to the savings, which is kind of difficult to quantify, the quality of the process would go up. Would, you, would there be an appreciable difference in wait times if people's names were entered correctly in the poll books when they show up to vote uh, versus not finding their name spelled correctly in the right place in a poll book? Well, the, the, the most famous way I could explain is I, I once worked with a gentleman named Douglas Keith who is in the uh, voter file as Keith Douglas, and that is actually a frequent occurrence of people with names right. that have two first names, as it were. Well, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that there is no one magic elixir that'll solve all of the wait time uh, issues that arise on election day. Certainly, the more accurate the poll list books are, the more likely it is that people would be identified quickly and move along the process, you know, uh, in an incrementally faster fashion. 
The City Council passed a number of bills, including a uh, voter information portal meant to allow folks to track voter uh, absentee ballot applications, check on their voter registration status, and, and a number of other tools. Where is the Board of Elections in implementing those laws and at what cost? Well, we don't have a separate cost associated with them. They have been folded into our, our everyday uh, process of technology enhancement. Where we are a little bit, uh, I don't want to say stuck is not, the right, is not the right point to make. Where we are a little bit more cautious is we had expected some of this to be done uh, with the rollout of a new website in, before the general election. All of the tech folks that, we, that were brought to bear in terms of consulting with respect to all the cybersecurity issues that were floating around in and around election time, we were told that since we were migrating to a new platform, that we should take more cautious steps to make sure that the security protocols as they existed would in fact uh, protect the new system moving forward. The other piece to that puzzle though is we have our internal ballot tracker and in order to make that work more efficiently and in a more user-friendly way, we need to marry that uh, to our voter registration system so that it's all dovetailed neatly into, into one portal. That, that work is happening. Um, I can tell you that the portal uh, should be up uh, and running as soon as we finish the security issue, and then there's some more programming that will probably take us into the early part of the next fiscal year to marry up the, uh, the AVID system and the, and the BATS system, hopefully in advance of the, uh, of the September or November general, uh, September primary or November general in 2018, 2017. Today you come hat in hand asking for $61.7 million. I have good news for you. Uh, April 25th, 2016, Mayor de Blasio has offered $20 million for you. So you could get one third of the way here. We've just been joined by Council Member Richie Torres. But you could get one third of the way towards your funding goal by uh, accepting this $20 million. So I guess first question just being, have you accepted the $20 million, and uh, would you be willing to use it to bring in an outside consultant, have a blue ribbon commission, uh, work, comply with the controller's audit, guarantee transparency in hiring, enhance poll worker training, uh, add email and text message notifications, and a whole bevy of other items that the uh, city is willing to fund? Well, first of all, we get the easy one out of the way. We are complying with the comptroller's audit, uh, which we're required to do in any event. Um, that, the suggestions made by the, uh, by the administration have been the subject of quite a, uh, quite a bit of conversation back and forth between uh, the board uh, and the administration. I, I would say this, that um, to characterize uh, the, the 20 million as one third of the 61 million in additional need um, is is not quite um, a fair characterization from from our perspective. It's it's not as if uh, a 20 million dollar pool of money has been offered uh, to be utilized within the full discretion of the board. If that were the case, then then I would say yes. You're right, 60 minus 20 is 40, and so we only got 40 left. Um, what's being suggested here is uh, some outside uh, consulting work, which takes up quite a bit of the, uh, quite a bit of the money. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, though, we have about $7 million, and this is where a little bit of a philosophical difference comes between us and the, uh, and the administration. They're asking for a doubling of the poll worker training when our consultant that we already have on board um, has asked for an actual reduction 
in the amount of hours that you train poll workers and to be more targeted. So it kind of takes the philosophy that we've embraced over the last couple of years and flipped it on its ear. Reasonable minds can differ on that, and we're certainly willing to talk about, you know, whether some of the improvements uh, that we think and we know we've made to the to the training is something that um, that can be tweaked and and can meet the needs of everyone. Uh, the other thing, a substantial piece of this is is raising poll worker pay, and I think that the data that we we, we provided earlier, the twenty thousand hits the 5,700 applications translating into 1,700 or 1,470 poll workers um, is an indication of significant overlap and agreement that we believe that the poll workers' pay should be raised. Uh, and I think that if you look at a, a good chunk of that 60, 60 million, uh, we're talking about, yes, raise the poll worker uh, pay uh, we'd like to see it go from 200 to 300 for poll workers and from 300 to 400 for, um, for coordinators. Uh, in the 20 million allocation, it's uh, $50 from 200 to 250 and from 300 to 350. Uh, but any movement in the direction of raising poll worker pay would be a wonderful thing. The other thing just that, that a, has just been brought up. Just to follow up on the poll worker question. Sure. Uh, in your testimony, you identified that uh, there were several thousand individuals who applied, and a, a, there was a steep drop off in the number who went through with the training. Uh, was every single person who applied through a public posting offered an opportunity to be a poll worker, or were some people displaced because of patronage appointments? All of the poll workers are pushed through our poll worker portal. Uh, and those ones, we needed an all hands on deck uh, approach with respect to the presidential election. So no one who could pass the exam and who was willing to work was turned away. Uh, matter of fact, we trained over 37,000 poll workers and about 30, a little over almost, maybe almost 32,000 showed up on election day. So even with that, there's always a drop off. Uh, so I think moving forward what we have to do is look more creatively at New York State election law, how we staff poll sites, and perhaps if other technologies are introduced into the poll sites uh, down the road, we would need less poll workers so, and could so be I, more discriminated. I will follow up on that, but to be clear, 8.4 million folks, anyone in New York City can be a poll worker. They don't need to be appointed by a district leader. They don't need to go through the party program, they will be assigned based on their party of registration, either Democrat or Republican, and right. if they are not part of a party, they will be assigned a party for that day, but uh, anyone can do it. They do not have to go through patronage. It is fully Correct. open, and uh, yes. And about 40 percent of our poll workers come from uh, a party source, keeping in mind that that's embedded in the election law. Uh, so about 60 percent of our poll workers are coming from a source other than a party affiliation. And just to follow up, you are asking for 1.3 million for cybersecurity and 615,000 for the list maintenance unit. Uh, will those be publicly posted? The, the, the tech jobs, for sure, are always posted. We all of our tech jobs are posted. These are very specific positions with respect to the um, with respect to the, the list maintenance folks that's a very specific uh, task that we'd be looking uh, to do and, and really that money is more to backfill the positions of folks that we would anticipate being promoted from within would they be publicly posted would they have to compete that would be up to the commissioners the commissioners would so, so you're asking us to give six hundred fifteen thousand dollars to the commissioners to decide who, who gets that money Democrat and Republican commissioners? Well, considering the fact that that authority is conferred upon them by 3-300 of the election law, the answer to that question is yes. And so for the 1.3 million, is that something that would be publicly posted and go through a, a open process, or would that 1.3 million also go to the commissioners? Well, ultimately, the commissioners appoint everyone. Uh, but what the policy has been with respect to technical jobs um, is that the technical jobs are posted and there is an open uh, hiring process. 
So Th there is a very specific reason for that, however, as well. These are specific tech jobs that we don't necessarily have the on-staff expertise uh, to fill those positions. I, I, so of the $60 million that you're asking for, how much of it is patronage appointments? How many of it is civil service appointments? How many will be publicly posted? How many will go to the commissioners to decide without having to do an interview? Well, right off the top, almost 30 million of it is poll worker. So now we're talking about uh, breaking it down to, to half. Uh, then in addition to that, we're anticipating four election events. So you got six million of it, over six million of that is also overtime costs. Three election events, not right. four. Four. What's the fourth? The fourth is if there's a runoff in between. Do you anticipate? Uh, I anticipate nothing. What we do is if, it, if the numbers shake out uh, that there's a runoff, there's a runoff. So we have to budget for a September primary, a runoff, and a general. And then just before the end of the fiscal year, uh, at the end of June, we'll have a federal primary. I, I imagine if we look at the uh, campaign finance filings in May, we'll have a good idea of whether or not there's any credible candidates for that fourth election event. Prognostication is not something that the Board of Elections gets involved in. Uh, and then just uh, following up, so this list maintenance unit that you're proposing, would that take the place of uh, clerks and deputy clerks who have been responsible for purging hundreds of thousands of voters previously? Well, that's kind of a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a leading question. No, what, it's, what it would be doing, would it would be creating another layer of security uh, to make certain that the NVRA and that the New York State statutes are appropriately uh, followed. In addition to that, we are in the process of creating a large-scale overwrite of the voter registration system to make it more fail-safe. And we are communicating directly with the uh, Attorney General's Office and the Department of Justice uh, to make certain that when we do this, it passes uh, muster uh, for uh, all of the interested overseers. And we want to make sure that if you move and you're supposed to get, say, for example, a uh, confirmation notice that you moved, that you don't get a cancellation notice, and that those individual mistakes can no longer be possible because there's a stop sign uh, put in the automated system. So, so these costs are to prevent a clerk and deputy clerk from being able to purge 100,000 voters on their own? To, cre to make sure that the NVRA and the New York State election law are appropriately followed. Have the two Brooklyn, the, the Brooklyn clerk and deputy clerk been terminated? They have not been terminated, neither of them. However, they remain uh, suspended uh, without pay. Why, why can't you fire them? The executive director does not have the authority to has hire the authority? and fire folks. Pardon? Who has the authority? The commissioners. And the commissioners have not brought a motion to do so yet? Not to date. I would urge the commissioners to uh, do their jobs. With regards to the purge, uh, after all is said and done, how many were purged, how many had their votes counted, and uh, how many were properly purged and did not have their vote counted? Well, the, 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 I don't know if I understand the second part of the question, but let's, let's stick with the first aspect of it. Going back to April, there was uh, what came up in the presidential primary. We, we had uh, two specific dates in Brooklyn uh, that involved a manual process that was supposed to be part of an ill-advised voter cleanup. Um, there was a total of over 122,000 notices sent out to those individuals. Uh, a little over 4,000 of them sent the notices back, leading to 117,656 individuals being taken off the voter rolls in Brooklyn. Um, all of those individuals were restored 
back to the voter rolls in advance of the June primary in 2016. So there was a mistake that came to light in April, and those same individuals were put right back onto the voter rolls uh, in, uh, in June. So if they showed up to vote in June, they didn't have an issue. With respect to the affidavits that were, any affidavit ballots that were cast in, in April, throughout the city, we took an enhanced look at all of the voter uh, registration activity for anybody that submitted an affidavit ballot. And if we didn't have sufficient documentation to justify that one, with 100% certainty that the removal from the voter rolls uh, was proper, we gave them credit for voting and we restored their, uh, and we restored their, uh, their registration. Now, uh, in this last election, there were, we're still going through this process and we're really combing through it. In the presidential election, we had 2,157 individuals whose uh, votes were counted uh, pursuant to uh, the commissioner's order. Uh, we had 35,672 individuals uh, yes. removed yep. from the voter rolls during 2016, but keep in mind that the vast majority of those individuals come from a process where we have an exchange of information with the State Board of Elections where they provide to us the duplicates, the deaths, and the felons. And in addition to that, we get some return mail back from our annual mailer, and we also have the national change of address process. So that manual process to which you referred earlier has been disabled since the, process, since the problems that were uh, associated with the, primarily with the April presidential primary uh, came to light. We disabled that process and it has not been reactivated. So the only removals that we're doing now are based on information that we received from the State Board of Elections or uh, the, in some way, shape, or form, the, the, the uh, U.S. Post Office. I'd like to just uh, hit two questions that I think I've asked you every time I've seen you since uh, I've been elected. Uh, how many jobs still aren't, how many jobs are we currently, pub are you publicly posting? How many jobs are not being publicly posted? And. Uh, where are you on implementing the background checks uh, suggested by the Department of Investigations? Uh, background checks, we're in the same place that we were uh, when last we met, um, which is we are not in a position to uh, conduct background checks. Not that we're against conducting background checks, it's just that a, pro a process has not been worked out. Uh, with respect to the job postings, that really depends on the type of position that we're talking about. Uh, as I said, the technical jobs are typically posted. If we have, uh, in addition to technical jobs, if we have particular dif difficulty filling a position, for example, uh, the ADA coordinators that have been hired by the agency were posted jobs. We worked very closely with the Mayor's Office uh, for Persons with Disabilities to craft uh, an appropriate job description so that we could post it. We also had it sent out to various list servers uh, for uh, disability rights uh, advocacy groups. Uh, we had to tweak the, uh, the job description and the, and the compensation a little bit, uh, which we did um, in, in, order to, in order to get uh, some qualified folks. And we, we think uh, that we have two very qualified uh, individuals. Uh, one of our ADA coordinators is uh, certified uh, through the University of Missouri, and the other one uh, as an ADA coordinator. And the other one is one class shy of the certification, but I have recently approved uh, the, the, uh, the individual to take the, the remaining class and receive reimbursement from the agency to do that as a necessary element of, uh, of their uh, job description. With regards to Americans with Disabilities Act, we uh, had DOE, I'm on the Education Committee, and uh, you are asking for $2 million 
uh, to cover installation costs of $1 million for ADA materials. Uh, how much would it cost from the capital budget just to make our public schools ADA accessible? Well, that I would leave to the School Construction Authority and the Department of Education to answer those questions. I can tell you that to the extent that any government facility, uh, to the extent that the facility is made permanently accessible, those costs that we put into our budget would fold away. How that weighs up against what the cost would be uh, for an individual agency, whether it be uh, DOE or Parks or NYCHA or any of the, our other government partners, what it would cost them to make permanent improvements, uh, that I can't tell you, but I can tell you in order for us to meet our obligations, uh, that's a fair number that's been put in our budget. Would you, pro would you provide that list to the uh, Committee on Governmental Operations and also make it publicly available so that we can see the locations that need the ADA accessibility, the improvements that you have been putting in temporarily so that we can then take that information and give it to the School Construction Authority for them to prioritize for capital projects? Certainly, and I, and I would say uh, that we meet regularly with our government partners mm -hmm. uh, in a task force to try to share this information and, um, and perform exactly that prioritization that, that you discuss. However, I'm also mindful of the fact that none of the agencies that are kind enough to come and sit down with us and, and work with us as partners answer directly to us. But there is a, a hierarchical uh, process of okay. which I know where I fit in. Who, who has convened the task force and is the city council a part of the task force? Uh, the city council has never been part of the task force but uh, the mayoral agency as a matter of fact uh, from the very beginning uh, n not only uh, individuals at city hall but the mayor's office of operations has been integrally involved in making sure that all of the relevant agencies come to the table and we've been we've been doing this work for over two years now um, and so, so if uh, the representatives of the mayor that are here could please include the city council in these meetings we would like to send at the very least a committee council if not a the appropriate member from the appropriate committees uh, with regards to uh, poll sites uh, a lot of the poll sites in my district hit capacity they just couldn't fit any more individuals in the room uh, beyond some of the changes that the mayor has proposed to happen in Albany and given that I have low confidence that Albany can get anything done, uh, what, is, uh, what are some of the challenges that the Board of Elections has with regards to citing poll sites and uh, would the Board of Elections commit to investigating the feasibility of any poll site brought to them by a city council member, an assembly member, a senator, a community board or even a random constituent? We with respect to the last part of your question, absolutely 100% commit uh, to working with all of the elected officials. As a matter of fact, one of your colleagues, Council uh, Member Rosenthal, uh, we've uh, worked together uh, to make uh, certain that uh, assumptions that we might make about convenience of locations are, are in fact uh, right, and if not, uh, can be adjusted. We certainly expect that, and I, I differ from what others might uh, criticize and say, well, if an elected official is choosing a particular location, doesn't that smack of interference in the election process? Absolutely not. Elected officials are elected to represent people and are, in fact, the eyes and ears of the community. So if the Board of Elections has made a, a, you know, a decision on a poll site and it turns out that somebody who knows the neighborhood better has a more convenient place for that election uh, event to occur, well, certainly we will evaluate it. And if it passes muster with respect to ADA accessibility, uh, you know, we'll bring it to the commissioners to, to entertain utilizing it as a poll site. And that's our challenges, the biggest challenges that we have are suitable, adequate uh, poll sites, but they're not the only challenges. There's, there are other challenges. Uh, that we have as well. Uh, going over to this second piece of this hearing, which is actually called the Preliminary Mayor's Management Report, have you ever 
seen the preliminary merits management report or uh, worked on it or? In my current capacity, no, but in prior capacities, yes. So as executive director of uh, the Board of Elections, do you or any of your employees work with the mayor's office of operations on drafting the two pages and the well, PMR? The, and what we do is we draft our annual report, which is actually more comprehensive than the information that's contained in the MMR. And, um, and the, and the uh, Mayor's Office of Operations digests our information and summarizes it uh, to fit the format of the, uh, of the MMR. Would you be open, without being mandated, but just as a, a request, to meet with the Mayor's Office? Has, has Mayor's of Office of Operations ever reached out to you to say, hey, we, we, we take this information from you and we digest it. Would you like to have a role in this whatsoever? Mm -hmm. We have had those conversations. Uh, however, uh, it has been a longstanding policy of uh, the, the Board of Elections that in order to maintain not only the actual independence but the appearance of independence, that conforming to a reporting requirement by a mayoral administration, any mayoral administration, um, is, uh, is not something that the Board of Commissioners has uh, typically in the past acquiesced to. And I can tell you when I was in fact a commissioner um, back in 2010, 2011, uh, I was opposed to direct participation for exactly that reason of maintaining the independence of the board. Okay, so moving forward uh, for uh, the city council and for the mayor's office, we will need the person who drafts this section of the PMMR since we must do PMR oversight to attend and sit next to the Board of Elections to answer those types of questions because we have a lot of questions about uh, the, the perhaps shortest report in the PMMR uh, which is not your problem. Uh, and then I guess just uh, in wrapping up, you're asking for $60 million uh, in addition to your current $98 million budget. Uh, going back to 2015, your uh, budget has never exceeded $123 million, and that was for last year, your, your big year, as it were. Previous, it was 116.6, and before that, it was 106.7. Uh, you, can you really justify such a dramatic increase on, in an election that is not your presidential year? Does that mean that when you go into the next presidential election, you're looking for 200 or 300 million? Well, That's a very large budget increase. It is, right up until the point where you take out the increase of the poll worker pay. If, if poll worker pay is off the table, then the, the increase is cut in half. Um, and when we take a look at certain things, for example, uh, overtime, you, you can look at overtime as two, one of two ways. You can look at overtime as extra, or you could look at overtimes as a cost saver uh, by reducing agency headcount and then paying the overtime. You're always, it's always going to be cheaper to pay overtime to existing staff than it is to hire additional staff and pay the fringe associated with that new headcount. So some of the other uh, aspects of increased headcount that we discussed earlier are, are things uh, that we think based on the changing landscape of the universe are necessary. Uh, but in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, our temp budget to deal with the seasonal elections uh, is always something that's going to be an add-on. So between those three things, between the overtime, the temps, and the poll workers, you're talking about $40 million right there. Uh, so the answer is yes, I think uh, those expenditures are justified, uh, but I also am confident that uh, I'm also confident that the partnership that has been forged with this body as well as the administration uh, and the Board of Elections will result in the Board uh, having sufficient resources uh, to carry out its core mission. We will follow up with additional questions. 
I imagine the, the lack of uh, additional colleagues showing up just to ask you questions at this preliminary budget indicates you might be doing something right. Uh, in spite of everything that happened, uh, thank you for doing your best. Uh, as I've asked in previous times, if you could please pass my invitation on to the commissioners. Uh, given so many of your questions, to, uh, responses to ongoing questions are that uh, the commissioners are uh, in power to answer those questions. Uh, I, I invite all 10 commissioners to join us at the executive budget uh, where we can dig into the same questions that we've been digging into for the past three years. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to uh, take a 10-minute uh, recess and then we will uh, commence with the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings.
We are reconvening. Uh, it is now uh, 2 o'clock, and we are ready for our 1 o'clock hearing for the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. We are still running about an hour behind, so uh, we, we welcome uh, FISA and OPA who are here early. We hope that our friends at the Tax Commission, Doris and BSA, and community boards, please adjust their attendance accordingly. I'd like to welcome uh, Commissioner and Chief Judge Fidel Del Valle and his staff. The Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings is an independent agency that conducts administrative hearings for city agencies, boards, and commissions. Oath is the city's central independent administrative law court. Oath has two divisions, Trials Division and Hearings Divisions. Trials Division adjudicates a wide range of issues that can be referred by any city agency, board, or commission. The Hearings Division conducts hearings on summonses that have been issued by 25 different enforcement agencies for alleged violations of city rules and regulations. Oath's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 totals $44.4 million. Personal services funding comprises approximately 75% of its total budget and provides 286 full-time positions. Last year, Oath collected fines totaling $155 million. In the preliminary plan, the office receives additional funding for the implementation of criminal justice reform. The recently enacted Criminal Justice Reform Act has reclassified certain criminal law misdemeanors and violations and has added the option of administrative civil law adjudic adjudication. Summonses for these violations can now be adjudicated at oath instead of the criminal courts. We look forward to hearing an update on the restructuring of the office and your plans to implement criminal justice reform. We'll also review details of your budget, performance measures in your MMR, PMMR, and plans moving forward. Uh, I will now give the committee council a moment to swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Uh, please turn on your microphone and begin your testimony. I presume the red light means it's on. Um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a very interesting and exciting year for Oath. Uh, in the last year, we have successfully uh, merged all of our hearings divisions uh, units into one unified hearings division, uh, created a uh, single uh, procedure process for all uh, summons hearings in the city of New York, and have created uh, an office of the chief clerk an office uh, that uh, consolidates uh, administrative functions in all of our hearings uh, division side, and uh, consolidated uh, personnel that were duplicative in uh, four different tribunals into essentially one tribunal for a total uh, number efficiencies of about $1.4 million. Um, the process continues, and uh, we will be working more and more with uh, city agencies uh, for them to adopt to the new process that has an ultimate goal of being an unbiased and fair tribunal to anyone who gets a summons in the city of New York and that is easily accessible at the same time or with uniform standards. Uh, I've submitted my... my uh, uh, prepared statement for your uh, review, and I'll just summarize basically uh, where we are at right now. Uh, Oath is now divided into two divisions, the Trials Division and the Hearings Division. The Trials Division is the classic Oath uh, that was created in 1979 by Mayor Koch. It uh, consists of 10 ALJs conducting uh, approximately 283 trials a year on approximately 3,000 some odd cases that are referred to us a year. Um, that division continues to work very efficiently as it has for the last 35 years. The hearings division, which is a new creature uh, that used to uh, comprise uh, the taxi and limousine uh, tribunal, the health tribunal, and the Environmental Control Board Tribunal. Uh, the, all those cases are now in the hearings division, 
as well as consumer affairs cases which started coming to us back in uh, August of 2016. Uh, the Consumer Affairs Tribunal uh, essentially shut down and those cases are now venued at the Oath Hearings Division. Um, legislation will be bringing to us at the, at the Hearings Division uh, Criminal Justice Reform Act cases starting in June. And for all practical purposes, actually about a month or two later because that's the lag time between our, when our summons is written and we get it. Uh, we've been working with enforcement agencies on the IT side uh, to make sure that uh, when they do a summons, we know about it before the person arrives at our facility. Something that uh, is more of a challenge than you would not think because of some agencies rather anti antiquated uh, uh, IT systems, which we are working to upgrade. Um, the clerk's office, which I, I mentioned before, uh, is designed to encourage greater participation in the hearings process and, and insulates the hearings division hearing p personnel from any functions that uh, may give a misimpression to the public uh, as to uh, their, uh, their impartiality. They deal with uh, uh, motions to vacate or adjourn or even uh, collect fines for the benefit of the finance department when that's necessary. Um, alternate adjudications, which is one-click hearings. That one-click hearings means you, you do your, uh, your summons online. Uh, hearings by mail and by phone. There's been an increase of 35% on those types of hearings since fiscal year 14. We have uh, webcam technology available and a pilot program to introduce webcam hearings uh, in this fiscal year. Uh, the major, I wouldn't say stumbling block, but uh, uh, issue is whether or not uh, the enforcement agencies have a available technology uh, to, to uh, do the video feed and so forth. Uh, we've done that with uh, the Port Authority Police. I think I mentioned that last year and it's been very successful with the Port Authority Police and we know it works very well when it can work. Um, we have increased our outreach significantly. We have had events in, uh, I believe, every borough so far uh, and providing uh, uh, brochures and so forth for uh, the benefit of the public and to educate the public in uh, what's available. Part of that process is uh, the newly created office of the Ombudsman. Uh, the Ombudsman's office which uh, for lawyers, it's basically the pro se clerk. Uh, we've gotten funding for that office. It will have approximately 21, 22 people working there. And it is aimed initially to deal with Criminal Justice Reform Act cases where people come in, they have, uh, they walk in from the street and they don't know what to do, what, what, they're in an environment they're not familiar with and there'll be somebody there from the ombudsman's office to basically show them the ropes, show them what uh, they have to do, what's the procedure, where to go, and, and that sort of thing. If they have complications or issues, uh, they try to resolve them. Sometimes they're, thanks to bureaucracy, things get complicated more than they should or uh, weirded out, and they work out those issues. Um, we're very excited about that. And it, of course, also applies to the rest of our hearings because they're there to serve whomever comes in the door, not just Criminal Justice Reform Act cases. Uh, we're more likely, by the way, let me add parenthetically, to have issues as to what to do when they walk in the door because those are going to be personal summonses as opposed to most of the summonses that the hearings division deals with, which are business-related type summonses. Businesses generally have an idea of how to deal with the summons, they've been, that's what they're 
part of their business. Uh, they, John Doe in the street and you get a, a, one of the summonses for littering or whatever, you may not, you have no idea what to do. We have used interpreters in almost 11,000 cases this year so far. Interpreters are available at all our locations. Uh, there's almost 100 different languages that are available by online, uh, that is on, by telephone interpreters. If somebody walks into a room and their hearing officer doesn't know that the person needs an interpreter for whatever reason or there's a witness that they didn't expect to have an interpreter, the hearing officer can uh, pull up an interpreter uh, on his uh, phone on his desk immediately if we know in advance, and by advance I mean before they walk, literally walk into the hearing room, that they need an interpreter, the system's already set up for whatever language uh, they, they need. And if they need documents translated into English and we get it early enough, we can do that for them as well at no charge. Um, our Center for Creative Conflict Resolution, which we have funded internally thanks to uh, efficiencies, um, has been, apart from doing uh, uh, me uh, mediations from si all, s all city agencies, primarily Department of Corrections, DOT, NYPD, FEDNI, uh, DEP, HRA, DPR, uh, Health and uh, Human Services, uh, NYSHA, Sanitation, DCAS, Oath of All People, uh, 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 311, and the entire EEO network have been using our, uh, our uh, Creative Conflict Resolution Center, um, which seeks to resolve conflicts, uh, usually pers personal conflicts, between uh, city workers before they escalate to something else. Um, city council and mayor start using it? It's available for them. Um, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's working very well. We have trained people in those agencies to do mediation as well. Um, and uh, we get a lot of positive response. This is, a, this is something that was originally created many years ago and, and uh, uh, was jettisoned because it didn't, quote, make money for the city. But we resurrected it because we think it's, it's very worthwhile. Um, we've, uh, our, our best customers so far have been actually NYPD and, and the fire department. Our headcount uh, is increased by 23, and that represents the ombudsman's office. Uh, it does not, of course, include, uh, and I'm not sure what uh, summary you have there, but it doesn't include our 309 per diem hearing officers. Revenue, which I am loath to talk about, uh, has increased somewhat this year as a result of our hearings. I really don't track that as assiduously as some folks would like me to because I feel it is irrelevant to uh, an adjudicatory tribunal that is a function for the Department of Finance to deal with. Um, our budget is higher this year. It would be higher if we hadn't uh, uh, accomplished the efficiencies that we have accomplished. I hope we will have more efficiencies as we can automate more functions such as uh, mailing. Our mail, mailing budget is over a million dollars, which drives me a little nutty. But a lot of that is because of uh, IT inefficiencies. That's the story in a nutshell from uh, last year to the present. Uh, I'll reiterate that our function is to provide people of the city of New York with a fair and impartial and biased hearing and that they have that impression after that hearing. And most of the restructuring that we are doing is to that end. 
And if it happens to be that uh, uh, that results in administrative efficiencies, all the better. Thank you for the great work that you do. So uh, this is a question we've asked all the other agencies. Probably not fair because you've already generated the efficiencies. The mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Uh, do you plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? If so, how much? Oh, uh, we expect to meet uh, the mayor's goal and probably exceed it. The efficiencies I mentioned, I don't believe are part of that because uh, that happened before um, uh, January 20th of this year when um, the city's budget came under a potential threat of being uh, damaged from um, Washington. Uh, but uh, that is right now being digested and vetted with uh, the Office of Management and Budget and they're crunching the numbers to see if it makes sense in the context of everything else. So I can't tell you right now exactly what it's going to look like because I really don't know, but I, although I have a pretty good idea. In previous budget hearings, we've discussed oaths restructuring so that any judge can hear any type of case. How is that restructuring going? What types of cost savings for, uh, will we anticipate from the restructuring? We're already getting cost, uh, operational cost savings from that. Um, we have cross-trained all our hearing officers uh, so they can uh, hear a summons issued by any entity that we receive summonses from. Um, right now, we are in the process of working with the various agencies that send us summonses to uh, um, devise a method to make it possible for them to uh, essentially provide the necessary personnel in, in cases where they need somebody to testify uh, for essentially on-demand hearings. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. If somebody that comes in and wants a hearing right now on a certain summons, uh, depending on what agency wrote the summons, we can do it, particularly if they have the summons in their hand. And if they walk into any of our offices, regardless of where the summons was written, whether it was written in the Bronx or Queens or whatever, we'll take care of it. Uh, the problem or the complications arise when you have certain summonses that require an inspector uh, to testify or you have uh, a summons where an agency has a prosecutor to appear. Uh, that becomes a more complicated matrix and such agencies that have that situation, such as, for example, the Buildings Department, we are working very closely with them and their uh, operations people to figure out a way to do that. Uh, that could include webcamming, that could include a, a, a matrix of when uh, people are available and so forth. Uh, the fire department just recently had a problem in, in, in figuring out how, a scheduling process that matched our scheduling process and we've worked that out. So it's, it's an incremental exercise that may take uh, uh, a bit of a while and sometimes a dedication of resources by other agencies. OATH's fiscal 2018 preliminary budget includes additional funding of $2.9 million and adds 22 positions in order to implement the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which is anticipated to increase OATH's caseload by over 48,000 hearings. Uh, can you give us an update on how this implementation has impacted operations at Oath, uh, do you have sufficient resources to accommodate the increased caseload as well as with regard to the om ombudsperson and pro se, as you had mentioned, and how is your fiscal plant? You have brand new, gorgeous uh, location. How is that going to accommodate the increased number of people coming through? Uh, very few of our locations needed more space, except uh, Staten Island and I believe the Bronx. 
in Queens, we are getting more space. We, we, have, we were already under contract for more space, and we're getting a, a, a significant amount of new space uh, where we currently do uh, hearings in Long Island City. We do hearings in Long Island City in Jamaica. Uh, the Jamaica facility is uh, uh, over, overburdened, shall we say. Um, we will be moving that operation to the same building, uh, hopefully by November of this calendar year. Uh, and that's part of, of the additional cost. A good por portion of the additional cost is, of course, the personnel for uh, the Ombudsman's Office and for um, um, the Center for um, uh, Court Innovation. We are contracting with the Center for Court Innovation uh, to deal with the portion of the Criminal Justice Reform Act that deals with uh, community service. That is an entirely new world for us. Uh, frankly, we didn't expect it when uh, the original discussions were taking place regarding the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Uh, but very. Uh, the, the ultimate egg, uh, point of the exercise is to have a system very similar to what exists in Red Hook uh, in, in criminal court where um, you have standing by those individuals who opt for uh, community service will have personnel there that will engage them with whatever uh, most fits their offense and their situation and their needs. That can range from the classic concept of community service to uh, basic training on, on uh, how to deal with the social situations that they had a problem dealing with. Yeah, to, and to, to, to answer the question in one sentence, yes, we have the resources. <laughs> And just to be clear, based on your previous testimony, I'm not sure if I heard properly, but if if somebody gets a summons wherever they are in the city, so somebody does something wrong in Manhattan, gets a summons there, and will they be, if they live in Brooklyn, can they show up to the Brooklyn location, or will they have to show up to wherever uh, they were ordered to appear? On the Criminal Justice Reform Act? Yeah. Yes, they'll be able to appear at any uh, of our facilities. Great. Uh, with regards to uh, units of appropriation, this is something I've been asking many of the agencies. So uh, the mayor recently said that folks shouldn't listen to the media, they should go read the budget themselves. But if you look at the budget, there's two units of appropriation which are personal services, which is paying people salaries and other, per other than personal salaries, which is everything else. Uh, would you be willing to uh, break out the unit, units of appropriation for the office's program areas and divisions so that they could see where the money is being spent? I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe, because I, I normally get this information on, on a spreadsheet without having to go online, uh, but I believe uh, the Office of Management and Budget's website under financial documents of all things um, uh, has a PDF file in it that breaks down a lot of this stuff in, in detail in some of the uh, appendices, I believe. Um, things like what's our telephone bill, what's our, our rent bill at uh, this location, that location, and so forth. I assume that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. What's the cost of our, our, our mailing contract, that kind of thing. I believe that's online. But uh, if you can't find it, I have no problem sharing it. I mean, it's, it's certainly not a top secret. I, I thank you for being, being the first agency to say yes to sharing it. I believe what we're referring to is the line by line in the overall budget uh, to make sure that there's the same transparency throughout the uh, system. And I think the other piece is, according to the charter, we're supposed to not only include uh, the, the budget, but actually have performance tied to it. So uh, given the investment of $2.9 million, would you be willing to, uh, at least as a pilot, have your agency show us what the return on our investment is so we're able to see 
for a uh, investment of 2.9 million, there are 22 physicians being uh, added in order to deal with 48,000 cases and things like that. Sure, uh, I'd want to see those numbers myself because A, we're doing this for the very first time and want to know uh, if we're uh, over committing resources or under committing resources for one thing. Um, and I, I fully expect there will be glitches because it's something brand new. And the only way you can figure that stuff out is by breaking down the, the details. Uh, with regards to the preliminary mayor's management report, we've noticed that you've made certain changes re to reflect some of the consolidations that you've done. However, if you know me, I, I'm focused on making sure that folks set goals that they can achieve and actually set appropriate goals. So for goal 1A, one we've talked about before, hear cases promptly and issue timely decisions at Oath Trials Division. Uh, currently, your uh, fiscal year 16 was 5.4, and that's average time for Oath Trials Division to issue decisions after records closed in business days, which is stellar. Uh, and in fact, uh, for the past three years, it's on a trend. It went from 15 days to 7.5 days to 5.4. And your, your four-month actual for fiscal year 17, which we're in, is 5.3 days. Why do you have a target or a, a target of 25 days, which is twice, if not five times more than you've ever achieved? Uh, the short answer to that question is it doesn't make sense and it's uh, and the reason is the infamous words that I hate which is well that's the way it was always done uh, so you know um, we worked with uh, uh, mayor's office of operations on essentially trashing uh, both uh, the operational and uh, Part of the of the of the of the budget stuff, and in particular, the the, the markers that you just mentioned. And we have done it. However, I'm told by uh, the folks who are vested with the authority to set this up in public that they were able to incorporate it into the latest documents only the PS part of it. But the OTPS part, their system couldn't handle it yet, although I have that information and I'll be the, the new style uh, ready to show anybody who wants it. I am told that by the, MM, uh, the regular management report, uh, it will be the new updated uh, and improved and uh, currently rational uh, standards. In your testimony, you mentioned a, a, a a de-emphasis on the, the amount collected and how many fines are being issued, uh, which stands in stark contrast to certain agencies like the Parking Violations Bureau, uh, which measures its success as not whether or not they conduct a fair hearing, but making sure people pay the amount that they owe. Uh, so this may not be the most appropriate for you, but we've noticed that last year the city collected $155 million in fines adjudicated through oath. This was an increase of $14 million from the year before, even though restaurant fines are decreasing, can you, do you have a, as the, as the agency that's reviewing these and adjudicating these, do you have an idea of why these revenues are, are in fact increasing? Uh, certain agencies, uh, like the buildings department, have increased their penalties and have increased their enforcement efforts. And I can't tell you right now that that's the reason why the numbers are up. I'm not displeased or particularly pleased one way or the other that the numbers are up. But I expect that with the increased concern about uh, safety, for example, uh, with the increase in the amount of construction going on in the city and uh, the recent uh, concerns about the people who are injured at these construction sites that the city is more vigorously going after those things as well as uh, the fire department is particularly concerned with uh, uh, illegal conversions and they issue summonses for that and because they endanger the lives of part of apart from endangering the lives of the public they endanger the lives of firefighters which is a big motivator when you're doing that enforcement 
So those are things that I suspect, and this is anecdotal, uh, have driven part of those, uh, those numbers. Within the uh, PMMR and Mayor's Management Report, within the preliminary Mayor's Management Report and the Mayor's Management Report, there seems to be a re been a reduction in targets. Uh, and I guess one area I'm particularly curious about is I, I love the on one-click online hearing. I love being able to do hearings by phone. It makes it incredibly convenient for folks. Uh, is there a goal for the number of cases that you want to handle in different ways? Is there a cost savings based on the type of hearing? And last but not least, is there a difference in outcome whether or not I choose to dispute something in writing, on the phone, online, or in person? Uh, there's definitely a cost savings of doing it online. Um, uh, and it certainly makes life a lot easier for the respondents uh, our goal is to have as much of this uh, process done as painlessly as possible for everyone concerned. Uh, the complication of doing it online can be uh, various things essentially boiling down to summonses that require uh, an agency to participate. And some agencies are more committed to that concept than others. For some agencies, it's easier than others. Uh, if you have a, a sanitation summons, for example, that doesn't require uh, the sanitation inspector to be present and can be adjudicated by phone or just by one click, that's wonderful. But if you have a summons, for example, that's a building summons for somebody operating, uh, doing work without a permit, you may need an inspector or a prosecutor from the buildings department to be present, and scheduling that uh, may be a little more difficult and may not be amenable to one click because they won't be online at the same time that I want to do this at 1 o'clock in the morning. Like, I've, I've paid parking tickets at 1 o'clock in the morning. I don't think PVB is going to have a hearing at 1 o'clock in the morning. As, as long as you're not tweeting at, uh, after <laughs> 1 a.m., I think we're in good shape. Uh, along those lines, uh, more and more internet traffic isn't actually happening over the web, it's happening over uh, the, these, these phones that have become the center of our lives. Is there any opportunity to use some of your cost savings to build an app for that so folks can uh, either integrate it into the new 3 in one app uh, rollout or, or what have you so that they can do the hearing over phone or is it already a, something you can do? Uh, there is one agency that has an app like that, and we're taking a really, really hard look at uh, basically stealing their technology so that uh, we can uh, essentially do the same thing. Uh, inquiring minds would like to know which agency already has an app for online hearings. Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head because I can't remember which agency it was, but I know we were in awe when we saw it. Okay. If, if I can propose that it be using a free and open source software license, uh, the folks at FISA and OPA are now laughing. Uh, and I just want to uh, wrap up, and we'll send you additional questions, but uh, tell, tell me a little bit about uh, informational forums uh, that uh, Oath is, is doing. What's the value of it? When I mean, you could just sit in your courtroom and let folks come to you. What's the value? of as a devil's advocate or softball question, as it were, what's the value of going out into the community, uh, doing this outreach, and uh, why, why, are, why is it a good thing or a bad thing? Why, are you keep, why do you keep doing it, and why wasn't it done before, and why are we doing it now? Well, why, we, why it wasn't done before, I'm not sure, but um, many of these forums, uh, the, the folks that come to these forums are small businesses who uh, have had either bad experiences or have misinformation as to what the mechanical process is and why they get a summons and whatever. And the structure is essentially this. Uh, we're there and we give them an overview of how things work at uh, the new and improved and hopefully continuing to improve uh, hearings division. At the same time, we have representatives from uh, multiple agencies, sometimes as many as a dozen agencies, who are there as well. 
and they give presentations or are they available depending on, on what the, uh, uh, the, the setup is at, the, at a particular location uh, to explain to folks uh, why is it that they get a summons, how they can get a summons, how they can avoid getting a summons in the process. Uh, for example, the fire department is there, the buildings department is there, the sanitation department is there. And very often, uh, believe it or not, some people are totally mystified uh, at the summons that they receive. They, they have no idea, at least this is the way they articulate it, they have no idea why I got the sanitation summons. Even though you can read what it says on the summons, they don't understand why it is that that particular area is being, quote, targeted or whatever, and the sanitation department is there and explains it to them. And it's amazing to watch uh, the reactions of folks uh, when there's somebody there from government explaining to them what the process is. Uh, one, of, one of the dangers of being in government is that you wind up in a bubble you know what the process is, you know what the procedures are, you know what the law is, and it's a total mystery to people on the outside. It's kind of like when I first arrived at Oath and the mayor gave me instructions to make sure everybody believed they got a fair hearing. Everybody I spoke to who conducted hearings believed everybody got a fair hearing. Right or wrong, that's the way it was. Everybody I spoke to on the outside believed the exact opposite. Um, and a lot of it is miscommunication. And uh, to quote uh, an advertising for a guy who used to make a lot of suits, our best consumer is an educated consumer. And that's, that's just real. Final question. Do you know of a good alternative to Sims or if they still have suits, stores anywhere? Because that's where I got most of my suits. I don't know, but I, but I think they, they've they, they created a foundation that provides a lot of money to PBS <laughs> because I see that in their F Fair enough. Stuff. And not, not to uh, people are welcome to buy suits wherever they wish. That was an endorsement of any past or present product. I know, uh, but we couldn't help ourselves. Uh, uh, Commissioner, thank you for all the great work that you're doing at Oath, and thank you for testifying today. Thank you uh, very we've much. We've just been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Bill Perkins, who is with us at the beginning. Okay. Uh, we now uh, have been joined by Roy Mogolinsky, Executive Director of both Financial Information Services Agency and the Office of Payroll Administration. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, my paycheck every two weeks. The uh, Financial Information Services Agency controls and coordinates data processing functions and operations for the city's payroll, accounting and purchasing systems, manages the citywide financial management system, FMS, generates and distributes reports for accounting and budget oversights, and provides online access to budgetary or related data for, for use by city managers and others. FISA also maintains operational integrity of the payroll management system P and the integrated, integrated comprehensive contracts information system, ICCIS, FISA is jointly controlled by the mayor and controller as defined by the city char charter. FISA's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 totals $109 million, including personal services funding of $50 million to support 456 full-time positions. The Office of Payroll Administration is also responsible for the distribution of payrolls, accounting for payrolls, administration of payroll deductions, checks, distribution services, and maintenance of the integrity and accuracy of the payroll management system and supporting the development and implementation of that system. OPA's proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 totals $17.3 million, including personal services funding of $515 million to support 179 full-time positions. During today's hearing, we'll examine various aspects of both agencies' budgets and discuss the operations and upkeep of several citywide IT systems, including FMS, the city's financial management system, City Time, the city's time tracking system, and CAPS, the city's human resources uh, database, which I think is NICAPS, and uh, payroll management system. We'd like to also hear about the cost savings measures result from co-location of the two agencies and details on your plans for capital investment. I'd now like to instruct committee council to uh, swear in our panel. Please raise your right hand. 
you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, if you can please take up to 15 minutes for testimony for uh, both agencies. And uh, thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chairperson Kalos and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Roy Mogolansky, and I am Executive Director of the Financial Information Services Agency, FISA, and the Office of Payroll Administration, OPA. I am joined at the table today by Andrea Glick, Deputy Executive Director of Administration, Roselyn Myers, Deputy Executive Director of Citywide Systems, and Neil Matthew, Deputy Executive Director of Payroll Operations. The Mayor's preliminary budget provides FISA with the resources it needs to support the citywide financial, payroll, human resources, and timekeeping applications which we develop and maintain. City officials utilize these applications to carry out their charter mandated activities related to budgeting, financial planning, accounting, procurement, payroll, pension, and personnel functions. FISA provides services to various entities through the operation and maintenance of major information systems such as the payroll management system, the financial management system, the pension payroll management system, and the New York City Automated Personnel System and City Time. FISA provides technical expertise and support primarily to the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of the Controller, the Office of Payroll Administration, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, the Office of Labor Relations, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. FISA ensures citywide system access and provides technical assistance to all agencies processing transactions in FMS, PMS, PPMS, NICAPS, and City Time. In what I believe is a topic of special interest to the committee, FISA is continuing to move select infrastructure components to the Linux-based operating system, enabling FISA to benefit from open source software. Components of FISA's enterprise job scheduler, City Time, and FMS are deployed on Linux with other applications under review for conversion. Let the record reflect I'm incredibly grateful and, in fact, ecstatic. In order to ensure that these critical citywide systems are optimally available, FISA still needs to purchase maintenance support for these products, but the use of non-proprietary operating systems provides more opportunity for competition. Um, I would like to emphasize that data and physical security are critical areas to focus on for any business operation today, particularly one that has responsibilities related to computer systems containing sensitive information. FISA and OPA take this security obligation quite seriously, and we are continuously vigilant in our efforts to protect the city's and its employees' confidential information. FISA continues to proactively review our security procedures for potential vulnerabilities and to take all necessary steps with regard to evolving security threats to further protect our citywide systems and information. In order to ensure continued operations of critical city systems during a disaster, FISA and OPA are in the process of reviewing our business continuity plans. This review has included several tabletop exercises with critical staff, as well as updating equipment needs, relocation assignments, decision processes, and immediate and long-term actions to be taken. The systems that FISA supports are utilized by tens of thousands of users in the performance of their duties on, the, on behalf of the people of our city. I'd like to present an overview of these systems. The Financial Management System, or FMS, supports the functions required of a citywide budget and accounting system. FMS processes data for inclusion in the city's financial plans, budget, the controller, controller's annual statements, and all required tax reports. In calendar year 2016, FMS generated approximately 707,000 disbursements valued at approximately $52 billion. FISA, working with DCAS and MOX, continues to implement procurement improvement initiatives. Efforts are underway to support the MOX Citywide Procurement Innovation Initiative, or CPI. CPI includes a series of business process improvement efforts combined with a new technology implementation called Passport. 
Initial phases of the effort are focused on improving the Vendex process using software as a service model. FISA, working with MOX, successfully upgraded FMS to increase small purchase opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses, MWBEs. The FMS software now defaults to double the number of MWBE vendors when a bidder's list is generated by an agency. An additional feature allows agencies to automatically add the remaining MWBE vendors to the bidder's list. On a related note, I am pleased to say FISA has been successful in exceeding the city's MWB vendor goal of 14%. In fiscal year 16, 28% of FISA contracts were awarded to MWBE vendors. FISA also provides the New York City Controller's Office with a diverse set of financial, payroll, contract, and payment data for the Checkbook 2.0 website. The payroll feeds includes funding, annual salary, overtime, and other paid data. The employee's name is not provided to protect the privacy of the individual. This data is provided for each employee and each pay cycle for all city agencies. The financial feeds include detailed contract, subcontract, disbursement, and cash receipt transactions, and operating budget amount and balance data. Financial data feeds are sent at the close of each and every business day. We continue to actively provide support as the controller designs additional functionality and new components of checkbook. The debt management system is the official repository of data pertaining to debt issued by New York City and the Tra Transitional Finance Authority. The application is being used by investment banks, bond council, and city employees. The payroll management system, or PMS, is the computerized application used to produce the city's payroll. PMS processes over 9 million payments for the city's workforce annually by running over 350 pay cycles per year that produce payrolls valued at approximately $32 billion. The Pension Payroll Management System, PPMS, is used for producing payments to New York City retirees. For calendar year 2016, PPMS produced over 4.1 million payments for approximately 317,000 pension recipients by running 180 pay cycles valued at approximately $25 billion. FISA manages the distribution of retiree checks, 1099 form, forms, and quarterly statements to pensioners. The New York City Automated Personnel System, or NICAPS, is a citywide human resource and health benefit system which processes transactions for city employees and pensioners. In 2016, FISA has successfully enabled the employees of Hostos Community College to make use of NICAPS and continues to work with CUNY to implement the remaining community colleges into NICAPS. The City Time System is a unified and automated timekeeping system which interfaces with the City's payroll management system and NICAPS to support accurate time and attendance records and payroll calculations. City time is currently used by over 164,000 employees at 89 agencies. FISA's staffing for fiscal year 2017 and fiscal year 2018 is, is authorized at 458 and 456 employees, respectively. FISA's total January plan expense budget allocation for fiscal year 2018 is $109 million, $50 million for personal services and $59 million for other than personal services. FISA's capital plan for fiscal year 2018, as per the January 2017 capital commitment plan, is $29 million and encompasses upgrades to the data center hardware and software and infrastructure upgrades to the financial and HR payroll systems. As the executive director of both FISA and OPA, I report to two boards of directors comprised of the same mayoral and controller appointees on each board. Since my appointment, I have implemented a matrix management structure encompassing both agencies. As part of this effort, staff at OPA were relocated to FISA's Midtown location. Having FISA and OPA at the same physical location has further strengthened this synergistic arrangement and leverages the talent in both agencies by creating unified work teams headed by a single manager, and more importantly, allows both technical and administrative teams to operate most effectively and efficiently as cohesive entities. 
Reflecting this approach, I refer throughout my testimony to FISA OPA as a single operational unit, despite their continued existence as officially separate agencies. Um, at this point, I'd like to make my presentation regarding the Office of Payroll Administration. Okay. Reporting jointly to the mayor and the controller, the Office of Payroll Administration, or OPA, manages payroll check and direct deposit distributions to all city employees and retirees. As discussed in my FISA testimony, we have leveraged OPA and FISA staff and are operating under our new matrix management structure. The Payroll Operations Bureau, under the direction of Deputy Executive Director Neil Matthew, reports directly to me. This bureau administers the core mission of OPA to ensure the delivery of timely and accurate employee and retiree payrolls. In calendar year 2016, over 9.7 million payments valued at approximately $32 billion were made to city employees. Over 8.2 million of these were direct deposit payments and over 1.5 million were paper checks. This reflects a direct deposit participation rate of over 84%. In addition, OPA manages the retiree payroll distribution for the city's pension systems. In calendar year 2016, over 3.8 million payments valued at approximately $25 billion were made to city retirees. Over 3.3 million of these were direct deposit and over 521,000 were paper checks. This reflects a direct deposit participation rate of over 86%. Over the past year, in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Labor Relations and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, OPA implemented retroactive and prospective salary increases for much of the city's workforce. The administration has reached contractual agreements with over 99% of the workforce, representing both civilian and uniformed employees. Since provisions and interpretations of these contracts affect over 180 union agreements, over 400 pay labor agreements, and over 400 leave labor agreements, OPA diligently monitors all updates for accuracy. For tax year 2016, current city employees of mayoral agencies, NYCHA, and elected officials can choose to have their W-2 tax forms delivered electronically instead of by paper copy. Electric Electronic W-2 form delivery is voluntary, secure, and accurate. This paperless option supports a more sustainable New York City in accordance with Mayor de Blasio's 80 by 50 program, which commits the city to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by the year 2050. For tax year 2017, we are working to deliver Form 1095C and the 1127 waiver electronically as well. OPA ensures the city complies with order deductions that have been served upon city employees. Some of these order deductions include child support, IRS tax levies and repayment agreements, credit or garnishment orders, higher education loan orders, and national medical support notices. OPA is responsible for collecting and remitting city employees' voluntary payroll deductions and data including union dues, life insurance premiums, and political action committee contributions to internal and external entities. The city's commuter benefits program is administered by OPA. This transit benefit program offers eligible employees the opportunity to use pre-tax and post-tax earnings to cover certain public transportation costs throughout the New York tri-state area. As of the end of January 2017, more than 59,000 city employees were participating. The city continues efforts to increase our enrollment. These efforts include notifying employees through a citywide email blast, creating an informational e-banner for employee self-service and city time login pages, creating a commuter benefits public service announcement, and posting pay statement messages. To further enhance the benefits for city employees, rideshare options are being added in compliance with IRS provisions of the Computer Benefits Pre-Tax Program. In addition, during February 2017, the program implemented, change, implemented changes due to the upcoming MTA transit fare increase. OPA's responsibilities cover a broad range of activities, including business analysis, requirements gathering, validating payroll results, data assurance for tax filings, and troubleshooting system business issues. OPA assesses and makes system upgrade recommendations 
based on changes to over 180 union agreements, as well as legislative or other required business changes. OPA's move to joint FISA OPA space at 450 West 33rd Street was completed last year. While the bulk of OPA has moved to Midtown from its former site at the Municipal Building, in order to maintain walk-in service for city employees in the downtown area, OPA has established a satellite office in the Department of Finance Business Center at 66 John Street. OPA has authorized full-time staffing levels of 179 employees for fiscal years 2017 and 18. OPA's total January plan budget allocation for fiscal year 18 is $17.3 million, $15.5 million for personnel services, and $1.8 million for other than personnel services. The portion of the mayor's preliminary budget that pertains to OPA provides us with the necessary resources to support employee and retiree payrolls, including the management and reconciliation of the city's payroll bank accounts. Um, thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Uh, the mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? And if so, how much? Um, we have been in conversations with OMB about um, cost savings for this fiscal year and out fiscal years. Until they're approved and accepted by OMB, I'm not at liberty to discuss them, but I'll happy to be happy to do so once they are. And I, I think that uh, the numbers we have is that you have $2.5 million that you've identified. Uh, is that can you just share where those cost savings came from and whether it was the IT maintenance, Linux, or the co-location, or other items like that? Um, it was a little bit of everything. The co-location was not designed as a money-saving um, endeavor. It was designed to streamline and improve delivery of services um, to city employees and the public. Um, but when OMB asks us for savings, we look in every, every area of our operation and come up with what we think is reasonable so that we can continue providing the services that we need to while saving money for the city. We've been, so, so the mayor has asked the members of the public to s cease listening to the media and uh, look at the budget themselves, but when you look at the budget, there's uh, these things called units of appropriation and every budget is broken out into uh, personal services, which is payroll, how much do we pay our employees, and OTPS, which is other than personal services, which is everything else. Uh, can you break up your budget beyond the two current P uh, PS and OTPS for the general public? Um, FISA and OPA are creatures of the mayor's office and the controller's office. And if the mayor's office and controller's office agree on a further level of detail, we will be very happy to provide it. I, I hope that if Scott or any of his staff are listening that the controller directs you to provide more transparency in the city budget. Uh, in addition, uh, you've uh, adopted uh, the, a thir a version three of the financial, financial management system. How much did that cost? I, I, I can put together, it, it was a long-term process. We can put those numbers together for you and get back to you on that. And uh, last, last budget, we were actually able to get the budget online. Do you know how much it costs to publish the budget online through the open data portal, in addition to having it available through the financial management system? I do not know. It, it's, um, I believe OMB, OMB site is the, where you can find the budget online. So we were not involved in putting that up. Fair enough. Uh, it looks like you're making strides with the uh, debt management system, uh, and it looks like you're making it available to investments banks. Would it be possible to make the debt management system available online in the same way as the budget is available online for members of the general public? Again, if, if the mayor's office and the controller's office are in support of that, we will absolutely make it happen. Okay. Uh, we, we do have pending legislation to, in, uh, to, to uh, codify putting the budget online, so I would be happy to expand our legislation to include the debt management system. Uh, 
Are there any agencies that are, have still not adopted the city time system? Actually, yes. I've thought you might have, so I've got a list here. Ah. No, that's, that's, uh, okay. um, the non-city time that use agencies are NYCHA, the Public Advocate's Office, the City Council, the Bronx Borough President, the Brooklyn Borough President, um, the Department of Education, and CUNY. Um, the Richmond Public Administrator is not on it, but we are currently in discussions with them to get them on board. Is the DOE on city time? No, it's not. It's They're Department of system. They, they have a different um, payroll system, and a, they have their own timekeeping system that links to their payroll system. Okay. Uh, in terms of distinguishing DOE from NYCHA, would it be easy for NYCHA to integrate into city time, or are they in the same boat as DOE? Using Kronos. NYCHA is using um, the Kronos system, which is a different timekeeping system than city time. I believe Kronos is what uh, D, uh, D Board of Elections was using before they moved over to uh, city time. So uh, what is the cost of the agencies for adopting city time? It depends on the size of the agency, the comple complexity of their time, time rules, so there's no set number. But we will have to be happy with talk, to talk to any entity that's not on city time now and work with them to get them on city time if that's what they want. And it, it sounds like three out of the five borough presidents are on city time? Yes. How do you deal with the uh, challenge that elected officials are technically the ultimate in uh, patronage positions who don't actually need to ever show up to work after election day? Uh, I, have, I have no comment on that. <laughs> but in terms of does city time require them to put in hours or just affirm that they're still alive or how, how do you deal with that piece? Agencies handle the timekeeping for their own agency. We don't see it actually. Each agency, each elected official sets their own rules um, for how their employees are required to report time. And so any agency could just set their own rules within the system? Yes. And uh, how much are we, sp <coughs> does the city own city time or did we uh, buy a license for it? We, we have we own it. We have a perpetual license for. Is is there any opportunity to take that software and release the code as free and open source so that other municipalities and jurisdictions can actually benefit from it, and also we would benefit from their improvements to our code? Uh, th there is, since we own it, we could do whatever we want. It's tied very tightly to our payroll management system, which is a proprietary system, so it's not something that another jurisdiction could just take and just implement quickly and easily. But if anyone is interested, we'll be happy to share the code with them. Upon advice of my, uh, upon the great advice of my uh, uh, unit head, I, I've been reminded that in previous hearings, you've mentioned that the payroll management system, uh, what, what programming language is, is the payroll management system in? COBOL. Uh, and do you, I imagine that is an outdated programming language. And uh, a, how old is the current incarnation of the payroll management system? The, the language still works very well. However, it's, they're not training people in it anymore, so it's hard to find people to support it. The, the system is over 30 years old. What we've been doing for, for PMS, so it's, it's running fine, it works well, but we are trying to not wait till we get into crisis mode. So what we've been doing little by little is cutting off pieces of functionality from the PMS system, moving them either into NICAPs or city time, and winnowing down what PMS consists of so that at some point in the future, if and when we want to replace it, it would be much less complex, much less expensive to replace the system with either something that we can get off the shelf or develop ourselves. Is NICAPS is PeopleSoft backend? Yes. Okay, so, so the more you could put into city time and, and offer as free and open source, uh, the better. And uh, given the fact that PeopleSoft is quite large, uh, I imagine that uh, they have a, 
uh, application program interfaces or APIs that are public and non-proprietary that uh, a free and open source system could hook into that other uh, jurisdictions using PeopleSoft could also hook into. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. That, there are a few folks who would have understood that sentence, so I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and uh, how many consultants remain on City Time? Um, it's single digits. I don't have the exact number offhand. I think last year we were at six, five or six. We or we are. Uh, I would two say years ago we were at five or six. So I'm guessing. I think we we are approximately at that same number. We uh, reduced. How, how do we get? How do we bring that? I thought in conversations with Commissioner uh, Cumberbatch, who was at DCAS and actually worked on both projects, DCAS and City Time. Uh, in our conversations, they had gotten it down to like six. So, and I think the goal was to get it down to zero and bring them in internal. The, the, we're doing the UI, so you know, the, the, the goal is always to get down to zero for, for all our consultants. We, uh, from a practical standpoint, we are, re, we are redoing the user interface. Um, so we have some consultants on board who are working on that. Um, they should be done by December, and then they will be rolling off. What we have been very good at as FISA and OPA as an entity is not keeping consultants around ad infinitum. We are bringing them on when we do for a set piece of work, a set project, and then we roll them off. And that's what's happening in this case. When the user interface is done in December, we should be able to reduce the number of consultants. So I'm quite hopeful by next year we'll be able to give you a much lower number than we have now or zero. And, and we, we'll follow up with additional questions, but if that can be one of the answers you provide. And how much is it costing us to maintain city time? We'll have to get back to you on that because that would include the hardware and software maintenance um, for a number of different products plus staff time. Um, so I can get back to you on that number. I'll give you a more accurate, an accurate figure. How much are we spending on having a redundant systems for uh, the financial management system and uh, payroll management system? I'm sorry, re redundant, you mean backup systems, disaster recovery systems, or? Uh, just the backup system. If I recall from previous year's testimony, we, we have a, a redundant system so that if one system goes down, we can still keep paying people. Um, we have a new disaster recovery contract that's going into effect in July. Um, we also use data, do its alternate data center, which is in New Jersey, as backup for our system. I can get back to you with the approximate costs of what, what that is. But I'd just like to go on record as saying how necessary that is. If we want to keep the payroll going, we want to keep the timekeeping and the HR systems going, we need, it, it's, it's irresponsible not to have a backup system, so we need to have them. I, I agree about the necessity for backup, especially when we can't just rerun the payroll, uh, given the fact that people need to get paid on time and it's such a massive number. I guess the, the thought I'd have, and I'm not sure if I had a ch chance to ask, is uh, the cloud is a, a beautiful place because you can lease server time based on CPU cycles, right. so you can put the entire system in, have it there waiting, and you're paying minimally just for the space that the, the, the software occupies, but you're not actually paying for the full server load. So in that, specifically for your use case, there's a cost savings because if the system never gets flipped on, you're paying for the, the storage, but not for the CPU time versus paying for an entire system yourself that's sitting there that has to have the full capacity, but ne doesn't necessarily use it. That is true, and that is a model we are exploring for the mainframe systems we have running. That's unfortunately not an option. Um, so until we evolve off of the mainframe systems, we're obligated to go sort of old school with our disaster recovery plan. Um, for the, for the Unix-based systems, though, we can explore backup in the cloud. Is there something that uh, FISA and OPA can do in terms of working with Office of Management and Budget, one boss and, and the controller's office, in terms of ensuring that uh, 
systems that are hosted in the cloud become capitally eligible versus servers uh, which aren't when at the end of the day it might be uh, better depending on different cases right. to use cloud versus server and also I'm a big advocate for servers too so it depends on the exact use case. And that's always been one of the issues, the capital eligibility of various um, technologies and that is something that we've been in discussions with with OMB about what would be eligible and what isn't so that's an ongoing conversation we're having and we we lobby for more inclusiveness in what's capitally eligible. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. We will forward additional questions. Great. Uh, and uh, thank you for your patience, and uh, sorry that we were running late. Our uh, next group that will thank be you. here. Our pleasure. Uh, we'll now hear from the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals, OATA. OATA consists of two divisions, the Tax Commission and the Tax Appeals Tribunal. The Tax Commission is responsible for conducting hearings on appeals of real property tax assessments determined and released each year by the Department of Finance. The agency is responsible for reviewing applications for which exemptions are sought but denied by the Department of Finance. The Tax Appeals Tribunal conducts hearings to resolve disputes between taxpayers and the Department of Finance regarding business income, excise taxes, and others with the exception of the New York City real property tax. Fiscal 2017 preliminary budget for the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals totals 4.8 million, including 4.5 million in personal services funding to support 41 full-time positions. Of that, personal services total 2.9 million is allocated to the Tax Commission for 28 positions, and 1.3 million is allocated for Tax Appeals Tribunal for 13 positions. Today we'll be discussing OADA's annual reporting and performance, as well as resources, considering that the office has been more than seen more than a 20% increase in applications since 2008. I will now ask my committee counsel to swear in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Callos and representatives of the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you for inviting me to address you today and for the opportunity <clears throat> to discuss the current operations and future plans of the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals. In 2007, the City Council amended the New York City Charter, putting both the Tax Commission and the Tax Appeals Tribunal under the umbrella of the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals. The 2016 operating budget for the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals was just under $4.7 million. Since 2011, a fee of $175 applies to applications for properties with an assessed value of $2 million or more, equivalent to a market value of about $4.45 million for properties in tax classes 2, 3, and 4, or over $33 million for properties in tax class 1. The fee is collected through the Department of Finance's real property tax billing process. In 2016, the filing fees billed totaled approximately $1.9 million. Under the City Charter, the Tax Commission consists of a president and six part-time commissioners appointed by the mayor with advice and consent of the city council to staggered six-year terms. Currently, there are two part-time commissioners whose terms end in January of 2018, one holdover part-time commissioner whose term ended in January of 2016, and three current vacancies. Efforts to fill those positions are being undertaken. During 2016, the tax commission had a staff of 28 full-time employees plus three part-time tax commissioners and three additional part-time hearing officers. Part of the Tax Commission's preparatory work is conducting public outreach sessions on the application process. In February and March of this year, we joined with the Department at 10 such sessions, including one morning and one evening session in each borough. In addition, we conducted information sessions for staff of City Council members and for the 311 call center staff to assist them in answering questions. We also emailed a four-page summary of the respective functions of the Finance Department and Tax Commission in reviewing assessments to every City Council member's office to aid in answering constituents' questions. I have brought several copies of that summary with me today. We also added an instant translation feature to our website that enables visitors to translate important information about the appeals process into many different languages. In 2016, two vacancies on the tribunal were filled so that the Tax Appeals Tribunal now has a staff 
of 11 full-time employees, including four administrative law judges and three commissioners. In addition to their work on tribunal matters, when time allows, the ALJs and tribunal commissioners are designated by the Tax Commission President to serve as hearing officers for Tax Commission matters. I currently serve both as President of the Tax Commission and as President of the, and Commissioner of the Tax Appeals Tribunal, as did my predecessor. In 2016, the Tax Commission received 54,065 applications covering 204,743 separate assessed tax lots, having an aggregate assessed value of over $200 billion. This represents a more than 24% increase in the number of applications since 2008 and a 2.5% increase over last year. In 2016, the Tax Commission provided substantive hearings on almost 28,000 applications and granted over $5 billion in assessment reductions yielding an estimated $571 million in tax relief to property owners. As a condition of accepting an offer of reduction from the Tax Commission, property owners must agree to discontinue all pending judicial proceedings for prior years. In conjunction with its disposition of 2016 applications, the Tax Commission also obtained discontinuances of about 15,400 pending judicial review proceedings. That compares to the approximately 550 proceedings resolved last year through court settlements or trials. In 2016, the Tax Commission also received 188 applications protesting the denial or reduction of nonprofit exemptions, 498 applications for review of denials or revocations of personal exemptions, including STAR, Enhanced STAR, Senior Citizen, Disabled Veteran, and Clergy Exemptions. Since 2012, at the request of the Commissioner of Finance, the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals also has agreed to conduct hearings on protests of penalties asserted for failure to file RPIE income and expense statements with the Department. In 2016, we received 105 protests of such penalties. In 2016, the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals also received 175 FOIL requests, most of which were for Tax Commission information. As of the end of, 20, of December of 2016, the inventory of cases at the Tribunal was 88, including 84 cases pending before the Administrative Law Judge Division and four appeals pending before the Commissioners. Looking forward to 2017, uh, last year the Tax Commission began exploring the feasibility and efficacy of moving to electronic record keeping for Tax Commission records. Currently, paper tax commission files occupy over 100 on-site filing cabinets. Electronic record keeping would enable quick document access by tax commission hearing officers, would eliminate misplacement of paper files, allow for simultaneous use of files by multiple hearing officers, would permit electronic retrieval of documents for FOIL compliance, would enable data capture from scanned documents and prevent the loss of documents due to fire or other catastrophic event through the use of cloud data storage. We hope to be able to enter into a contract and to implement this program in fiscal 2017 and 18. Thank you for your attention, and now I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Obviously, I've just delivered an abbreviated version of my written testimony. Um, to be more efficient use of your time. Appreciate it. Uh, so residents reach out to me all the time and uh, say the, the property taxes have gone up, especially in the most recent years. Uh, what can they or we do about it for those watching at home? Um, we accept applications uh, for review of the assessed values, including exemptions and tax classification from property owners. Uh, the deadline for classes two, three, and four was March 1st. The deadline for class one is this Wednesday, March 15th. Um, we continue to receive inquiries about those app that application process um, and send forms and other information and answer questions from applicants. Uh, if you could distinguish between the classes for those watching at home. Sure. Tax class one are one, two, and three family homes and some small cooperative and condominium properties. Class two is all other primarily residential property, including anything with four or more residential units. Class three is very specialized utility property, and class four is all other 
mostly commercial properties. Have you had occasion to use or review the uh, mayor's management report? Um, I have not recently. Uh, do you think that there would be uh, value to including a report from uh, the Tax Commission uh, and Office of Administrative and Appeals uh, in the uh, mayor's management report? It probably would be helpful, yes. Uh, would, you, would you be willing to work with mayors of Office of Operations to add a first ever section for uh, OADA? Sure. Great. Uh, With regards to folks who are concerned about uh, the taxes going up, uh, what types of outreach and trainings have you had and uh, where have they been and how can we schedule more? As I mentioned, we always conduct sessions jointly with finance after the prop notices of property value come out in January. We conduct information sessions in each of the five boroughs, both morning and evening. Um, we provide forms, we answer questions, um, we help them understand the distinction between the information that's on their notice of value, what can be reviewed by the finance department, and what can be reviewed by the tax commission. Um, we also provide training for the 311 staff and for tax, uh, for the city council staff members. Um, we put out information on our website. We've worked towards making that available in multiple languages. Um, and you know, we are a small agency, so um, we do provide staff at these outreach sessions. Um, but there's a limit in how many people we can make available at any given time for those sessions. With with regards to your, your budget, and, and please take this uh, with a grain of salt because I've asked every other agency. Uh, the mayor has asked, and I think your agency is somewhat leaner than some of the agencies I've asked for who have asked for bumps of $60 million, uh, many of which the jobs would be going to patronage. Uh, the mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you plan to submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? And if so, how much? Um, I don't know that we've been asked recently. The most recent um, budget exercise, we um, yeah, we've actually um, covered potential reductions um, because of the more than estimated receipts from the filing fee. Um, as I mentioned, we've received, we anticipate whether it was billed over $1.9 million in revenue, whereas the initial budget expectations was, um, I believe, several hundred thousand less than that. We noticed in the uh, budget that you have a uh, contract for about $168,000. What types of contracts for $168,000, which again is so very small, but this represents the level of detail that uh, our finance staff and the city council puts into the budget. Can you tell us about what type of services your agency contracts out and whether or not these could be done in-house for less? Um, some of the contracting services are for um, court reporters, for the tribunal. Um, we're also, um, some of that includes, antici was anticipating the contract for the um, electronic record keeping, um, which has been delayed due to service, you know, service uh, personnel changes at the vendor that we've been speaking with. Um, so it was initially allocated last year, um, but it's being pushed over to this year or the next year. With regards to electronics records keeping, is that just literally scanning documents into a high-speed scanner and then replacing the file cabinets with the digital documents? Um, it also would enable capture of data from some of those scanned documents um, because our forms are standardized so we could actually capture financial information um, that we could use then for um, data analysis for our own working process. When you get these forms and the forms we're talking about, how many, how often are they handwritten versus typed? Um, I would say maybe almost 
I'm, we've never actually standard, uh, you know, counted that. So uh, along those uh, same lines, so one uh, right after you is the Department of Records and Information Services. Doris, I recommend you speak to that commissioner because that commissioner may have resources that could off budget help you with archival because whether we, wh whether you like it or not or whether you do it yourself, Department of Records has to keep many of these records for you anyway. So this may generate cost savings on both of your budget lines. Additionally, would you be interested in digitizing the forms which are currently available from the tax commission are currently PDFs that people have to fill out on a typewriter or, or in pen or, or something else and allow them at, at least first to fill them out uh, electronically, second to add a feature on the form which is built into many Adobe forms that would allow them to submit the form electronically so you wouldn't have to do the data entry and uh, third, if not last, just to have an entire electronic application system. Um, to address the, the first facet of that, in terms of having a form that can be completed online, um, we will be looking into that, and that's, I've been told, is a relatively simple thing for us to move to, and I would have some of the more commonly used application forms, particularly the ones for the Class 1 properties, put into that form, so at least, because those are most often handwritten, um, and would make it easier to capture the data accurately from those forms. Um, in terms of having them um, submitted electronically, um, we have a city charter provision that requires a notarized, um, what's called a wet signature, um, and that would have require a legislative change to eliminate that requirement. The problem with that is we need assurance that those applications are truly submitted by the owner of the property um, because often they're submitted by paid representatives and if a signature was not required, a notarized signature, um, we'd need some mechanism to ensure that representatives were not submitting these without the owner's knowledge. Um, so. Um, could, could we do something similar to what we do in the courts, which is you can submit something. We, when I did, back in the day when I did my federal practice, we would slash S many of the documents, which would represent a, a digital signature for the uh, attorney, but then we would still have to have the, the notarized affidavit from the uh, client, which we would e-file as a uh, addendum to the document. That would probably be some mechanism like that or what the IRS uses as similar provision. Um, once we have the electronic record keeping up and running, um, there also, finance is also replacing the, the computer systems that um, also manage our computer operations. So once we know that the new system is working properly and we can then go to an electronic filing system so that that data would be um, properly coordinated with those computer systems and with, we've been told with, by the vendor on our electronic record keeping that um, any electronic filing system we go to would be compatible with that system, so. It, it, yes, and, and I guess one other piece is, uh, are you familiar with free and open source software? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the free and open source software license? Uh, yeah. The concept generally, yes. When, when you are acquiring software, you have a choice whether or not you want to be locked into the vendor who, with whom you are working with, or whether or not you would like to have the freedom to modify, uh, examine, or redistribute the uh, code. And since you are the owner of it, uh, my recommendation is that you choose to own it and make that software available to uh, all the other tax commissions in this, uh, in every municipality that are in similar situations. What we're looking into is proprietary software that we would license from the owner. Uh, fair enough. Uh, I would urge you to look at if there are any free and open source alternatives. I can tell you that for the types of data that we're talking about, I, I have built free and open source software systems to manage it, uh, at least the form components that I just looked at in about 15 minutes. So uh, I, I imagine that it may be less expensive to use a, a free and open source software system. Uh, in, yeah. 
how many hearings does the Tax Commission and Tax Appeals Tribunal hold per year? Um, well, they're, they're really separate processes. Um, the Tax Commission conducts substantive hearings on about 28,000 applications. Those hearings are not um, full evidentiary hearings. They're um, relatively short discussions with the representatives who's preventing, presenting factual information about individual properties that are relevant to the assessed value of that particular property. The Tax Appeals Tribunal hearings are far more extensive um, and are recorded, are transcribed um, and result in extensive written opinions that are then appealable to the appellate level of the tribunal. Um, those are evidentiary cases as well where the finance department is represented by the law department um, and they involve rather extensive issues of law as well as fact involving resulting mostly from um, extended audits by the finance department of taxpayers' returns. Is there currently a backlog in either side? Um, there is no backlog at the Tax Commission because we have to complete our process by the end of the year. So every year we complete our review of all the applications by the end of the year or before the tax status date of the next year. Um, there is a current inventory at the Tax Appeals Tribunal of approximately 88 cases, but they're ongoing. Um, somewhat of a backlog because there was a vacancies and change in personnel that required reassignment of cases that, um, to new personnel and some training, but um, generally it's not a backlog. These, are, these cases take quite a bit of time to um, prepare. They include motion practice, uh, testimony, briefing, uh, legal memoranda. They're more like what you would imagine a typical court case looks like. Do you have the? Do you have adequate funding to continue at your current level of operations, or to improve upon it? Yes, we do. Great. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you. And for your testimony. I would like to thank uh, the Tax Commission and Office of Administrative uh, Tax Appeals uh, for their uh, speed of testimony. Uh, we are now only half an hour uh, behind schedule. Uh, now I'd like to bring up uh, Doris, uh, the Commission of the Department of Records and Information Services serves as the Chief Archivist, Librarian and Records of Librarian and records officer for the mayor, borough presidents, and city council. Doris is composed of municipal archives, visitor center, city hall library, and municipal records management division. Doris operates record storage facilities in two locations with a combined capacity of one million cubic feet and provides records management with services to 50 city agencies, 10 courts, and the five district attorney's offices. Doris preserves and provides public access to 221,000 cubic feet of historically valuable city records and photographs and a unique collection of more than 30, 354,000 books, official government reports, studies, and other publications. Doris provides educational programming and has welcomed over 7,000 people from around the world in the visitor center since opening in May of 2012. Doris has a proposed budget for fiscal year 2018 that totals 7.3 million, including 3.5 eight million in personal services funding to support 59 full-time positions. Today we'll discuss details of the uh, Doris budget, its PMMR metrics and progress on Doris's open records uh, initiative, including its open FOIL portal. Uh, we welcome the uh, commissioner and uh, we direct the committee council to swear our witnesses in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Please turn on your microphones and pro provide your testimony. All right, we're ready to go. <clears throat> so good afternoon, Chairperson Kalos, any members of the City Council Committee on Governmental Ops. 
I am Pauline Toole, the Commissioner of the Department of Records and Information Services, Doris, and I'm joined by Assistant Commissioner Ken Cobb and the Director of Administration, Naomi Pacheco. Um, as you are aware, the Department preserves and makes available government information from the past and present through our three divisions, the Municipal Library, Municipal Archives, and Municipal Records Division. The agency mission is to foster civic life by preserving and providing access to the historical and contemporary records of city government, to ensure that city records are properly maintained following professional archival and record management practices, and to make our materials available to diverse communities. As I have testified in previous years, we have been deliberately growing the agency as each of the three divisions more fully embraces its charter mandated role. The department has received additional funding and staff lines in each of the past three fiscal years, and the preliminary budget also includes an increase. While this growth may seem insignificant when compared to the overall city budget, it is immensely important to Doris. The increased funding allowed us to expand the number of archi archivists processing city government's historical records for the first time in 27 years, expand conservation of crumbling maps and books in the library collection, develop online platforms for public access to information, and develop a strategy to maintain the digital records created by city agencies while identifying paper records eligible for disposal. The preliminary budget includes a current fiscal year increase of $197,308 to fund equipment required in the records warehouses and the creation of an in-house digitization center for historical records. In fiscal year 2018, the preliminary budget proposes eight new lines and the corresponding funding, an increase just under $450,000 to staff the digitization center. This brings the total agency budget to $7,262,531 and the headcount to 59. This, uh, in passing, that's a growth of $2 million in the last three years. Doris also has received $344,000 in change in direct grants during fiscal year 2017. This amount includes $200,000 to administer the local government record management improvement fund grants for mayoral agencies, $75,000 from that program to inventory the contents of 10,000 boxes in the record center. The archives also received $32,000 from the Consulate General of the Netherlands to create and support the new Amsterdam Stories website highlighting our shared cultural heritage. We also received $37,000 in change from the New York State Library to perform conservation treatments on historical Brooklyn maps. So what are we doing with the funding? Having used outside vendors and in-house resources to digitize historical records, it is clear that performing the work in-house will be cost-effective, allowing the digitization of multiple collections. During fiscal years 15 and 16, a vendor from the New York State Industries for the Disabled digitized our historical vital records, a total of approximately 9 million certificates. In the current fiscal year, we expect to digitize about 50,000 records, mostly photographs, maps, and building plans. By bringing the digitization effort in-house, we will increase capacity to digitize collections, beginning with the new group of marriage records dating from 1930 to 1949. That's about 1 1.7 million certificates that were transferred by the city clerk. We then will continue digitizing collections with the goal of providing online access to all of our finding aids and many collections within the next few years. We have incurred some bumps along the way. The agency generates revenue from the sale of copies of vital records and photographs. There is a significant increase in the number of requests for these vital records in 2016 and 17. Um, however, due to retirements, reliance on microfilm, the time required to process the request has increased and only 3% of patrons received their copies within 12 days, which is the target for this service. And we know we have to do better. Uh, within the next month, we'll be able to produce copies from the digitized certificates, which is a much faster process, and we'll be able to fill these vacancies that have lingered for many months. Um, in the library, um, for each of the past three years, we've reported on the progress made in making the publications portal the useful tool contemplated by the council in 2003. The librarians have identified 615 reports required by the charter, local law, or statute, and circulated the list to the agencies. We asked the agencies to review the list, identify any reports that no longer are created so the baseline list could be as accurate as possible. 
uh, librarians continue to reach out to the agencies on a quarterly basis to remind the designated contact to submit reports. Due to these efforts, the quantity of submission continues to increase as shown in the chart below. Um, at this time last year, we had just launched the beta version of the FOIL portal, open records with eight agencies participating. Currently, we have 21 agencies fully using the portal to receive and respond to FOIL requests, and all agencies can receive FOIL requests submitted via the portal. In the past year, 2,100 requests have been submitted through the portal. The development team totally restructured and programmed the code for the portal because the underlying structure was not sufficiently robust. Still open source, the new approach makes the deployment of new features a streamlined process. Our original approach focused on making the platform easy for agency FOIL officers in order to get buy-in. In February, we held a user experience hackathon to gather suggestions for improving the public's experience and have begun to introduce these features. We will continue to onboard agencies and expect that all will be using the platform by the end of 2017. We also are working with the Mayor's Office of Operations to develop the appropriate performance indicators that will be published for each agency in the MMR. Records management. The staff continues working with agencies to update and enforce record retention schedules. This includes obtaining accurate inventories of hard copy records agencies have been storing. We also have developed guidance for the digitization of records that have long retention periods and are working with agencies to validate the quality of previously digitized records in order to establish those as the official records and eliminate the paper duplicates. These are time-consuming but necessary steps in building effective record management programs at New York City agencies. The Records Management and Information Technology staff at Doris, along with our DOIT partners and select pilot agencies, have completed a proof-of-concept test with possible vendors for an enterprise-wise electronic records management platform. The soon-to-be-selected platform will deploy in waves beginning in fiscal year 2018. This effort recognizes that almost all city agency records are created and stored electronically and should be managed digitally as well. The archives, the archivists have concentrated on standardizing finding aids for 152 series spanning 89 collections following national standards, inventorying the contents of approximately 4,500 cubic feet of palletized and shelved ledgers. These are records that were removed from the municipal building in the early 1990s, dumped on pallets but never inventoried. Um, so now they're being categorized and evaluated. They are working with agencies to accession the records from the 39 agencies that had not regularly or even ever transferred commissioner collections to the archives, and they accessioned a um, little over 1,000 cubic feet uh, from nine of these agencies in the past year. In addition, we have processed and created very high-level descriptions for two major collections, the Bloomberg Paper Collection, which is uh, 4,400 cubic feet, and the police surveillance records from the 1950s to the 1970s, sometimes shorthanded as the handshoe files, of which 61 cubic feet include a folder level, level inventory. The Conservation Library Preservation Project repaired 25 rare and fragile books and provided conservation treatment for 345 maps. It's impossible to really convey in words how remarkable our collections are. As a recent New York Times story noted, the Municipal Archives and Library hold a treasure chest of materials ranging from early Dutch records to mayoral papers to photographs of every New York City building to the Central Park drawings to 18th and 19th century court records, and I could go on and on. The number of researchers accessing the materials has increased, which is great. But the records of city government's actions over centuries depict decisions made or not made about development, housing, health, education, decisions that affect every community in the city. One of the goals we established in 2014 is to engage with the broader public. We are doing this on site, online, and in neighborhoods. We extended the hours of the Municipal Library and Archival Research Center on Thursday evenings to better accommodate patrons, and we anticipate providing regular Saturday hours in the next fiscal year. Even so, we recognize that New Yorkers are very busy and may not have the time to visit us in our public space at 31 Chambers. To that end, we have created two community-based pilots and developed an online presence to engage the public with our historical materials. 
In the past year, we sponsored several events, including the Little Syria exhibit in conjunction with the National Arab American Museum, Night at the Museums with the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council during the River to River Festival, Open House New York tours, a curated exhibit of mud, mugshot photos at Photoville, a pop-up during the Lower East Side History Month, an exhibit of materials found at the World Trade Center as a 9-11 commemoration, several book talks, movie screenings, and lecture. We, hold two, we host two dot NYC sites, Women's Activism NYC and Archives at NYC. Women's activism is linked to the five-year celebration of American women winning suffrage. The current focus is to develop an online catalog listing 20,000 inspiring women by 2020. Archives.nyc includes images from our exhibits, digitized collections such as the Alms House Records, and a blog that has more than 300,000, 300, 300, not 1,000, 300 subscribers. We continue to offer access to images at our, dot in, at our nyc.gov site and have built a strong social media presence with dedicated followers on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In closing, the agency is focused on ensuring the charter requirements for managing and making available historical and contemporary records. We have built a very strong foundation and continue to advance our goals. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, so I, I read some great news in the New York Times about some of the most accessed records. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on how you're deciding which records go to the state library, which ones you maintain, how you get digitized things, who does the digitizing. I had a number of those questions coming out of it. A couple of people even emailed me because uh, uh, ev everyone knows that uh, Doris is my, the, the agency, one of the agencies I care a lot about. Um, and so if you could just elaborate for anyone who read that piece in the Times, and if you recall the title, I imagine you might. I can't remember the title, but it deals with this group of, um, court records, and I might defer to Ken in a minute because he uh, is an archivist and has been, um, and knows more substance, but basically um, the courts in New York City um, were organized in the very early days in the 17th century under both the state umbrella and a city umbrella or county umbrella. So um, the Office of Court Administration is now looking at all of these records that are stored at 31 chambers and have been stored for um, centuries in some cases and um, determining which type of court system created the records. So the state system will get all of the records that belong to the state courts and it completes a series that they have and we will take possession of everything that was created by the city courts over time. Is that correct? Do you want to give some detail? You have to turn that on. Yes, that's correct. Um, the archival records that are referred to in that story um, were maintained by the, uh, the clerk of the Supreme Court, who's also the county clerk. And just by coincidence, they happen to be located in the same building by the municipal archives. They're on the seventh floor, we're on the first floor. So there's always been a certain amount of confusion between the, the county clerk's archives and the city's archives. But what Commissioner Toole said is correct. The records that have a statewide jurisdiction will go to Albany. The records New York City jurisdiction will remain with us in municipal. So I, I was grateful to hear some of the good news about the FOIL portal and uh, the 21 agencies that are uh, currently using uh, the FOIL portal. And uh, you believe that all agencies will be online by the end of this year? Yes. Uh, so I guess one question is if I do a, a search for NYC uh, and FOIL, I, I get a lot of individual FOIL landing pages at different agencies. Uh, what is the integration plan so that folks are sent to a centralized location versus still using uh, non-centralized systems uh, at the multitude of agencies? Um, a lot of, if not all, but many of the city agencies have their websites hosted by Do It, and there's a certain format to them. We're working with the Do, Do It design team to put what, a tile on the bottom or 
sort of up toward the middle of every agency's page that would be that one site and redirecting some of those uh, other sites to the FOIL portal. Um, it, it will take a little time, but I think it's going to be really clear that that's how people file freedom of information law requests and we'll just work with the agencies to change their current sites. So once you told me the good news that things were moving forward, I actually hopped on the uh, foil, open foil site and noticed that there's a number of requests uh, that are still open that go back to uh, November 2016. Um, and just curious about what the turnaround is and what role Doris has in making sure that agencies are uh, responding quickly to items. Um, I think if you look at the requests made to Doris, you'll find that they were fulfilled well within the 30 days and required I'm, I'm, by I'm the I'm sorry, law. it was, it's um, March, the, they were received March 15th, they were, and they, they still have not, March 15th, 2016, so, but Some of the FOIL requests to the mayor, uh, amongst others, have gone unfulfilled for more than a year. Right. Well, the portal is exactly that. It gives you an opportunity to look at the fulfillment rates and identify issues. Some of the records might take a very long time to produce because the agencies have to do a lot of redaction. Every agency is going to have a little bit of a different practice. Um, so I think one of the goals is to make this transparent so agencies can explain why different requests take longer to fulfill. And we will, we'll gather reports from that. That's one of the metrics we'll be working with operations to roll out for every agencies. I don't think Doris can wave a magic wand and make any particular agency report provide a document, a record, more quickly than their staff can work. But you'll see how quickly they respond. You'll see what the documents are, if they're publicly releasable, and that gives us a place to make better public policy. And so in the legislation that uh, we, we worked on, uh, that I've introduced with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, that was heard, um, the, there was additional requirement beyond just tracking the FOIL request of actually posting the responsive FOIL data and in reviewing the portal and I know that when we met with the different stakeholders there was a plan to actually post the responsive materials. Is that still the plan? In, in the, the couple of responses I've looked at I'm not seeing the, the responsive materials posted. The responsive materials should be posted um, unless they're personal records. So if a person has to use the Freedom of Information Law to get their students' records from the DOE, we're not going to post the student records in the portal. But if you're trying to access other non-personal information, all of those records should be in the port available to you via the portal. There is a delay between the time the record is made available to the requester and when it comes online, and I believe that that is um, 20 days. I'm seeing a number of FOILs marked private, which I'm assuming are the ones you're referring to, but for instance, a list of New York City open data coordinators that was submitted on March 10th, 2016 and responded to by Do It on April 7th, 2016 is not providing me with the list of the New York City open data coordinators and I believe that as city employees they do not get a, they do not get privacy protections. I mean, we, yeah. Um, I don't know. We can certainly go back and speak to the Do It FOIL officer and note that this is a document that looks like it maybe it should be available to the public. But I think that's the exact purpose of the portal, for, to raise these questions and try and produce the desired result, which is every document that is defined as public to be publicly available to requesters. So the agency doesn't have to go back and fulfill the same request multiple times. It should be a, a cost savings to the agency. I, I like the FOIL request stats by agency. Is it possible to break them out by uh, timeline and aging? Sure. Thank you. Um, and sure. is there any coordination between the FOIL portal and uh, the uh, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics as uh, owners of open data so that items that are frequently FOILed are uh, posted automatically, are, are fast-tracked for inclusion in the open data portal? Well, not every record that's frequently FOILed belongs in the open data 
portal because it's not all data, but when there are record sets that are put in the FOIL portal, uh, we definitely work very closely with the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics to make sure that they're available. I'm seeing a lot of requests for decisions that were rendered on uh, ECB and things like that, and we just had Commissioner Del Valle in from Oath, so I don't know if those are, if decisions and orders from Oath, and yeah. I just clicking on three pages, I keep getting hit with folks asking for decisions and orders relating. So do you know if that's already open data or if there's an opportunity to, to push that into open data? There, oh, I don't know, I don't know if the oath decisions are in open data. So I, I guess one of the questions is, is it possible to create a report uh, programmatically out of your open foil portal so that it is giving a, a monthly, most frequently uh, foiled uh, response and then also uh, wh whether I like it or not, I actually dislike it, but uh, when I, when I want to submit a question to most uh, computer systems nowadays, I have to fill out a, a form that says this is my issue and then I usually have to read through an article that says, did you try this? And often it says, did you try turning it off and on again? <laughs> uh, but in this case, uh, if somebody types in, I want something from Oath, you could have like the top three most frequent, like, did you know if you click here, you can pull your decision from Oath? Mm -hmm. And if it isn't open data, I'd be happy to work with uh, Commissioner Del Valle to uh, make it so. Uh, I want to, yeah. It, just in response, interestingly enough, at the user experience hackathon we held, which I'd like to say was the only gender balanced technology event I've ever been at, it was fabulous. Um, <laughs> That, that idea of guiding the search features by figuring out what are the most requested documents or records and, and using that as a way of screening uh, came up from several of our, our presenters, so we're definitely looking at that. Uh, prior to your coming in, the uh, Tax Commission and uh, Office of uh, Administrative Tax Appeals uh, mentioned that they're planning to spend about $168,000 on uh, records uh, digitization, is there an opportunity for them to work with you to do the work versus paying a, uh, out a, a contractor to do it? Well, we would have to really sit down with them and evaluate what they're digi digitizing. Every record has a retention period and our guidance is not to digitize anything that has a record retention period shorter than seven years because there's, there's no good trade-off to the city. Um, so we would be more than happy to sit down with them. Um, and figure out what their priorities maybe should be and whether some of the records they want to digitize already exist digitally and are they just taking their paper copies and digitizing the paper copies. So we would have to go through uh, and you know, ask, sit down with them, meet with them and figure out what their real needs are. Just uh, following up on our initial uh, question, so uh, Google Books had a partnership with several libraries and archives to pay for the digitization of records. Do we have such a partnership? Is such a partnership available? Can we explore it? We can certainly explore it. Okay. Uh, I want to again thank you for bringing folks in-house and finding a way to do the work better in-house than you would otherwise be able to, and again, working with other agencies that are seeing similar items. Uh, do you think that there are any addition, any changes that you would make to the preliminary mayor's management report that you would use in managing uh, compliance with, uh, for, for just overall managing your agency? There are a couple of areas we've been talking with operations about uh, around records management. Um, uh, and then sort of as the agency business changes, as we have more digitized materials, what will that mean in terms of the, the uh, targets around uh, vital records production and photograph production? Um, so those are areas where we're, we're having discussions. And of course, you know, whole oil metrics is part of our discussion. Forgive me for using this hearing as a chance to do constituent service, but I did have occasion for a constituent who somehow knew what Department of Records Information Services was, but no, no, no offense, it's a good thing, 
who is saying that they found that the building itself was not as welcoming as it could be. And, and they felt that the building wasn't in the condition that it needed to be in to be a welcoming and tourist attraction and get onto one of those lists of this is the place you have to see because, and I'm imagining that the fixtures in front might be copper or brass, I'm not sure, but they're definitely green now. I'm not sure what color they're supposed to be, but is there an opportunity for Doris and any of the other tenants in the building to uh, slate it for capital improvements along the same lines as the municipal building or city hall? 31 Chambers is the most beautiful building city government owns. And it has this fabulous rotunda with a what's it called? skylight. The skylight was not repaired for 30 some years. And so DCAS has devoted the capital resources to repair that. And when it is completed, it will be like those images at the old Penn Station where light comes streaming through. But as a result, to repair the skylight, they've, the contractor has put a scaffolding and then encased scaffolding with plywood. And it is not aesthetically pleasing. Uh, we're doing our best to pretty it up by putting up copies of some of our images and some images of what the the rotunda looks like when it's not surrounded by scaffolding but when that project is completed in two years it is going to be so amazing and there are other areas i know the dcas commissioner um, says we, we meet in the building and i know that there are things on their list that they have been doing with the infrastructure of the building improving the heating and cooling systems and i'm sure they'll work on the more aesthetic uh features as well it's an it's an amazing building in, fiscal, in terms of walk-ins and visitors, and I, I did not mean to uh, joke too hard about it, uh, in fiscal year 2016, you had 1,363 visitors. For fiscal year 17, just for four months, you had 1,338. Uh, to what do you attribute a, a perhaps threefold increase in visitors that we may see this year? What impact has that had, and uh, how do we keep it up? We've been doing a lot of public programming. Um, and the, the, the issue we found with our public programming is when we have, well, we would have an exhibit and we would have lectures or films related to that topic, people would come for those days, but um, we didn't get consistent foot traffic. So we're, to, we're continuing to sponsor events, but are changing up the way we, we use some of the space in order to be, better um, accommodate researchers. Um, but we have, we frequently have programs and that brings people in and that's, but as I said in my testimony, we're going to continue doing that, but most people aren't going to come to 31 Chambers. So we have a great project with the school in Sunset Park doing some oral histories, bringing the stories that those students gather into the archive. We did another project in Bed-Stuy with a community garden that we're expanding uh, with the our contacts assistance and green thumb. So I think a lot of our work is going to have to be outside. Um, meanwhile, we'll continue to do programs that bring people in uh, for a more sedentary experience. What types of space, so, so in terms of that, for those watching at home, one of the biggest challenges in the city is finding an affordable space to use for, for meetings, for convenings. How much space do you have? How many people can accommodate? What are your hours? And what kinds of groups could do programming with uh, your, the Department of Records? What types would you welcome in and at what cost? Well, we welcome individuals and groups that can um, build on the work of the archive and the library and showcase aspects of city government's history. Um, so, if there are organizations that would want to partner with us, we'd certainly be open to it. Uh, we have a very broad group of institutions and individuals that are part of our women's activism.nyc efforts, a five-year campaign to celebrate winning suffrage. And that we always do activities around that and exhibits. Um, we did an exhibit around the proposed Lower Manhattan Expressway last year that brought a lot of visitors in and did in addition to the exhibit which replicated uh, a stretch of the highway in our visitor center, uh, we had several 
talks. We had a screening of a part of an opera that was being um, created around Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses back and forth. So we would continue to do all kinds of programming people were interested in. They should just email the commissioner at records.nyc.gov and we'll respond and create a dialogue and see what we can do. With just uh, going back to the uh, Freedom of Information Law Portal, uh, have there been any growing pains? Have you gotten any uh, pushback from any agencies in particular, or are, have you now generated the buy-in, or how, how are you getting everyone to make this happen? Because I remember in 2014, it seemed like a near impossibility. Well, you know, it's a, we, have a, we have a very good product for the agencies because it allows that one-stop shopping that the mayor envisioned when he promised that we would have a portal portal. Um, and the agencies, the larger, more complicated agencies, tend to have internal workflows that um, will sync with the portal. So they'll continue to process the request internally using their existing platforms, but then they'll, they'll provide the information to the public um, using the portal. And several of those large agencies will be coming on in the next six weeks. Uh, could I request? Including some that might surprise you. But I'm not at liberty to say because what if I said they're going to come out in six weeks and they come out in seven? But we'll let you we'll let you know the list. Would you add a feature to allow me to just view requests that have an attachment? That what? Have an attachment currently on, and for actually for folks who are watching at home are confused what we're talking about. How do you access the Open Foil portal or Open Records as you call it? You go to nyc.gov/openrecords. I believe. Okay. I hope that's right. I'm going to check right now. Uh, so on that, uh, it, it works. On that form uh, for request, sorry, request a record or view record or request, would you consider adding a checkbox that allows you to find cases, uh, requests that have attachments on them? OK. I think, th OK. Thank you very much. And what was the cost of developing uh, the, the open records? Portal. I'd have to calculate and get back to you, but basically it was, a, it was an open source product, as you know, that was initially developed uh, by Code for America for the city of Oakland. Our team did have to totally restructure the code this past summer, which took, you know, a good six months of work. Um, but we have uh, dedicated development resources now, and I can, that's our cost, is our, is our, our development staff. We don't have other costs. And but I can certainly let you know what that is. I know because I was looking at it this weekend that you have the code hosted at uh, github.com slash city of New York slash open record slash open records. Uh, would it be possible to include a link to the uh, GitHub repository for your source code on the site itself? I don't know the answer to that, but if it's possible, we will be happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, this is tremendous work, and uh, we'll send any additional questions. Um, I think something that I just need to ask, because I've asked everybody else, though it appears that you're seeking to grow your, your agency, just not as much as uh, the uh, Board of Elections would like to. Uh, and I'm also assuming that, and do you publicly post, will you publicly post all the new positions for which you're seeking? Yes, we post both internally and externally. Great. So the mayor has asked agencies to find a combined $500 million in budget savings. Do you plan on submit cost savings to be included in the executive budget? Uh, we have submitted a, uh, an, a revenue enhancer, and we have a long-term plan to save the city millions of dollars that we'll be, we're talking with OMB about. I, I would love to, to, to be a fly on that wall and help advocate if you've got a plan. Is this with regards to the storage of records by digitizing them? And applying retention schedules to records that have not been appropriately managed for the 20 years preceding this administration. With regards to the uh, PMR, it indicates that uh, the average goal 2C dispose of all records according to their scheduled retention periods. You've got a target of two months. It appears mm -hmm. that at no point while you've been commissioner of, uh, of Doris have you needed more than half a month or 0.6 of a month, so 
uh, that, that would be, you don't need more than 21 days. Would you be willing to change your indicator for yourself to 21 days instead of two months? And uh, you, it seems that law department has been able to approve disposals within a month. Uh, it seems that uh, they're currently pretty slow, but I can't imagine working somewhere where I have to send something out and wait three months to do something with it. Is there a way we could reduce that and work with the law department to get a better turnaround? Um, I'm going to defer to some of the questions to Ken because he knows this stuff better, but we are working with the law department to do things electronically rather than on paper, which will really speed things up. Um, and you know, the, the, attorney, the managing attorney there is very receptive to making the system work a lot better. Uh, and it, would, you, would you share the, the idea to save billions of dollars? I, any, anywhere we can save money is huge. <laughs> and we've already pressed the administration to save, I believe, we, we have worked with the administration to find hundreds of millions, if not billions, in the budget so far and would like to find more places for savings. Well, you know, I think that as agencies improve their records management, we'll end up saving the city a lot of money. That, that, is, that is good news, and it is amazing that an agency with a, with a single digit million dollars of millions of dollars budget could save the city billions. So thank you for your service and for looking for ways to save. Sure. Thank you very much. You got it. We'd like to uh, welcome the Board of Standards and Appeals. This is their uh, second uh, budget hearing with the City Council. I'd like to thank the Executive Director, Ryan Singer, for uh, joining us at a great hearing on BSA legislation in the Committee on Governmental Operations, where we, where we hope to have some good news uh, shortly. The BSA's fiscal 28 Team budget totals $3 million, including $2.3 million of personal services funding to support 24 positions. Today we'll be discussing the BSA's performance, any potential need for resources to support its work, the role of the BSA in odd technicality whereby BSA exists within Department of Citywide Administrative Services for the purposes of budgeting, but with an oath as per the charter. Uh, I will now ask my committee counsel to swear in the executive director. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Make sure the red light is on and if you can share your testimony. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ryan Singer. I'm the executive director of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, I want to start with a short description of the board and what it does. Um, in hopes to educate the council. Um, the BSA, as it is known, is the Zoning Variance Board for the City of New York. It grants exceptions to the zoning rules in cases where physical hardships associated with a piece of land would prevent reasonable return on investment. Uh, the board consists of five mayoral appointees, a chairperson, and four commissioners. The board must have a licensed engineer, a licensed architect, and an urban planner on it. Additionally, there is usually a financial expert and a land use attorney on the board. No more than two of the members can live in any one of the boroughs. Uh, the board has been in existence for over 100 years. It was chartered in 1916 along with the city's first zoning resolution. Um, in addition to zoning variances, the board hears interpretive appeals, administers special permits as described in the zoning resolution, and is empowered to waive certain sections of the general city law and multiple dwelling law. Those are state uh, laws. Uh, 2016 was a busy year for the board. We had 491 regular filed applications. Uh, of those were 40 variance applications, 40 physical cultural establishment special permits. Um, those are more commonly known as gyms, although it includes spas. 
189 general city law, 36 waivers. Those are for homes not fronting on a map street and 99 um, special order calendar items, uh, which are things like uh, extensions of term and amendments. Uh, when you're around for 100 years, you tend to develop a lot of sort of uh, approvals that need to be changed later on. Um, we also reviewed and processed approximately 4,000 general city law waivers for the Build It Back program. Uh, these were done in bulk, uh, waiving most of our normal noticing and application requirements. In 2016, we instituted a protocol for reviewing letter of substantial compliant requests. Um, those will all be re receive a review within a month of their filing and are tracked now as part of our regular workflow. Um, we also conducted several notice of comment charrette days uh, to reduce the backlogs uh, of cases awaiting review. Uh, the board staff did grow a little over the past year. We now have five full-time project managers up from four. Uh, I'm currently in the process of hiring a staff person with a background in real estate finance to better support our financial anal analysis in variances and vested rights cases. Um, we also have four people up from three working in our records division, which handles intakes of all applications and approximately 75 records requests a day. Um, we have a, an approximate total budget of about $3 million. I have 2.6 written there, that's a typo, uh, for fiscal year 2017. Our non-personnel services budget goes primarily towards rent at 250 Broadway and the storage and maintenance of our records. Um, BSA collects fees for applications based on project size, and our revenue for fiscal year 2016 was $1.4 million. Um, to update the council on a conversation we actually had in December, um, we approached, uh, we reached out to Do It, uh, which will soon make available on the Open Data Portal a database of all approved variance applications since 1998. Uh, the discussions with Do It have been very encouraging, and we hope to add databases of our P PCEs, uh, gyms, essentially, single-family home enlargements, and schools and manufacturing districts in our, on the open data portal. Those are easily identifiable special permits. I want to thank uh, Councilman Kalos for suggesting uh, this avenue, uh, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. So uh, the testimony you've provided will be uh, scanned into the record. Okay. Uh, first questions are just uh, if you could help uh, elucidate the form and in future forms uh, spell things out. Uh, so we have GCL 3635. Ah. Uh, I know what many of these things stand okay, for, so the, but yes, MDL, so did... SOC, BZY, BZ, PCE. Sure. Uh, and yes. Let's just do that quickly for those watching online and at home. So um, this, the, are you speaking about the, the attached forms that, yes. that have our applications? And, so, and for folks who are watching this afterwards, sure. these will be scanned and placed online. Great. For those currently watching, we will be referencing it and you'll be able to catch up soon. Yeah, so general city law uh, is GCL, is how we, uh, is the acronym, and there's 36, which GCL 36 waivers are for homes that are built or any building built on a um, lot that doesn't have adequate street frontage. Um, and then general city law 35 is for any uh, building that is constructed uh, in the bed of a mapped street. Um, and in Interpretive appeal is where we are asked to interpret a buildings department uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, somebody disagrees with, with DOB or, or, uh, or uh, the other way around. And then the uh, common law vesting is, is uh, where there has been a zoning change and the uh, DOB has determined that they haven't completed their uh, foundations in a by the time I that just happened. need the uh, the abbreviation. Oh, you're guess, just guess worried what? about the acronyms. Okay. The the other piece just being, in future documents, I'm a big fan of plain English, so you can sure. include GCL 36, spell out general city law or specific, and then just have in parentheses or what have you, or have as a reference uh, inadequate street frontage or built-in street in street sure. bed. But uh, for M MDL, SOC, BZY, and BZ and PCE. Okay. So, and I believe you defined NOC already. Yeah, 
so I just I'll just go through the the acronyms then. Uh, MDL is multiple dwelling law, and that is uh, the state laws that govern how much light and air uh, and that uh, have to be available to uh, multiple dwellings. Uh, Let's see what else we got. The special order calendar is SOC, and that is, as I said, a sort of our grab bag of appeal or of uh, amendments and other things that we just, it's an administrative thing. BZY is a special designation. Uh, it actually could have an acronym, but it has been lost in the midst of time. Uh, some, someone on my staff will probably correct me, but essentially it's just a, it's a vesting case. PCEs are physical cultural establishments, as I said. Those are gyms and spas. And I believe that is all for the acronyms. Great. One moment. Thank you for agreeing to put uh, a lot of the information on the open data portal. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the timeline for when that will be completed? We have given the go-ahead for the variance database to uh, go into, and we just said that that could happen whenever, and we, I think uh, that Do It can do that within the month, is my understanding. Uh, I can develop a timeline. We were actually just thrilled that it <laughs> that could happen uh, and, and get back to you on that. I want to thank you for bringing a report. You, you remain an exception. Uh, uh, if not exceptional for bringing reports rather than uh, what is so often the case of us requesting information that we've always requested and uh, often the information not being available. So this is incredibly useful uh, information. I appreciate your bringing it. Uh, is it possible to, w would you be interested in creating, uh, as we've asked a couple of other agencies, to have your own section in the uh, preliminary mayor's management report as well as the mayor's management report, irrespective of legislation that we may be passing. Uh, yes, we've, we've, uh, we could do that. I don't have a problem with doing that. What's your take on the BSA being an independent agency but housed with an oath in the charter but budgeted through DCAS? Uh, have you ever met with either agency? Have you ever had to report directly to either agency? Uh, what is your relationship to both agencies well, and we, their commissioners? Yeah, we are, are an independent board, uh, and, and actually in my tenure here, we have never interacted with OATH. Uh, they have a separate thing that they, they do. Um, I imagine that, that there was a time when those uh, administrative functions of oath and the board uh, were seen as being aligned uh, and, and in some ways they have the similar uh, genesis but, but uh, have since sort of parted ways. In terms of DCAS, we have met with DCAS and we have conversations with DCAS uh, staff and, and uh, their assistant commissioners uh, quite often and they perform all of our administrative back of house functions. Uh, example is that uh, they are our HR department. So whenever I want to uh, hire someone or have an HR question, I reach out directly to the DCAS HR uh, people and uh, they do the paperwork for me. They advise me on the civil service rules and other things like that. So that portion of it, um, we, uh, I will say that initially was uh, something of a growing pain, but we've gotten into a, a rhythm with, with them and I have relationships there and it works pretty well. Within the documentation that you provided, you noted that in 2016 there were 319, uh, is it items or cases, would you classify them as? Uh, the total applications, the decided ones, yes. Yeah, 319 applications, and you uh, indicate 290 were granted, six were denied, 23 were withdrawn, whereas in 2015, none were withdrawn. Uh, can you help explain the why they were withdrawn in 2016 versus 15, and uh, if there are other cases that are counseled out of the application process that aren't being tracked by what you've provided? Uh, the withdrawals, I mean, 
applicants withdraw for a variety of reasons. Um, I will say that in 2016, uh, at my direction, staff have, has taken um, a, a, a comprehensive review of the uh, pending items that have been pending for longer than six months or a year, uh, depending on sort of what we know about the cases and issuing what we call a 30-day notice uh, to dismiss. Um, the, our rules allow the uh, dismissal for lack of prosecution uh, for a, uh, an application at the board. However, if it has not been, if we sent a notice of comments and it hasn't been a year, then we have to take it to one of our hearings and the board has to vote to dismiss. Um, we don't like doing that because it, it clutters up our calendar for something that seems, uh, you know, sort of not a, a useful function of the board. However, after a year of, of stasis, uh, the executive director can dismiss uh, the cases. Just he can do that. And so uh, usually we have a year. And so at, by starting this, what happened is that many of our applicants said, oh, I'm either not getting paid by my client anymore, or the case is moot, or whatever, and they just chose to withdraw that. So this is a, really an outgrowth uh, of uh, uh, effort on our staff end to, to clear some of the cases that have been pending for a long time. And at the risk of making land use uh, chair David Greenfield happy, and if he could only see me now, uh, I noticed that there is a, a, I appreciate that you include a, a, a high and a low, and one of the highs is three, 1366 days as of the day that you generated that report, which comes out to uh, three years, three and a quarter, three and three quarters years. Uh, what, what's the deal? So we have a number of cases uh, that hap that things will happen, and I believe that the this specific case, there was a, a dispute between property owners and that the property, one, the neighbor was saying that they owned a portion of the property uh, that, uh, was, that was now appearing before the board for, uh, uh, I think it was a special permit. And essentially there was, uh, the board said to them, that we are not a court and go figure this out uh, between your neighbors and took them off calendar for a number of, of however long they needed to do to figure that out. Uh, and so that occasionally happens and tends to result in, in uh, cases like that. With regards to the numbers that you provided, which are helpful, especially I, I'm a big fan of the, the withdrawn and denied, uh, because that that shows uh, that that show what is the response to members of the community or community uh, boards uh, with regards to concerns that since the outcome is so often granted. Uh, and even with the current report, which you've had a chance to build however you wish, that it doesn't adequately represent your contention that it, it is not a rubber stamp, but in fact uh, the result of a process. And where would we add the proper measure to show the number of uh, pre-application, uh, the, the pre-application process, how long that takes, and uh, the number of bad applications that the public never has a chance to see because you're doing uh, your job in protecting the uh, charter, sorry, yeah. the, the zoning law. Yeah. So the um, the pre-application process, and I've discussed this at, at previous uh, sort of hearings. Uh, we have a lot of them. I believe I'm still the the issue is that we track them separately from our our applications that come in. We have just a lot of meetings with people every all the time, and so we. We track the the meeting separately, so I have to sort of crunch those numbers independent of the uh, of of the application data, which which we track very carefully. Uh, and so, you know, I know that we had. Um, I don't want to say exa an exact number. It was less than a hundred pre-application meetings. It was around eighty last year, and we don't track. Uh, 
what we told them in the meeting because oftentimes we'll, we, we don't have all the information in the pre-application meeting, so it's hard for us to say, we told them no and go, to go away. But uh, what we do track is whether or not they filed within a year. So I'd like to, like I tend to, the last in the hearing in December, I sort of gave the 2015 uh, numbers for our pre-application uh, data. And so I sort of want to keep track of that on a rolling basis. But we do turn away, I believe, it was uh, it was something like 23% of, of the cases end up actually getting filed uh, in from 20. So I, I think that there, there's value to including sure. that in the report before this committee as well as uh, the, the reporting legislation that we've been in yeah. discussions with Understand. Uh, since then. Um, in my specific case, I've had a number of items with the BSA where the community has had to work with me to uh, retain experts in, in this case. Our, our ranking expert tends to be George Janes and Associates and we've needed to bring in experts in order to determine the credibility and determine whether assertions made in certain applications were in fact valid. Since then I've started to pay for all of my community boards to have planners to assist with that. What role can BSA play in that process to ensure that items come before the community board that are not only complete, but factual in nature? Um, I mean, we have BSA staff reviews all, uh, all the applications for uh, completeness and, and for factual accuracy. Uh, you know, occasionally uh, the, they, they do come to hearing and the board discovers things. Uh, our chair likes to say, don't leave out facts because we will find out. Uh, they they all are, are they visit the sites and and uh, and uh, also have Google. Uh, and so we've found many of things where an applicant either left out a piece of information that that uh, should have been there or uh, information changed on the ground. Uh, we did have a case where we discovered that uh, units were being occupied when they were, we had been told that they were not occupied and, and uh, you know, sort of had to uh, sort of uh, change our whole way of looking at, at, at that. Um, so, you know, we, we do do a thorough review and we try to communicate uh, as best we can with our, our limited staff about where th things are in the process. So uh, I know our, my staff gets calls from community board uh, and I get uh, emails and calls from community board members asking where is this in the process, what's, what's happening with it, and try to, to give them a sort of snapshot of, of where the projects are. With, with regards to the project in question, I think I raised concerns to the, to, to the BSA, uh, to, to you, we ended up being lucky to have a, a strong expertise in our land use department. We submitted a very comprehensive, very technical uh, document, but is it possible for that work to be done by BSA versus by uh, a, a council member with the support of the land use staff or by a community board with a land use person that happens to be paid for by uh, fundraising? Yes, uh, this, the, the BSA staff uh, are all trained uh, planners and architects and, and uh, find regularly, um, I think, I know which case you're talking about, technical issues uh, like that uh, that are really threshold issues and, and that we take very seriously. Uh, things do, you know, we have, um, as you can see, many cases are filed through, uh, in, the, in the year. Things occasionally will fall through the cracks. I believe our board members catch things as well. They always tell me and tell me when they do uh, and, and uh, you know, to, to correct those things before the, the board votes on them. Uh, the reason why we have a, a robust review is that uh, in, that includes community boards is that so they can also tell us things. Uh, it is not the expectation, though, that they all have uh, trained, you know, or, or uh, technical expertise on staff. And, and the, the reason for this line of questioning is just what type of budget increase would you need and what types of resources would you need in order 
to make sure that there's a representative from BSA to answer technical questions for the board members as they appear as BSA applicants appear before the board for the reason being that if there's a technical question you have the attorney for the applicant who is representing the applicant but community board members who are not land use uh, people not lawyers not planners in in all five boroughs are forced to deal with very technical items in applications that might not necessarily be complete or accurate uh, so what what would the resources look like and how would we make that happen um, I mean it, it sounds like what you're asking is that we have liaisons to the community boards from the BSA uh, that is a, a fairly robust undertaking uh, given that we have five project managers now and there are 59 community boards is that correct that's correct uh and and you know uh in another another life i did work at a agency that does have uh representatives that go to uh to the community boards uh, pretty regularly and they were uh, an agency of about 300 people in size. I'm not saying that that needs to be the case, but you know, if we had a, a project manager for every community board, um, that would be a lot of people at the board. Uh, I guess uh, just along those lines, is there an opportunity to schedule trainings by the BSA of the five different borough boards and members? Do you currently do so? And if Yes, that is something that we uh, can do and we actually like to do, uh, to uh, come to community boards and do, it would be, you know, a simple one time, maybe per every few years training or for community boards. Um, I know that the Queensboro president has uh, training for her new community board members and regularly invites the BSA to that. Um, and but not every borough president does that uh, but we'd happy to uh, send staff or myself or my deputy director to come and, and uh, uh, give a talk about what the BSA is what it does and how best to interact with it and, and I, I promise as the last question we'll submit additional questions in writing uh, Currently, is there a budget line for a uh, general appraiser or somebody with the financial expertise to review applications? Uh, how much is that budget line? Is it full-time, part-time? What resources do you have in determining uh, the, the economic viability of a unique parcel? So the, uh, what we're doing now, we have a budget line for a full-time, uh, it's a, it's a planner position, but uh, I have tailored the uh, job announcement so that it is uh, specific to uh, someone with a real estate finance uh, uh, background. And in fact, we have a, a candidate who has a master's degree in urban planning and a master's in uh, real estate finance. And that person we think could can do work to support the financial analysis and that looks uh, you know I mean the, the issue with the appraiser and we've done some thinking about this we like the idea of, of having someone with an appraiser but oftentimes the financial analysis there's two sides to it there's both the um, determining how much the the, the value of the properties which is the appraiser what the appraiser does but then the real estate side of it is actually evaluating uh, things like soft costs for uh, for development is that reasonable uh, how things get built is is another side of our analysis and uh, so we're looking at folks with uh, real estate development backgrounds or at least uh, education in that uh, to help us uh, you know be make that more robust uh, because, and uh, you can see, we had 40 variances uh, filed last year, and, and to be frank with you, not all of those required a financial an analysis. Schools and other institutions, not not-for-profit institutions, don't do a financial analysis, uh, nor do single-family or two-family homes. And so uh, we don't think that we have uh, enough work to keep someone busy full-time. So 
having the, the person with a sort of more uh, diverse background allows us to also uh, review some of our special order calendar items and, and other things where we do have a pressing need in terms of, of, uh, of applications. Thank you very much for joining us today and for your testimony, for your report, for your candor, and for your partnership. We look forward to working with you and doing trainings of more of the community board members. I'd like to now uh, conclude this portion on Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, we do not see anyone in the uh, room for community boards, so being an ex officio member of three community boards, uh, 6, 8, and 11, I will uh, reiterate requests for additional funding, particularly for an urban planner to be funded for each community board uh, so that they are well positioned to uh, deal with current uh, rezonings, uh, variances applied to before the BSA, and various land use matters that may be coming up, as well as uh, the infamous, if not very important, uh, 197C planning tool that uh, community boards have at their discretion. I also uh, see no members of the public here for uh, public testimony, which means they may have reached out to my office ahead of time, uh, wherein we may have offered uh, a, a constituent service. And just hold for one moment. Uh, the, uh, we've checked with the uh, one member of the uh, one person in the audience, and uh, they have chosen not to testify. We thank everyone uh, for being here today. We thank our agencies for participating. I'd like to thank our uh, committee staff. Thank you very much to our uh, finance team and our uh, legislative team, and uh, I hereby adjourn this meeting of the Committee on Governmental Operations.